We're here, We're here until, until 11. 11. Give us a call. 404 A whole lot to get to. We're probably going to have to wait until Thursday. Thursday. Get to all of it. As the Atlanta Braves get ready to kick off the NLCS Game 1 out in Texas. Texas, and they get the, the Los, Los Angeles, Angeles Dodgers. Dodgers. We'll, get we'll get to that. We'll get to, we'll get to what the dog did. The dog did. The mauling of the Tennessee Vols. We'll get to we'll that. Get to that. A, clean a clean up job by the Georgia, by the Georgia Tech, Tech Yellow Jackets. We'll jackets. We'll get to that. And we'll, and we'll get to talk to the head jacket, the head jacket Jeff, Jeff Collins, Collins will join us at 10.05 10 10 this morning. morning. And the King, and the King brings, brings another, another ring, Joe. But first, Joe, how are you doing? It's fine. Monday morning as we broadcast from Truist Park. And we broadcast from the Atlanta Braves. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Team, I'm feeling grateful. Thankful. Normally, normally a, normal a normal person, person without, without the perks that, that I have right now with my uh, uh, job, uh, job to be able to, to be able to sit in the dugout, major league, league football, football, baseball, baseball dugout, dugout. and and. I like what I'm seeing. I like, I'm seeing. I like, I like how I'm feeling. feeling. I like the I like excitement in the air. air, air uh, uh, what's going to go, go on at 808 tonight? Very, very, very excited. I can feel it in the city. I can feel expectations through the roof. All right, so, all right, so, now, so now all I want is to join the party. party. Dressed up Dressed in my Braves gear. I got to get more Braves things. The Superstore. And I usually don't buy hats and buy things in my favorite team. But right now, this team is so beautiful. I have to get in the store and buy some merch. We all have to buy some merch. We all have to buy some merch. One for you, one for your children. That's what they should. They should be should doing. doing. We'll work, we'll work, we'll work on it. Nobody should expect handouts. First, and first, 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 first,
but, I, but I, I, he still, I, he still struggles in the postseason. So I, 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 I want to feast off of him. I'm not worried, I'm not worried about, him. about him. And you're calling, and you're calling Walker, Walker Bueller, Bueller not their age. Why would you say that? Say that? I still, I still think Kershaw got demons. demons. He, reminds he reminds me of Barry Bonds, Barry Bonds but his, in the 90s when he was, he was the better player. player and Barry Bonds had a streak. And I have to try to allow my memory to be bad right now. I think he was like three for 19 at some point. Even though he was still the best player for the Pirates. And he just couldn't get over the hump. That's how I look at Clayton Kershaw. Kershaw. He, he just, just hasn't had that, had run, that run through the postseason, through the postseason that, they, that they needed, but I, but think, I think it's in it. it. I don't, don't want to be the team, the team and I don't want to be the fan base that has, that has to deal with one with of his magical runs. runs. I want to make, sure, make sure, sure we get this one. I understand. I'm an, I'm an odd game guy. This is this is great knowledge here. Don't you ever forget this, Joe. Seven game Seven game series, win the odd games, you'll be okay. One, three, five, and seven. You'll be, you'll be okay. okay. So that's so why that's you're going to make it, it, make it, it look like you care about, about the second game. game which I didn't say, say that. It's clear. It's, it's Kershaw going to pitch the second game. The deal is yes, he's, yes, going, he's going, going game two. two. And you think and that's you a setup. You don't think, think that you know, Bueller, Bueller is a better pitcher than Clayton Kershaw. I'm not saying that. I think he is as good of a pitcher as Clayton Kershaw. What I'm saying is I don't want them up with nothing with a game in their hand with Kershaw with a little bit of wiggle room. I want to get these guys tonight. I don't want to leave Braves on the base pass. I feel comfortable in Max Fried if he gets into a little trouble. He, he, all, all, of all of our pitches should know, should by, know now. by now. If you get into, you get a, little into a little bit of trouble, trouble that's, all, that's all it is. A little, a little bit, bit of trouble. trouble. Right, right. Uh, but, uh, trouble, but trouble is what? Is what? How, many How many runs? runs? Three. Three. Uh, we can, we can overcome a three-run three deficit. Yeah, home team, but, you know, last outing for Max Fried, I think I, I think I thought they pulled him a little earlier. I thought he could have gone, gone further down the road. Down, down, uh, as far as, as far as up in it, remember when you're dealing, dealing with you know seven, you know, seven games, games and seven days, days possibly, possibly you don't have to you don't have to think ahead. You can't put all eggs in one basket. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to be thinking about the bullpen down the road two days from now. You're gonna have you're gonna have to be thinking about long longevity. So with all those things in play, I think you give a little bit longer leash to match Max Fried and just he gives up gives up four runs. Now not in four runs in one inning, but if that happens, happen and they don't hit runs and they don't hit runs, they don't hit runs. Bombs, two, run two run bombs. bombs. I think mean, you, you can you know, live, with, live Max with Max Fried giving up, giving up a few. So, so remember, remember you're home for postseason post play. play. You're home for the NLCS. NLCS. Is here is on is the fans, here on the fans 80, 80, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, and you can stream. Make sure you tap the app, download the 680 fan app, and you can put it on your phone so you can put it in your home as you can walk around the house and listen to the sultry sounds of the folks that we have calling the games. It's going to be a prime time game. Those Yankees got bumped out, so it's going to be a prime time game for the Atlanta Braves, and it should be a lot of fun. The city is having a lot of fun with it, and hopefully these guys are ready to go and they jump on the Dodgers in game one. The big news in town outside of the Braves, Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov have been relieved of their duties, Joe, and uh, six years in after a pretty good start to his career, a trip to the Super Bowl, trying to figure it out after that Super Bowl collapse to the Patriots. It just hasn't worked out, and it is time. It has been time. I thought the end of last season was time, but Arthur Blank gave Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov one more piece of a season to see if they could get things right. It They could not. Falcons fall 23-16 to the Panthers at home, and Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov relieved of their duties by owner Arthur Blank. Yeah, and Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov, they tried everything they could possibly try a home team, find a defensive coordinator, getting rid of offensive coordinators, uh, uh, getting rid of special teams coaches, uh, all kinds of shift-ups, shift-ups, uh, drafting offensive linemen. They tried. Home team, they, 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 they tried, and they just couldn't get it done. And when I look at the grand scheme of things, I look at the players, he weren't getting them prepared later, later on. The last two years, three years, they, they were talking about preparing. They were talking about the brotherhood, and he likes the energy in the building, and they're focused and, you know, fired up. But they weren't responding on Sunday. The Panthers looked prepared. Yeah, exactly. They, in my opinion, and you asked me Friday, were the Panthers a better team? I said, yes, right now. I didn't think talent-wise they were a better team yesterday. The Panthers were well-coached, were well-disciplined, well-executed. They had high game IQs at the end of the game trying to run clock, setting up for a, uh, a knockout punch. They were able to score. They were able to run the ball and execute their game plan. And a, a rookie coach came in and had his team prepared. The Falcons, everybody in the building, everybody watching on TV, knew that Dan Quinn had to win that game just to keep himself alive as head coach, and they still could not overcome that. Yeah, I still have to believe that uh... – that's a real bad feeling for Dan Quinn to go out like this against the Carolina Panthers against a rookie head coach. Now, um, 
Coach Matt Rule just made it happen, home team. Without uh, without Christian McCaffrey, one of your best players, he he used formation, he used design, he did the things that we we've, we've been wanting from Coach Dan Quinn and his staff and his t- uh, ball, uh, his team to be doing. We, we, we're not well coached. We weren't well coached, and uh, we weren't prepared to handle some things. Teddy Bridgewater looking like the best quarterback. He looked like an MVP. Yeah, you know, so so. Uh, Mike Davis looked like your NFL rushing. Team. How many tackles? We probably breaking up, uh, missing tackles. Right Every now. Falcon missed a tackle or two yesterday. So moving forward, home team, I think I think it's going to really be crucial as far as identity wise, who you hire in the interim. Now it doesn't mean anything as far as 2020, uh, uh, 21, excuse me, but. What style do you want to see going forward the last 11 games if you Mr. Blank or if you Rich McKay? And who makes that decision? You remember I've always been, you know, wondering, you know, what, what, what does this committee look like that, you know, gives advice to Mr. Blank? Are what? they football people? Are they analytics people? Are they just people that look at records and, you know, have their gut feeling out there? What are they saying to Mr. Blank? Will Rich McKay decide who's going to be the interim coach? Why is Rich McKay deciding? Because my question is – Because you don't is, have anybody else in place. That's true. But my, my thing is this. We, in removing Dan Quinn and removing Thomas Dimitrov, that's a start. I wish those guys well, no ill will. They've been great with the city and the community and to the fans getting us information. That being said, whoever's coming in here has a long way to go. A new coach is coming in here with a Julio Jones now with hamstring issues, and he'll be in his uh, uh, latter 30s. Matt Ryan's going to be pushing 36 years old next year. The new crew, we have a lot of work, and it looks like we only have a couple of players. Looks like we got Grady Jarrett. Looks like we have A.J. Terrell, and it looks like we have um, Calvin Ridley. Calvin Ridley. That's what a new coach and a new GM and a new coaching staff has coming in. The one thing I could say is that we gave everybody all the time in the world. There's nothing else left to figure out. There's no unfinished business for Dan Quinn. There's no <laughs> speech like Rocky when Mick was in the, the locker room, you know, having his last beats. We got more to do. We got no. There's no more to do. We've done it all. We've tried it all. We fired everybody. We moved coaches. We had coaches calling on first and second, coaches calling on third down plays. We've tried everything, and it did not work. And I think more importantly, what happened with Thomas Dimitrov, all of the guys that he didn't pick, as opposed to the guys that he did pick, the fact that you have T.J. Watt playing for the Steelers and not for the Falcons, that's something to think about. The fact that Clay Matthews Jr. Uh, was playing in Green Bay and not for the Falcons, that's something to do with it. The fact that we have Tack McKinley and it's not working out, uh, that has something to do with it. So we just haven't had enough it's time to get more. It's time to be better. It's time to do better. It's time to get better coaching. It's time for the Falcons to be better. And hopefully yesterday was the start of that happening. Well, get ready. That's all I would say. Get ready for some down years. Because yeah, it's, it, it, it's going to take a complete overhaul. It's coming. It, it, it's going to take one of those things to where you, know, you have to get ready that maybe Matt Ryan does not finish his career in an Atlanta Falcons uniform. Ooh, goodness. Maybe, maybe Julio Jones does not finish his – Falcons career in a uniform. I mean, his NFL career in a Falcons uniform home team. because He's stirring the part, Joe. He's stirring the pot. Money-wise, home team and the return on investment is not working out right now. Well, you can't trade them right now. They they both have untradeable contracts for at least one and a half, two more years. I mean, well, Matt Ryan's dead cap money this year is $70 million. And, and what kind of level, in your opinion, is Matt Ryan playing at right now? Just say the last two weeks. He's played terribly. His last two weeks, he looks like a guy – his best days have passed him by. Now, I don't know if that means he can't get that back, but he's had two bad weeks. That pick in the end zone yeah. yesterday was capital terrible. <laughs> you can't do that when the house is on fire. You're our best player, one of our best players. You've seen all the coverages uh, in your life as possible, and you can't throw that when we need you to help us win these and games. He, and the Falcons were having an outstanding game uh, running the ball. They did what they could. Ty Gurley finally had a great game running the ball, and it all went for naught. So the Falcons lose 23-16. Dan Quinn, Thomas Dimitrov, that era is now over. And now we have to look, it looks like, to a modification or rebuild. Dogs, they take care of the Volunteers, 44-21. They trailed, um, and they trailed because of a miscue. And then they were able to say. get things going as they bludgeoned the Volunteers in the second half. And it looks like that's, at least for this part of the season, 
the storyline for the Georgia Bulldogs. Maybe a little bit of a slow start, but an awesome finish, and they are finishing the deal like nobody's business in football. Yeah, they are, uh, and they impose their wills on the volunteers. I tell you that. Uh, they, they really beat them up. Um, I, that's, a, that's a fun. If you're a Bulldogs fan, that's a fun, fun defense to watch on oh, yeah. the team. They fly around. They, they, they together. They, they look like they – or they seem like they love each other or playing for each other. Everybody gets to play. Uh, it, it's pretty good, but it's all going to come down to can Stetson Bennett make plays when it counts? Can Stetson Bennett make plays when it counts? And can Coach Kirby, you know, some of, them, some of the calls he made as far as going forward on fourth down – uh, he's going to defend himself. He's probably going to do it again if he had the opportunity. But when you go against a team that will make you pay time and time again like Alabama, you might want to watch some of those things. So, And I, one more thing about Stetson Bennett, home team. To, di- to, to this date, I have no quarrels with him. No, nobody should. No. You know, I knew we were anticipating what it would look like when he get more pressure and what it would look like when, you know, he doesn't have a running game and things of that nature. We shall see. But right now, he, he's doing a good job. And I know you're happy about what happened on the Flats Friday night under the lights at Bobby Dodd Stadium. The Jackets putting up 46. They beat Louisville 46-27. Jeff Sims, 249 yards, two touchdowns. This Jameer Gibbs kid, I'm, I'm scouting for Falcons. I would love to see him when he gets to the NFL. I like his style, his uh, his game savvy, uh, the way he is looking past the first tackler. Jameer Gibbs, right, right. Uh, doing a very good job and a bunch of turn, a bunch of touchdowns, Joe, with no turnovers. Awesome! It was awesome to see. And you know, the coaching staff they must be very, very, very proud and happy because they. You know, they emphasized, they worked on some things in the bye week, and it showed up on the practice field. And, again, when you say Jameer Gibbs, what about Jeff Sims at the quarterback position and how many freshmen you are playing? You're playing 15, 20 freshmen every single week, and that's contagious when those guys want to go out there and earn some playing time. And defensively, I thought it was outstanding that you forced turnovers. You, you weren't given any turnovers. You went there, and you were ball hawking, and you were flying around. You turned those uh, turnovers into points, playing very, very good complimentary type football. So I'm really, really liking and excited about what went on last Friday night on ESPN for, that, for the Yellow Jackets. Anytime you look at when you, you play in a nationally televised team or a game, you want to look good. So good uh, going into the weekend. Jackets get a win. Dogs get a win. Right. Jackets clean up a lot of the penalties and the turnovers. Dogs look really good in the second half. And now they have the big showdown early in the season with Alabama coming up this week. That should make for a fun week as well. Lakers in the heat finish up things. And LeBron James wins his fourth title. And the Lakers win title 17 as the Lakers get the win in game six. It looked like the uh, heat just ran out of gas. They, they left it all on the floor in game five, and they ran out of gas in game six. Yep. Not enough bodies left to compete at a high level. You tried to. Your mind wanted to, but your body just couldn't let you. But So, shout out to the Heat because they fought. But at the end of the day, too much LeBron James. And when you said it before the series start, Anthony Davis should win MVP or try to win MVP. Right. He did put up MVP-type numbers, but outside of LeBron and doing his deal, he couldn't win it. So, a team effort. Then you had the role players, Rondo, and, you know, uh, CPC showing up yesterday. That was inevitable. There was no way that those guys were not going to get out there with a victory. And that's the 17th championship. Wow. That, that, that's a franchise. That's a winning franchise. And uh, after getting all of that, LeBron still wants one more thing. He wants his D respect, is what he said. He wants some D respect. Uh, well, why? Well, I don't know why LeBron went there. That's almost, we'll get to it. That's almost somebody should have gone there with no, no, no. No accolades. He has too many accolades to. Act I think like he doesn't. That. Well, we'll get to it because he is respected. Yes, he is. I think he, he is respected. And the fact that a lot of people have things negative to say about him, that's also a form of respect. Sometimes we call that hating, but sometimes that is also respect. When we get back, this is the business. The Atlanta Braves will have to handle in game one with the Dodgers. What is it? We'll tell you next. I'm home team. He's Joe Hamilton. This is the home team in Hamilton show here on The Fan, 680-93.7 FM.
Dodgers.com. Braves get ready for the Dodgers. Good morning, Atlanta. I'm home team Brandon Leak. This sports update is brought to you by Convenience Real Estate. Are you facing foreclosure or are you tired of putting any more money or time into your burdensome property? We'll purchase it in as-is condition. We usually close in 30 days or sooner. Call us today at 770-299-2290 or visit ConvenientRealEstateSolutions.com. Braves and Dodgers, game one of the NLCS is tonight. First pitch late for 808. Walker Bueller on the mound to take on Max Freed. Dan Quinn fired after an 0-5 start. It was his sixth year with the Falcons GM for the Falcons. Thomas Dimitrov relieved of his duties as well. Falcons fall 23-16. And there it is. You're listening to the most powerful voice in sports and your home for Braves postseason baseball. The fan 680-937-FM. This is Home Team and Hamilton live on the fan presented by Wellstar Health System. Welcome back in to the Home Team and Hamilton show here on the fan 680-937-FM. FM Home Team Joe Hamilton, you can give us a call, 404-231-1680. 9 o'clock hour is brought to you by This Stuff Matters, helping you make the most out of what matters most. Visit thisstuffmatters.net. whole lot to get to coming up in about five minutes. How in the world is Bama going to deal with this this weekend? But the Braves have to be in this business, what they've been in all year long, Joe, the hit business. We're going to have to hit our way out of this series, hit our way out of the pitchers that the Dodgers are going to throw and hit our way into the World Series. Yes, our bullpen is fantastic. I'm going to say the best in baseball. But these guys with this Dodger blue on, they can hit the ball. And we're going to have to hit with them, and we're going to have to hit our way into another World Series with very talented guys who I think are capable of doing it. Are you panicking, partner? No. Um, because why are you automatically saying we're going to have to hit? Yeah, we are giving credit where it's due. Yeah, we're not taking the Los Angeles Dodgers roster for granted. We know it's it's stacked, top to bottom. But, man, we, we can pitch. We, we have some pretty good pitchers. I mean, Kyle Wright and Ian Anderson, I have a lot of confidence in them, those guys. Let's not forget that Max Fried is a, you know, our ace right now. Let's not forget that, that what, the, what those guys have put out there, what they have done thus far. I don't think we're going to be intimidated. I think we're going to be ready to rumble, have, having a lot of fun, loosey-goosey. Remember, I've, I've always talked to you about, you know, I, I believe in pressure, whether it's, a, you, know, you know, self-motivated pressure or pressure from the outside noise and the outside world. And nobody can tell me that Dave Roberts and Kurt Clayton Kershaw and some of those guys that's on that roster, and Bill, Cody Bellinger, all those guys, that they don't feel the pressure that we haven't made it, we haven't overcome. No, I think that's a real thing, home Well, team. this team has been somewhat special when you look at all the other incarnations of the Braves in the past. We've always had great pitching. We've always had a closer. This is a team where it looks like it looks like the most potent and most dangerous offensive unit we have sent into the postseason. And we're running into, I think, a, a an equal uh, when we when you talk about just top to bottom yeah. how the Dodgers stack up. That being said. I think if it's a, a pitching duel one or two games, it might be a hitting match one or two games, and the Braves are going to have to hit their way. And I'm talking about even when we get into their bullpen. Right. Hit our way into a World Series and out of this entanglement <laughs> with the Dodgers. <laughs> Watch your use of words there. <laughs> hey, you know, home team, who are you expecting to show up tonight? And the reason why I ask you that is because – that's why I love the, the Braves, the team, so much, this team, because we don't know. Night in and night out, we don't know who the superstar is going to be. We don't know who's going to drive in the timely run. It's been Ozuna. He's been steady. It's been Darno. Fr- Darno has been lights out. Uh, it, will, will it be an Adam Duvall? Will it, will it be an Ozzy Albies, the guys that get, they, they, they get on fire and they, they, they can't get out or they're constantly on base? So, uh, along now, I'm just not talking about those guys who's going to you know step their game up. That's a long with our two superstars okay, who, who, who we're expecting to show up bottom line. Okay, there you and go. That's Ronald Cunha Jr. and that's Freddie Freeman. Those are my first two. Okay. Okay. That is, start with the superstars, number one. <laughs> All right. Then you follow the money. Okay? Okay. So those two guys, Ozuna, Ozzy Albies, need to be a problem from game one to game four, hopefully, when the Braves hopefully take care of business. However long this thing goes, uh, those guys have to do it. This is money time. 
this is, is, is great what these guys have done so far. And you certainly don't want to say, all right, that's nice, pat them on the head. No, no, no. What they've done is helped everybody get to a place where we feel comfortable. They need to do it this series. We don't need a power outage with the guys at the top of the lineup. Right. We've already been through that, and we were able to win through that. But I don't know if that's the best recipe with these jokers we're about to face starting tonight. Right. It's definitely not the best recipe, home team, but however, when you've won that way, you can't reach back and say, I've done this before. Well, I still expect the Braves to be dangerous late in games. Absolutely. And late Seventh, in the- eighth, and ninth, the, the Dodgers should not feel easy. There should be an uneasiness with them when the Braves come to bat. <laughs> Boy, I'm fired up. I'm fired up. And I'm talking about the bottom high for that lineup. Austin Riley. Uh, 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 Adam Duvall, Mark Kakis, you know, the veteran leadership of Mark Kakis on the bottom of that lineup, that, that, that'll go, uh, a bold, a, a go a long way. So I, I think we can keep up with it, but I don't think the Dodgers are going to run away. They might. I don't see them getting one of those 10, 11, 12 run games. I don't see it. Now, it could happen, home team, but it's the playoffs, and I got to understand it. I got to think that it's going to be somewhat of what I saw between the Astros and you know, uh, the Rays last night. Yeah. Close scoring, pitching duel, you know, a high pressure pack situation, maybe one or two homers hit in the game. You know, that, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the game within the game, and then all of a sudden, you know, manager Brian Snicker, thus far, he hadn't been in a position to have to make crucial moves yet. No, no, not yet. <laughs> We've been saved, really, I won't say saved. What Travis Darno has done in the postseason has made things a lot easier for everybody because th- there were some situations where games went on a little bit longer, scoreless. Games were a little bit undecided how long you're going to keep a pitcher in. And then Travis Darno provided some big hits. If he's able to do that, awesome. We've seen guys, uh, Mark Lemke certainly made a name for himself with, with, with what he was able to do, uh, you know, not being one of the big boppers per se in the Braves lineup back in the 90s. But it looks like Travis Darno has a chance to take on that role. And the fact that he looks like he's an Iron Man, he doesn't want to come off the field, he, he doesn't want to sit down, he, he wants to be out there and call the games for his staff so uh he could be a guy he and adam duvall you know a little lower in the lineup that's fine the money guys have to show up last year freddie freeman had the wrist injury he's a money guy he didn't show up uh it hurt us so we need everybody to show up. but i think that's another thing handling quick business getting guys who are lesser than out of the way so that health should not be a problem right now i, I love it and these guys are going to have to hit hit and be prepared to hit late before they think about doing anything else. Right. <laughs> it's nice if we get into a pitcher duel, game or two, fine. We need to hit, Joe. And we have to and have this a, is the team to do it. And we're going to have to have a game plan. What, what is the game plan? Are you, are you being aggressive on the first strike? Uh, you being patient at the, line, uh, at, at the plate? You trying to be aggressive on the base paths to, uh, as far as running, taking you know, singles into doubles and turning doubles into uh, uh, triples? Who knows, home team? But we, we have to put ourselves in a mindset that this is going to be a dogfight. It's going to be a dogfight. I heard Double A talking uh, some of the sound by his home team, and he said you you don't have to you don't want to necessarily think that it might go seven. I'm like, oh, oh, Double A. I mean, we. I hope he's thinking that we're going to sweep, or we're going to win it in five, or win it in six. Or uh, I'm not saying that you know we can't match up with the Dodgers. No, we do match up with the Dodgers. We're right. Out execute. So you, uh, you, in my opinion, you should be thinking about a seven game series at. At, at the worst case scenario, right? So jump on them game one. Jump on them game one. No, I'm talking about as far as Double A putting together this roster and, and you know the, the bullpen bullpen arms and things that going forward. That you know, who do you rest? Who do you substitute? Who do you pull up? And and, and in terms of will they be rested? Well, uh, keeping our bullpen out of harm's way has been a good thing. Uh, having our pitchers, we know what we've said. Just have five on it. Put sure. five on it. Give us five innings. Whoever's starting, and I think Brian Snicker has the rest and the bullpen has the rest under control if we're in a in a close situation or not. You listen to the home team in Hamilton show here on the fan 680-93-7 FM in celebration of 40 years since the 1980 Georgia Bulldogs National Championship. Quarterback and one of our own, Buck Ballou, is taking you through a walk through history with the Academy Sports and Outdoors UGA 40 Hashtag Champions, presented by Superior Plumbing and Southern Link. Every Wednesday, he drops a new edition of a podcast. This week, Run, Lindsay, Run, the annual showdown between the dogs and the gators. 
It was a phenomenal ending to that game and uh, could not have been greater for that year in the 1980 season. Buck will get into the minutia of that game. It's a ride through Georgia football history and is brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors, UGA 40 hashtag champions and presented by Superior Plumbing and Southern Link. You can listen to this at thepodcastpark.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're a Georgia fan, you should feel pretty good. Uh, you know your running game has gotten better. You know your defense is elite. And now you know you're 3-0 and without major injury, taking a trip to Alabama this Saturday for a primetime showdown. Dogs do what they had to do. Terrible first play of the game as a bad snap ends up as a touchdown for the Tennessee Volunteers. You spotted them seven, and you still rolled them in the second half. Right. Uh, to me, the halftime score was Georgia up uh, 17-14. Yeah, the offense gave up the seven, not the dogs' defense. Yeah, because uh, the negative one yards rushing for the entire day. It's domination. Th- that is domination. Garantano, uh, he didn't make a lot of good decisions, and I can understand why. When you get hit, and you get hit, and you know the next play you might you might, you might, might get hit again. Exactly. It's, it's just not a good feeling, home team. And um, I think the elevation in play of Kiaris Jackson has been really, really key, key for Stetson Bennett. Because I don't know what happened to George Pickens last year. We've game. been talking about George Pickens, George Pickens, George Pickens. But uh, Kiara Jackson has been the guy who's been doing it with his play and the big plays and the hurtful plays against opponents. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it could be one of those things to where, you know, the the, uh, the defensive of the opponent is saying that we're not going to let George Pickens beat us. We're going to put a safety on the, over the top, and we're going to limit his catches and his yards. And then you need somebody else to step up. Uh, the, the plethora of backs, running backs that Georgia throws at you with that humongous o- offensive line, it's hard to it's hard to get a beat on because there's different styles. You got McIntosh with his style. Then you have uh, Zeus, Zamir White with his style, somewhat uh, like a ground and pound. Boy, that kid, he, that McIntosh looks like he's got another gear. Yes, he does. And he's got throw, the extra gear. And you throw in the freshman Milton. So uh, the right now, I would say, and see, I don't like to just pour any water in anybody's gas tank. Right now, the Georgia Bulldogs, they've handled their business. They've handled their business thus far. Looking forward to Alabama now, home team. Stetson Bennett is going to, have, going to be required, axed to do more, and he's going to have to do more. And he's going to be on a little bit more duress. Absolutely. So he's going to have to be a little more tactical. and cra- he, The room for error shrinks. That being said, watching that Bama game, I don't know what they were using for tackling drills. I think they had some walkers and some elderly people out there, and they weren't tackling those kind of folks either. They missed every tackle they could against Ole Miss, and when Alabama has to put up more than 60, they had to put up 60 to win. That should be some film that the Georgia Bulldogs should be able to to, to exploit. No doubt about it. No doubt about it uh, because uh, it's called a copycat league. You best believe Coach Smart and his offensive staff, they're going to be looking and seeing how many points, how did they do that. They're going to try to use some same formations, uh, different formations and disguises. But I, the matchup I want to see Saturday, and I know we're going to talk about it more throughout the week, home team, is the, is the Alabama offense versus the Georgia defense. Now, that's a, that's a bloodbath, man. That, that's what you want to look at. And, you know, Coach Sarkeesian, your boy, who you ran out of here, you know. He to- needed to go. He needs to be exactly where he is in college. I tell him I tell him he was in here. He's been doing a very, very good job of designing plays this year. want to remind you, your home for the Braves is 680 The Fan, and you can download the 680 The Fan app. If you tap the app and put the app on your phone, you can put it in your home and listen to the game here on the fan as the Braves take on the Dodgers in game one of the NLCS. Also want to remind you all season long, 680 The Fan and Extra 106.3 bring you the best coverage in high school football. You can join Carl Whirl, Doug Conkle for Friday Night Football. Games of the Week presented by Georgia Farm Bureau, Academy Sports and Outdoors, and Fox 5 every Friday. This week they'll be live from Athens, and they will have uh, Athens Academy and Wesleyan on Friday night. And then after the game, you can listen to the Georgia High School Scoreboard Show with Steve West, Chris Mooneyham, and Brandon Joseph on the Georgia Farm Bureau Radio Network brought to you by GHSA and Academy Sports and Outdoors for scores and updates around Georgia. The Jackets do a very good job cleaning up the turnovers. Had they not won the game, that would have been the first thing I looked at, that and penalties. But I think the fact that uh, they were down double digits, they had to execute at the end of the game to get the win. Very teachable and a lot of learning moments for the young Jackets and Jeff Collins 
at home against a beatable team. You did not let one slip through your fingers or through your stingers, and you stung them. Put up 46 points, and the Jackets come back from two scores down to get a win. Yeah, and everybody had a hand into it, home team. You're talking about Coach Collins going for it on fourth down. That's a gutsy call. And not only that, the team rewarding him by turning that, you know, uh, that into a touchdown. Um, 30, outscoring, you know, Louisville 32 to six in the second half. Uh, that's sticking with it. That's having second half adjustments. What about? I thought Jeff Sims really grew up right before half. Home team down 21-7, and you let a two-minute drill down there to score, cut the lead to 21-14. And I could see it in his. I could see it in his body language. I could see it in his. You know, just his mindset, his swag. That whoa. I'm really – things are really slowing down. If I do protect the ball, then think good things can happen. Don't you know, home team, and you would not, might not have would have thought this, Jeff Sims has only been sacked twice all season. It seems like more than that. <laughs> all season. He is mobile. <laughs> yeah, it seems like more than that, but when you, all, when you look at it, all you really had to do is cut down on the turnovers, especially in the red zone. You were five for five in the red zone uh, on, on Friday night. Things came together, and it helped defensively when you got Trey Swilling back to help out in the secondary. And, again, when you're playing so many people, uh, Kyle Kennard, defensive end, freshman, Derek Allen, freshman, DB, Keenan Johnson, freshman, DB, Jalen King, DB, a junior now. But when you get those guys long and lanky playing that much, you're going to get some more better things happen. How, how about the Jackets defense overall? Right. Three fumble recoveries. Eight tackles for loss. That's blowing stuff up. Right. That's making an imprint on the game and not just relying on the offense just to do the heavy lifting. And they're able to score seven touchdowns because of the opportunities that the defense was able to provide at times on Friday night. Yeah, that's outstanding. And funny you say that because out of the seven touchdowns, home team, six different players. Obviously, you know, uh, Jameer Gibbs, he caught one and ran one. Six different players uh, 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 ended up being in the pay dirt, ended up being in the end zone. That's outstanding. And you said something about the defense, the second half adjustments. Again, the coaching staff made it seen what happened in the first half. You know, you had Cunningham breaking contain, you know, making some plays on third down. And then the second half, you saw that shut down by, I think they might have had somebody spying on them, uh, but you were paying a lot more attention. And then that's when you saw team – Team complimentary type football, and it, including the coaches. It was well coached. It was cleaned up. The sloppiness was removed, and they can keep the slop out of the game. The coaches can go ahead and coach, and then the ending will fall where it needs to, and the, the, the Jackets needed to win that game, and they did. You listen to the home team in Hamilton show here on the fan, 680-93-7 FM. Braves and Dodgers in postseason play tonight, game one. You can hear of the NLCS on the fan, and make sure you tap the app and get it on your phone and get it in your home. Big news last night after the game, and it was I was trying to uh, line up timelines. Uh, the Arthur Blank sent the PSL owner, owners a, an email at 9.47 p.m. trying to see when the first uh, story broke. I believe it was before, uh, right around 10 o'clock, so he was trying to say he was trying to get it to the season ticket holders and the PSL owners force, first that Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov had been relieved of their duties. He had given them opportunity. He believed in what they did and showed him at the end of last year. And at 0-5, 16 points two weeks in a row, losing at home to the Carolina Panthers, he had seen enough. And I think he finally had nowhere else to go but somewhere else. Now where do the Falcons go? Because everybody's been clamoring. Everybody's been asking for it. We, we've gotten what we wanted as a collective. Now where do we go? Because you have no coach, you have no GM, and those people I don't think, and I don't think they should, exist in the building. I think we need to go outside and give a thorough <laughs> cleaning. Ajax, Clorox, Mr. Clean, Lysol, whatever, and completely clean up and start anew up at Flowery Branch. Home team, that's why I love my job so much. I get, I get to chop it up every, every morning with a fan. So I get to ask you some questions I'm not privileged to ask on a normal basis. Don't ask me about the Falcons because I have no answers. Uh, well, I ask you, well, this is a, a question about the Falcons, but it's going forward. What would you like? Now, I know, know there's 11 games out, and nobody on this staff is going to be the head coach, but going forward to, to, to you know, getting a new head coach, what would you like an identity to be? Offensive. You, the, you the, still want to be offensive. The league has decided it's better for fans and for ratings to have offensive 
teams. When you look at the number of teams scoring 30 points a game, it has gone up dramatically over the last two years. The rules are set up. If you spit, if you touch, if you breathe on a wide receiver too much, it's pass interference. You'll be closer to the goal line. They want scoring. I want an offensive-minded coach. And in the last four coaching hires, we've only had one, and that guy quit on us, Bobby Petrino. You, you, you've had Dan Quinn, defensive guy. You've had Mike Smith, defensive guy. You've had Jim Mora Jr., defensive guy. Can we just get one of the innovative, brilliant, up-and-coming, offensive-minded coaches to help us do what the other teams who are having success are doing right now, scoring points? I like where you're heading. I really do. Uh, that that would be exciting for the fans, um, that style of brand or that brand of coaching. But I, I want balance. You, you, I, I want to look like, you know, the San Francisco 49ers in the trenches mauling you. I want to look like the Baltimore Ravens in the trenches mauling you. Say whatever you want to say about the Kansas City Chiefs, but Chris Jones and those boys. They've gotten better. Yes, they got better. The offensive line is really, really good. I need balance there. See, I See you. See you waving your hand at me, and you and you doing that baloney and hogwash type thing, home team. But you you, you want to look good. No, I, I want to win games. All you have to do is look no further than the Falcons. The Falcons, when they made their Super Bowl run, they weren't one of the head-busting teams to start off the NFL. They went on an incredible run. Imagine if we were able to sustain that. They had the number one offense in the history of the NFL, and the defense went from bad to a top 15 all, uh, defense. So they didn't have to have the number one defense. They didn't have to have the number five defense. They had a plethora of weapons. They had great play calling uh, from a guy who probably should have stuck around here and couldn't because he had to become a head coach in Kyle Shanahan. And the Falcons were the perfect opportunity. They lost the game because they couldn't get stops, yes. But had they just run offense and been smarter, they would be Super Bowl champions because they had the Patriots on the ropes. I want an offensive-minded team, and I want a coach whose imprint is all over the organization. Right. I, to this day, cannot tell you, other than get his players to like him, what Dan Quinn's imprint on the Falcons has been. And they really, really like him. They do. I mean, you had some guys crying in the locker room over, or, you know, or bumping for him, saying that he's the guy. And I can see where they're coming from a little bit, home team, because the players are not playing well. No, they aren't playing or well. Or didn't play well. And you got a Falcon, Keanu Neal, said the fans just don't know. And he's, uh, you know, he, he loves his coach. So it's one of those deals. The where fans he, don't know what? Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I guess he doesn't know what these <laughs> ticket prices are costing <laughs> and what we're paying <laughs> to see him and his teammates do because his coach got the wrong people in the building. I don't think he knows. Maybe we can enlighten him, and he just doesn't know. But we don't want to fight amongst each other. A decision's been made. Right. Dimitrov and Dan Quinn have been relieved, and we'll see how that will change. When we get back, we will see if this guy will feel better after what he did last night. He's Joe Hamilton. I'm home team. It's the home team in Hamilton show. This is The Fan, 680-93.7 FM.
Bradapest.com. Braves begin in LCS play tonight. Good morning, Atlanta. I'm home team. Brandon Leak. This sports update is brought to you by Georgia Natural Gas. Sign up with GNG today to get a low rate plus $100 off your first bill. Heat things up this winter with GNG at GNG.com. It's the Braves and the Dodgers. Max Breed, Walker Bueller in game one. First pitch slated for 808. You can catch all the action here on your home for Braves baseball. The fan 680 93 7 FM. Dan Quinn fired after an 0 5 start in his sixth year with the team. Falcons fall to 0 5 after losing 23 16 to the Panthers. Thomas Dimitrov relieved of his duties. Von McClure of ESPN reporting, reporting that Raheem Morris will be interim head coach for the Falcons. And there it is. You're listening to the most powerful voice in sports. The Fame, 680 93 FM. Home team in Hamilton, presented by Wellstar Health System, live until 11 a.m. right here on The Fan. Welcome back in to the home team in Hamilton show here on The Fan, 680 93 7 FM. You can give us a call, 404 231 1680. Did you follow Joe Hamilton today? You can follow Joe Hamilton. Where can they find you, Joe? At Joe Ham 14. You can find me at Home Team B Leak, and you can follow everybody at 680 The Fan on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at 680 The Fan. The 9 o'clock hour is brought to you by This Stuff Matters, helping you make the most out of what matters most. This Stuff Matters.net. Does it matter that LeBron James has his fourth title? I think it does. He now catches Shaquille O'Neal. He's one shy of uh, catching Kobe Bryant and two shy of Michael Jordan. He gets to six. Not going to be, in my opinion, there's not much you need to be saying about the man negatively anyway, but not going to be any room for the haters to say anything if he catches Michael Jordan with six rings. But last night, Lakers close out the Heat in game six, and they are the champions of the basketball world after a 17th title for the Lakers. Is it about the Lakers home team or more so about LeBron getting his fourth? It's I mean, both. Talk, I'm talking about the storyline because if you were talking to genuine diehard Los Angeles Lakers fans, they would say somewhat like, thank you, LeBron. We yeah, expect it. Uh, well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't disrespect LeBron, but they would say thank you for bringing 17 back to us. Thank us for putting us back there, not considering him an all-time Laker great. You know, LeBron, uh, to me, LeBron James – did the Laker fans a favor? See, and I think Laker fans are looking at and they're it. they're appreciative. Op- the opposite. Okay. When you put on this jersey, we're doing you a favor. We've seen Kareem and Elgin Baylor and Magic Johnson, and, and we've seen the greats, and we've seen Kobe and Shaq, and we've seen uh, those guys win. So when you put this jersey on, you need to win too, kind of like the Yankees. When you come over here, you just need to win. You know, thank you for helping us get to another one, but you need to win. So I think they go hand in hand. Uh, After the game, he said uh, he was talking about how his coach, Frank Vogel, needed some respect, uh, how Rob Palenka needed some respect, and how he needed some uh, some de-respect is what he said. And, you know, I, 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 I can understand. You know he hears the criticism and the criticisms of him, jumping from team to team. People accuse him of making it so easy. It's not easy to win a title no matter who's on your team. And I think, once again, all he has to do, if he wanted to, is point at the rest of the roster. Yeah, he had Anthony Davis. <laughs> but if you start pointing at the rest of the rosters – that LeBron James has played with, uh, there are not a lot of guys who are going to have a lot of great things said about him. It still seems or sounds like he's begging, though. What does he need to beg for? I think he wants to be universally accepted. And I don't know by why. Every, by everyone? I don't who's, know. Who's universally accepted by everyone? Even Nobody. Der- even Derek Jeter has some haters out there. Yeah. I mean, come on, who is? So now, is it, a, is it one of those situations where he, he has a little bit of a rabbit ears? Who hate? Yeah, I think so. Who who? I'm trying to think of a superstar that is less hated or less criticized than others. Magic Johnson. Is there a lot of hate for Magic? A lot of criticism. No. No, not at all. I think he wants that kind. Even Michael Jordan. You can talk about who he was, you know, maybe as his personality, but as a basketball player, is there a lot of negative hate? No, even the even the folks that don't care for him, those folks in Detroit, the Pistons fans, can't stand him, but there's no hate. It just seems like LeBron wants to be universally loved. I think people respect him because sometimes when people ex- expect you to lose and are hating for you to lose, that's a form of respect, too, that I think he should embrace. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever talked to anybody that said they don't respect LeBron James. 
Now, he might have some people that don't like him yeah. or don't like some of the, the decision he made to get out of Miami. Some of the other, some people don't, don't don't like the way he flops or think he flops and whines and cries. Uh, but as far as me, I'm like, what has he done wrong? I mean, he's, he shouldn't be beloved. I mean, you see what the school, that school he's doing, um, a, 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 a more than an athlete, you know, voting, vo- voting and trying to get that done as far as people being educated and all those things. Those are the things you, you, you normally applaud. That's a show in and of, in of, in of itself. What is unlikable? Right. If you got people to say it out loud, what is unlikable? Maybe we will put that up on uh, Twitter. I don't know what he's talking about. That's the thing. That, what is that, unlikable about LeBron James? That caught me by surprise when he took, a, t- t- took time to say something about respect last night. That was a little awkward to me because he is respected. <laughs> I mean, the proof is in the pudding. He's holding up his fourth MVP trophy. He's holding up his fourth title. And um, he is one of the all-time greats. If he retired tonight, he'd still be one of the all-time greats ever and be one of the greatest that ever lived. So uh, I just think he he does have rabbit ears a little bit. And hopefully he just (laughs) enjoys it. He proved the haters wrong, and he proved Laker Nation right. And he should be happy that he is a champion once again. I I think at some time he's got to be able to – at some point he's got to be able to let go of the Michael Jordan comparison. Yeah, people are going to feel the way they feel about Michael Jordan, and the younger generation is going to like LeBron. And he should consider himself the ringmaker. Everywhere I've gone, I'm the bringer of rings. Everywhere I go, you get a parade. When we get back, we're going to parade around the Atlanta Braves as they open up game one of the NLCS with the Dodgers. And we'll get a chance to talk to a man who cleaned a lot of stuff up in front of a whole lot of people. We'll get a chance to talk to Jeff Collins, head coach of the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, coming up next here on The Fan, 680-93.7 FM. Atlanta's sports station is always streaming on your home smart speaker. And if you need to refinance your home or investment property, reach out to our friends at South Point Financial Services at SPFS.com. That's SPFS.com. And thanks for streaming The Fan. Take a guess. What's the largest exterior project that can take place at your home? The answer is your roof. Folks, I...
93.7 FM. Hope everybody had a fun and safe weekend. Home team Brandon Leak, college football Hall of Famer, Super Bowl champion, all-time leading passer at Georgia Tech. Joe Hamilton, we're here until 11. Give us a call, 404-231-1680. Remember, 680 The Fan is your home for Atlanta Braves baseball and your home for game one of the NLCS. First pitch uh, slated for 8.08 today. And you can also hear, if you tap the app, download the 680 The Fan app, take it on you wherever you go, put it on your phone, put it in your home. And today, Joe, again, Braves having these watch parties. Yep. At uh, Truist Park, these pods on the field are pretty cool when I peep through. Uh, But we also have uh, four tickets that we're going to give away for a watch party. We're going to give that away at 1038. We'll have a phrase that pays, and we'll throw that out at 1038 to somebody where you'll get four lower-level tickets to the Braves watch party and, all importantly as well, the pass, the parking pass to the red deck. Yeah, that's for the, free. That, 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 that's the icing on the cake. The right home there. team in Hamilton hookup. <laughs> free parking here at the Battery Atlanta. Today is also Braves uh, Rep the A Day. Make sure you use hashtag, hashtag Rep the A, showing your Braves hats, your jerseys, your t shirt, a video, a promo, repping the A as the Braves get ready for game one of the NLCS. And uh, I'm really excited. Uh, the city's really excited, Joe. And, um, you know, it just feels different because. We've just had so many teams over the years that have had great guys, great players, great hitters, a, a great mix of young guys and, and 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 veterans. And then maybe we came up a little bit short because everything was a dogfight with the pitchers. We didn't hit as much. Now it feels like if we need four runs, we can get four runs. If we need six runs, we could get six runs. If we need eight, we could get eight. And we could win eight seven. We could win, you know, five four. We could win seven four. Seven six. We can win any kind of way that the game comes. So this feels differently, and hopefully the Braves just get off to a good start in game one. Yeah, it feels differently, home team, because it's fun. Isn't it fun? It's to a watch? lot of fun. I mean, right now I'm, I'm planning my day around what am I going to be doing at 8.08. I want everything to be handled, no, 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 no distractions, because I want to get a sense of the feeling of what those guys are feeling. And I don't want to bring up anything about the past. This is brand new, brand new baseball. This is a new era of baseball for the Atlanta Braves. So I, I, I like the way that for the fans and for the players, you can go out there with limited amount of pressure. I'm not just saying that the Atlanta Braves, they absolutely have no pressure on them, but a limited amount of pressure. Go out there and just play the game of baseball. Raheem Morris has been named officially the interim head coach for your Atlanta Falcons Andre. after it was uh, determined by Arthur Blank he had seen enough. And Thomas Dimitrov, that one really surprised me. Thomas Dimitrov has been around for a long time and been an architect of what we've seen. But general manager Thomas Dimitrov, head coach Dan Quinn, relieved of their duties after the Falcons fall 23-16 to to the Carolina Panthers yesterday inside of Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Right, and Coach Raheem Morris, if he's going to be an interim head coach, home team, he's going to have his work cut out for him. Yes, those guys are professional. Yes, they'll practice hard and they'll play hard. But some of them are going to check out. And the reason why they're going to check, check out is because who are they trying to impress? The GM is gone. That coach is not going to be there. Yeah, you might try to get on film for the other 31 teams in the NFL, but as far as that team, there's nobody in the building you're going to get that extra mile, you know, uh, uh, you know extra you know, 30 minutes of film session. You're not going to do that. You're just not going to do that when you're not trying to impress a coaching staff that's going to be here next year. Well, coaching staff that was impressive, that had some good time in the film room and a great time on Friday night, uh, certainly uh, made a lot of people feel really good about what they saw. Now we get a chance to talk to the head jacket, head football coach for the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Jeff Collins joins us here on the home team in Hamilton show here on the fan, 680-93.7 FM. And Coach Collins, thank you for joining us. How good did it feel, one, to play on a Friday night under the lights and get a win in downtown Atlanta on national TV and on the fan, 680-93.7 FM? Yeah, uh, all of that sounds really good, man. Hey, uh, first of all, I just want to say congrats to you guys. Uh, it's good to hop on the 6 of the fan and talk to you. Uh, I'm proud of what you guys do for our game, for our city. Um, j- just really proud um, of you guys and obviously of the team on Friday night. It was the first time I'd played on or coached on a Friday night in about 30 years uh, in East Atlanta. And uh, so it was good to do it downtown and in, in my home city, my home state. And it was a great win. What did the guys clean up the most, Coach, that helped you guys get the win? 
we didn't turn the ball over. <laughs> we we go we go we told them hold on to the football, and, and they did it. And uh, was really proud of them. And on the other side of the ball, we told the guys all oh, week we got to take away the football, uh, get more turnovers. <clears throat> and the thing that that I was really proud of interceptions happen, you know, batted balls, those things happen. But when you take a football from another human being and you have the intent to do it, that's what our guys did. They grabbed the ball, they ripped it out of their arms, and then they took it. Those are things that you can build on, the mindset, uh, the tenacity, all the things that we preach in this program showed up on Friday night downtown Atlanta, and we got a dub. Georgia Tech head football coach Jeff Collins joining us here on the home team in Hamilton show here on the fan 680-93.7 FM. Coach, how, how did you approach your bye week as far as reps uh, offensively and defensively? Uh, defensively, Did you do it uh, ones versus ones, ones versus twos, or did you have the, uh, the competition level pretty ratcheted up to get these guys playing at that higher level on uh, last Friday? Yeah, so a lot of times during the bye weeks, we'll have it be a, a pure developmental focus. Um, we did not do that coming off a game uh, that we felt that we left some things on the table two weeks ago. Um, so we went good on good for three really good practices during the bye week. Uh, gave them two days off for film review for self scout and to get in the weight room. Uh, and then we came back to work uh, on Sunday and just you know did our normal process, our normal routine. Um, but that that bye week, we we got after it was good on good, and we you know we played team run, we played team force, and we had some really good physical uh, periods during that week. Coach, talk about how important it is for you to play as many young guys that you are playing. Goodness, 15 to 20 freshmen or true freshmen, <laughs> sophomore guys, and I'm talking about at key position on the football field. How important is that to make sure those guys develop? Yeah, and that, that's part of our DNA. We play a lot of players. We've got the ATL philosophy where if you're above the line, you've earned the right to play. I think we had 28 defensive players play in the game. Most places that I've been, 15, 18 uh, is usually the number, but, you know, we get guys rotated in. They work really hard in practice. You know, we're a culture that's built on effort, and if you know that you don't have to play 70, 80 snaps in a game that you're going to play, if you're the elite guy that you're going to be able to play 50, well, all of those 50 plays can be ridiculous because you know you're going to have somebody in uh, to give you a blow every now and then, and uh, that's just how we build the program. That's how we run the program. And it pays off for us. We have, we wear uh, GPS monitors. Every player in our program wears a catapult GPS monitor. And we broke records uh, Friday night downtown Atlanta with our GPS for speed, distance traveled, uh, top end speed. Uh, we had four guys that had four. Oh, excuse me, four guys had over 600 sprint distance yards. Where well, that means they go 90 percent of what their fastest they've ever run for over 600 yards in the game, which is ridiculously hard to do. I don't know if we broke 300 last year. Jeff Collins. But now they get it, they understand, and they're going. Jeff Collins, head football coach of the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, joining us here on the home team in Hamilton show on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker line here on the fan, 680-93-7 FM. You talked about your defense, Coach, three sacks, eight tackles for loss. Those are game yes, changers. Talk about how the defense uh, stepped up and it all went in tandem because the offense was able to take advantage of the things the defense gave them when you guys put up seven touchdowns. Yeah, absolutely. And that you'll see, uh, you know, we have our board on the sidelines uh, behind the defensive bench and it says get the ball but it also says get 10. And what we found over the last three and a half years is when we get 10 plus sacks or tackles for loss or turnovers in combination, then we're having a very dominant defensive performance. So you'll see a lot of the things that we have going on. There's get 10 uh, around the program. That's a big piece of a tackles for loss, sacks, creating turnovers, add to that. And whenever we get over that 10, we're probably playing some really good defense. Conversely, on the offensive side of the ball, we talk about getting 10, and those are 10 explosive plays. Because historically, when we've had over 10 game-breaking, big-time plays, then again, we're usually doing pretty successful things on offense. And so just proud of both sides of the ball and how they played complementary football together. Does anything rattle Jeff Sims, Coach? I I, I just I, – I, th- I thought he really <laughs> – I thought he really grew up uh, – uh, 
uh, the, the two minute drill right before the half, that poise yep. to be able to, you know, go on a snap count, getting a free play and understanding what to do with that. And, and Coach Pat yep. Nolan, those guys being able to slow things down, is he kind of getting in the groove to where maybe you feed him a little bit more of the offense and, you know, understanding that, you know, you have to turn over the ball. Uh, things trying to kind of settling down for him right now, Coach? Well, I think one of the biggest things uh, with Jeff is his composure. I mean, he, he's got poise and maturity that's well beyond his years. Obviously, I give a great deal of credit to that, to his family. Unbelievable people that have raised him the right way. He's wired the right way, the way you want a big-time elite quarterback to be. Um, he thinks of others. Um, he distributes praise. Uh, you know, He is the first person to tell you how great the offensive line did how great the running backs, the receivers, the tight ends. He understands all of those components, and he believes it, and it's real. And uh, just just really proud of him and how he's handled you know, this situation, being thrust into the spot that he's in and the way he's handled it. Uh, Mike Flynn, our sports information director, said that only 12 times this season has a quarterback thrown for over 240 yards and rushed for 60. Only 12 times has that happened this season. Jeff Sims has three of the 12. Goodness. That's pretty cool for a true freshman. Yeah, that's balling. Yeah, he's, he's pretty good there. Head coach of the uh, yeah. Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, Jeff Collins, joining us here on the home team in Hamilton show. He's on the Loud Securities Newsmaker line. Uh, last thing for me, Coach, uh, how do you like your running back stable? They're going to have to be big with Clemson next up on the list for the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Yeah, they're, they're, they're a great team. They're, they're number one in the country for a reason. Uh, in every phase of the game, they've got great players. They've got great coaching. They've got great scheme. Um, but, but really excited about the running back room that we have. Um, you know, we've been out uh, w- without J.P. Mason, uh, who is one of the top three running backs in the ACC heading into the season. But what he has done from a leadership role, a support role, being with those guys every day, positively affecting them, helping them with the mental piece. And then you see Dante Smith doing great things on special teams. Then as a running back, you see Jemias Griffin doing really nice things running the ball. And then another true freshman, uh, Jameer Gibbs, uh, you know, I think he, he's shown up and done a lot of really positive things uh, for this offense as a true freshman. Um, and then you got Jordan Williams, our true freshman right tackle. And that just speaks volumes to the leadership that we have in this program, the leadership amongst the offensive line, uh, and even the tight ends and the receivers, all of them, just making sure they understand what we're doing, uh, understand our culture, understand that we're based on effort, not talent, and that at some point um, how hard you play matters, how much grit you have, how much toughness you have uh, matters uh, in big-time college football games. And we know we've got one. Uh, at noon on ABC downtown Atlanta again. Coach, how does the recruiting landscape change? Uh, it, it, the challenges uh, have y'all gotten adapted more so than you know what you're trying to do? What's some of the difficulties? Uh, well, I, I mean, I can't talk specifics about no, recruiting. No, no, not players. Just but our the way you go, you go yeah, about it now yeah, in the yeah, pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the coolest thing is we have a young, energetic, technologically savvy staff, um, and I think that the recruiting class that we just signed. Uh, was one of the top two in Georgia Tech history uh, from a recruiting ranking standpoint. Um, And I don't know how these rankings are going to be working during a global pandemic, but the guys that we have targeted, um, even though I cannot talk specifics, um, you know, are are culturally aligned. They're from a a size, speed, athletic ability standpoint, uh, and us making the connections uh, via Zoom or via FaceTime, whatever we're doing uh, to make these connections is powerful and uh, just excited about the present of this football program, where we are and how we continue to get better. And then us, the recruits that are out there for all the classes coming up, they're seeing a new vibe and a new swag uh, that exists in downtown Atlanta at the Institute and uh, I think a lot of people are excited about the trajectory of this program, and rightfully so. I'm one of them. Um, just fired up the way these guys come to work every day, their demeanor, their attitude, their work ethic. And uh, it's, it's, it's an exciting time, and we know we got a big-time opponent coming into the flats uh, on Saturday. 
Well, we thank you for your time, Coach. Congratulations on the win Friday. Should be a big build-up to uh, Saturday's game as well. And we'll talk to you soon, talk to you down the line. And uh, uh, we thank you for your kind words, and we certainly hope that things continue to go the right way down there on the flats. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it, Coach. Head coach of the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, Jeff Collins, joining us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker Line. Trevor Lawrence and those guys uh, doing a number on Miami. We'll push a little pig coming up. We thought we were going to have, you know, two teams. It would have been good if Miami would have been able to knock them off, and now we have a a, a little bit more of a storyline. But now (laughs) they're still the bullies. We still got a storyline. We do? Yeah. We still have a storyline. In the ACC? Yeah. Okay. We got one at 12 o'clock noon. We just talked to the head coach of the Yellow Jackets. Oh, you're talking about this week. I was talking about, you know, with Miami beating Clemson. Yes, we would have had another storyline with Clemson with their first loss. Uh, Okay, we got one coming up. I didn't mean to upset you, partner. No, you you don't upset me. I didn't mean to – I don't like that look you just gave me. I apologize. Well, I thought you were just saying that, you know, (laughs) Clemson was going to come in here and just – (laughs) <laughs> do that thing. No, this is a monster week. You know what? Let me get you a monster. And 680 Fans Monster Week is fueled by Monster Energy Ultra Watermelon. When you fuel up for the NLCS tonight, dogs and tide on Saturday, jackets and tigers this week. Try the brand new Ultra Watermelon. Zero sugar, and it tastes like summertime in a can. Now available in all Atlanta Quick Trip locations. When we get back, we'll push a little pig. We'll talk about Clemson. We'll talk about the change that has come to Atlanta, and we'll get a chance to see how the dogs could have something special for Bama. Coming up next, he's Joe Hamilton. I'm home team. It's the home team in Hamilton show here on The Fan, 680-93.7 F.
Sports Desk. Visit BredaPest.com. Braves open up the National League Championship Series. Good morning, Atlanta. I'm home team Brandon Leak. This sports update is brought to you by Breda. Breda has no gaps in coverage. With Breda, you never have to be afraid of bugs. The official pest control of UGA Athletics. B-R-E-D-A Pest.com. Braves. Open up game one of the NLCS with the Dodgers. Walker Bueller taking on Max Freed. Catch all the action here on your home for Braves baseball. 680 the fan. First pitch slated for 808. Dan Quinn fired after an 0 8 start or 0 5 start. He, along with Thomas Dimitrov, general manager of the Falcons, Raheem Morris will be the interim head coach. Falcons fall 23 16 to the Panthers in Mercedes Benz Stadium yesterday. And there it is. You're listening to the most powerful voice in sports. You're home for Braves postseason baseball. The fans, 680 93.7 FM. This is Home Team and Hamilton, live on The Fan, presented by Wellstar Health System. Welcome back in to the Home Team and Hamilton show here on The Fan, 680 93.7 FM. Home Team Brandon Week, College Football Hall of Famer and the Super Bowl champion, Joe Hamilton. Happy jacket, Joe Hamilton. Very that was, happy. It was a good win. Good to see all those touchdowns scored by Georgia Tech and the defense come up uh, with a big comeback win. Uh, saw them tweet out it was the first double-digit comeback win at home since another guy. Well, they didn't say that. I, I said it. Since the uh, 90s. I said, I know who was quarterback in the end. Joe Hamilton. So it doesn't happen all the time, but it was good to see them get the dub. Good to see Georgia get the dub. Um, a a, a we won't call it a shaky start as we push a little bit of pig. Um, it just wasn't a smooth start. First play of the game results in a touchdown as a bad snap goes over the head of Stetson Bennett. Tennessee's able to fall on it, and they're up 7 nothing quickly before the Georgia defense can even get out on the field. Uh, and then things just take over. What I'm seeing from the dogs is you have about a quarter. You have about two quarters. And then when the third quarter starts – you're probably in big trouble because the defense has settled in. And what I'm seeing from the Jackets is if they take care of the ball and they can run it enough, they can compete and hang in there with anybody. Are you you're talking about the Yellow Jackets? Yes. Why Why not? Why not? Home it's team? the turnovers that will turn the Jackets. It's the lack of, and I haven't seen it. I just don't see any fall off in that Georgia defense. They are elite. Coach. <laughs> you want me to say it again? I'm sorry. Elite, brother. <laughs> they are whooping some folks in the, th- the end of the third and fourth quarters. And, uh, and the thing about being uh, elite as a defensive uh, the defensive team, you can scare quarterbacks off of film. You can do so many good things off of film, then a quarterback mindset is that he's not going to be successful on game day because nobody else was successful while he was studying film. So the chess match, what those guys are going to go through starting tomorrow, preparing for game week, the Yellow Jackets and comparing – uh, uh, preparing for the Tigers and then the Bulldogs preparing for the, uh, Alabama. It's going to be a really, really fun week on those campuses. All right, let's take the pig and run with it. Uh, push a little pig right now. Dogs blow out Tennessee 44 21. Stetson Bennett, smooth. Like a new car with the premium gas in it. Smooth as he's able to operate the offense. Offensive line did a good job. Running backs look well. Kiaris Jackson now looks like he's the number one. We've been talking about George Pickens. Now it looks like Kiaris Jackson is the guy who's making the big plays week after week downfield for the Dogs. Yes, you're right. And I think he's got a real uh, chemistry going on right now with Stetson Bennett, and that bodes well for the uh, Georgia uh, Bulldogs. But they're going to have to need some more, some more people. George Pickens is going to have to be the George Pickens of last year. And some more people are going to have to step up. And the defense is going to have to bend but don't break. Uh, Georgia Tech, they win. They score seven touchdowns. It was a good balance of offense and defense and good quarterback and good coaching as well. They clean up a lot of the sloppy penalties and turnovers that cost them last time against Syracuse. Exactly what the doctor ordered, home team. An overall team win. Everybody include, included. Everybody contributed. And that's when you feel good about preparation for the next week. Clemson blows out Miami 42-17. Tigers were in control. Uh, a couple of licks handed out to Trevor Lawrence showed that he's not just some pretty guy. He's a tough guy. Took a couple of shots and then got took one at the uh, goal line at the end zone and then talked a little trash to some Miami Hurricanes. Absolutely no weaknesses in, in that quarterback home team. Generational talent. Leader. Gutsy. Uh, 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 durable. 
Trevor Lawrence, he's that deal, and they're talented. I didn't know that the Clemson DBs were that talented. And once again, Brent Venables, he has a defense working in his top five, going around smashing folks. Tale of two coaches and two outcomes. Texas A&M beats Florida 41-38. Jimbo Fisher, his first top five win at Texas A&M. Kyle Trask did his job for the Gators. The turnover late did them in, and Dan Mullen's defense should just be Ethan's because there's no D in it. Awful. I could have run for 30 yards, Joe. Yeah. But you know what, home team? And I, I, Todd Grantham has been around. A long time. A long time. He's a really, really good defensive coordinator. But sometimes I think he installs too much. He has, he has too many exotics going on, and I don't think his players know exactly where they line up sometimes. Bama, they beat Ole Miss, and they need it. When it was next time or basketball last time? Basketball score, man. It was a basketball score. We'll have to say this. Bama needed 63 points to put Ole Miss away. They went 63-48. They needed that last touchdown by uh, the run game to put things away. And uh, what does this mean for UGA was the first thing I was thinking. A lot of missed tackles, a lot of penetration from the – uh, offensive line to the second level is what I saw Ole Miss was doing. And if those things are going to be there next week for Kirby and that offensive yeah. line for the Dogs and a running back tandem, oh, boy, they, it's going to be some folks with some happy smiles at the end of the game. Well, during the week, home team, make no mistake about it, while the Bulldogs are watching this film against Alabama last week against Ole Miss. Oh, can we put that in, Coach? Can we run that? Oh, we have that play. Oh, I can, I can do that, DB. I can get my points on him. Oh, I can dominate that defensive tackle. They're thinking positively right now because of what uh, Alabama put on film last week. Uh, NFL uh, Panthers beat the Falcons 23-16. It's the end of an era as Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov, the head coach and the general manager of the Falcons, have been relieved of their duties. That was made known by Arthur Blank last night before 10 o'clock. It's time to start over, in my opinion, Joe. We're going to have time to talk about this for the rest of the season, into the offseason. Some people will say, no, 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 we have talent. We just need the right minds and the right plays. Personally, I don't think we have the players in place to be one of the best teams in football at the end. That means we need to start over. You know what, home team, I can't let you get away with it because I can't let myself get away with it. Okay. Because I wasn't saying this before the season. I wasn't saying tearing everything, tear, uh, uh, tear everything down. We don't have talent. I've reassessed. Fact, I have too. Matter of fact, I was thinking, man, defensively, we had Dante Fowler. That should be good. No. Marlon Davidson up front should be good. No. You know, Grady Jarrett, no. Keanu Neal coming back. You know, Terrell. I was feeling comfortable. Definitely feeling comfortable on the offense, home team. 16 points. Two weeks in a row. So, scored so, 16 in Green Bay. Scored 16 this week. So that's where I was disappointed at. And, and, and I know we need to tear it all up. I'm in agreement with you. But I'm not sure if a better coach could. I mean, I, I'm sure that a better coach can get more out of this team than Dan Quinn. What I want is whoever's coaching next, whoever's GMing next, whoever's the next team president, they get to have their own path to glory. Don't just take what's here. If you like what's here, keep it. If you don't, give them carte blanche to say, I can't win with this guy. We need to move on. Get ready for a rebuild. And that might be two or three years, and we might just have to take it. I'd be willing to do it uh -huh. for our championship run. I like it. Michael Thomas uh, fighting one of his teammates. He's out with the uh, New Orleans Saints, so he won't be playing. Alex Smith returned to the Washington football team. I was a little uneasy watching him go out there. <laughs> I must admit I was wrong. I thought Alex Smith would never play a down of football again. I thought this was a, a way of rewarding him. Maybe he'd be a part of the staff. But he has worked his tail off to come back and be out there. And shout out to him. The doctors would not clear that young man if he wasn't ready to go. Raiders beat the Chiefs and the Chiefs their first loss. Uh, your old coach, John Gruden, put up 40. And the Chiefs now no longer unbeaten. Yeah, Coach Gruden, you just got those guys believing. Darren Waller, you know, being an outstanding tight end. Josh Jacobs running the ball, uh, uh, you know, effectively. And that's a huge win. Make no doubt about it. And it's a divisional win. And the Texans get their first win. They relieve Bill <laughs> O'Brien of his duties. And how about that? They got rid of the coach. They got their first win. They are no longer among the ranks of the winless as the Texans are on the board with the W. Yes. <laughs> so it was all Billy O'Brien's fault. Uh, huh? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but uh, you get Rome, rid of Nuke Hopkins. Co Co Coach Com uh, Romeo Cornell is uh, much better than Yeah, <laughs> you get rid of Nuke Hopkins and you don't have any wins. That's on you, buddy. No doubt. And that's pushing a little pig uh, around football, the NFL, and college. 404-231-1680. Braves and Dodgers, it could be epic, Joe. 
we could see one of the all-time series with the amount of hitting, uh, the amount of sizzle that both teams have, the amount of comeback wins that the Braves have if they happen to be trailing at the end of a ball game. We could be on deck for an epic ending to the National League Championship Series, but we want to get off to a good start. Max Freed didn't have a great start uh, his last outing, so now he's got a chance to get back on the good foot and, um, you know, going up against Walker Bueller. Two good hitting teams are going up against two good pitchers. Uh, who wouldn't want to put the put the radio on and listen to that? Who wouldn't want to do it, home team? I know I'm going to do it. I'll be doing it. Uh, and Max Freed, we need five innings, home team, on three earned runs or less. That That's a good outing for him. That's not asking too much. Uh, limit the walks. I'm talking about no walks or maybe one, about six strikeouts. And then I'm, I'll feel really, really comfortable. I'm a little at ease, uh, unease right now with Max Freed. I don't know why my gut, in my gut now, I'm not as comfortable as I should be. I don't know why. You don't have to explain your gut. If it feels good, I feel. It doesn't feel good about Max Freed in this lineup. Well, I nobody's going to shut down I, this lineup. Well, we're not going to shut these guys down. Although. We might be looking at an epic run from our bullpen right. based on what we've seen. Now, we've played lesser teams, but now that they have a, a few games under their belt, a few innings under their belts, uh, we, uh, the Dodgers could be in for an epic uh, postseason run running into this machine that Alex Anthopoulos has put together in the bullpen. Who would have more fans in the stands tonight, the Braves or the Dodgers? That's a good question. <laughs> 404-231-1680, anybody planning to go out there to Texas? That's a good question. It's kind of halfway, I would think. From Georgia to Texas and Texas to California, who would be out there in the stands? And who would be there for the World Series? I, I, I know you're going to have some folks show up for the World Series if it was able to go the distance for the Braves. That's a good question to see which fan base would show up. 404-231-1680, the number to get in on the home team in Hamilton show. You want to go out to the phones? Yes, sir. Let's talk to Eddie. Eddie, thank you for calling us here on the home team in Hamilton show here on the fan, 680-93.7 FM. Good morning, gentlemen. How are y'all today? Doing well, Eddie. How you doing today? Good, Eddie. Oh, coming off one of the best weekends I've had in a long time, sports-wise. Woke up, watched the Gators take it on the collar, which always makes me happy as a dog fan. Then watched the dogs beat up Tennessee. I'll get to that in a minute. Then I didn't watch a second of the Falcons game because I refused to until got regime change, which we got. So now we're going to get a new GM and a new coach, long overdue. Got the Braves and Dodgers tonight and Bama, Georgia this weekend. Man, what a weekend, guys. That was so fun. You summed that up. What'd you like about the dogs, Eddie? And what do you think about the Falcons and their regime change along with the Braves tonight? So, dogs first. I will say this if they do in the first half, not punching it in on fourth and one, snapping balls over people's heads, they're going to get destroyed by Alabama. You cannot do those types of things against Alabama. I'm not saying they have to play perfectly. But they cannot afford to do that. Let's be honest. Tennessee is not where Alabama is. But our defense is absolutely legitimate, guys. I'm not telling you guys don't you, something you don't already know. But I, I am actually excited when Georgia, let's just say, punts the ball because I can't <laughs> wait to get that defense back on the field. That's a good they spot just, to be in, Eddie. They're just running all over the place, making quarterbacks run for their lives, stuffing the run. But I think this team is epitomized by a play I saw when the game was still in the balance. And it was when our quarterback hurt Jermaine, hit Jermaine Burton over the middle. We may have been up by 3-7 at that point. I don't remember. And he's running down the field and fumbles the ball. And out of nowhere, the center comes up and gets the ball somehow in his gut and yeah. makes another two yards. If you watch that play, guys, which I watched it last night, the center was not even on the screen when that play happened. He was out of the picture. So that tells me this team is like they don't ever stop playing. And thank goodness he was there and was able to get that football because that saved our bacon. This team is really well constructed, and they're so deep. And I like our chances against Alabama. What I witnessed, what I witnessed Saturday night against Ole Miss, mm -hmm. that ain't a scary Alabama defense. That's just not. Now, they're really good on, on offense. It's gonna, we're going to have our hands full. But that defense is not very good. It's not Alabama-like. Thanks for the call, Eddie. The number you call, 404-231-1680 to get in. We have somebody at Hartsfield-Jackson, Joe. Somebody's headed. <laughs> Asking ye <laughs> shall receive. Let's go out and talk to Ian. Ian, thank you for calling us here on the home team in Hamilton show. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good. Awesome. Thank awesome. you for having me on. Uh, so, um, I'm flying out to Austin today. I mean, actually, Dallas. Uh, go and watch the Braves game. I'm a huge Braves fan. Um, I'm really sad that I'm not going to see Braves baseball until 
this game. Like, my mom texted me right after the NLDS. She's like, hey, do you want to fly out to Texas? I was like, I can't believe you're giving me this opportunity. Wow. How many games are you planning to stay? How long do you plan to stay in Texas? I'm only going to game one because I still have to go to school because I am in high school. But um, I'm just excited to see baseball again. Wow, that's a fantastic opportunity. You know what, Ian, make sure you call us later in the week to tell us about your experience. We'd love to hear it. Number you call, 404-231-168. I guess he'll be in school, though. (laughs) Got to tell him, when you ditch school, (laughs) put that on Twitter. And we thank him for the call. That's all. That guy sounded like he was 45 years old, man. I can't believe he was in high school. (laughs) I need to get a little bit more bass in my voice, Hamilton. No, you got enough. That's a mature young man. And I'm, you know what, but young people need this experience. The experience of having an opportunity like that, and Ian's going to get a chance to uh, get on a plane, be excited about getting there, get there, see the Braves tonight, and hopefully he gets a chance to see a win. Um, but young people need that. And that's another thing. You know, we've had a generation of uh, fans that just haven't had this kind of fun and this kind of opportunity. So um, – that is, re- that is reassuring and refreshing to hear a young person like that get a chance to go to a game of this magnitude in, a, in the current circumstances we are in, in a pandemic, where he can still get a chance to go see his team play. Yeah, absolutely. He should be having his chest poked out. This is the Atlanta Braves he's going to grow up on. The, uh, Ronald Cunha Jr. and Ozzie Albies and Freddie Freeman, they, these are his superstars. You know what? We need to give a four-pack away. <laughs> I was going to have a phrase that pays. We're just taking caller six. <laughs> I'm excited about it. Ian's got me fired up. 404-231-1680. Caller number six. We're going to give away four lower-level tickets to each game. They're having watch parties here at Truist Park, and we're going to give you a four-pack of lower-level tickets for each game, plus the all-important Red Deck Parking Pass, courtesy of Joe Hamilton. (laughs) He wants you to get in here with your folks, but no troubles. And you're going to get that and a four-ticket Perch punch right now, and we're also seeing that uh, you're going to get a chance to still get uh, some other things. There are groups of two, four, and six with these social distancing guidelines, so it'll be safe for everybody, and it is going to take place game one through a potential game seven, so we'll be giving tickets away all week long. This has been uh, Eddie laid it out. He's right. Um, This weekend for the city, and then what's coming up? Tech Clemson. Alabama, Georgia, first game with Raheem Morris as new head coach of the Atlanta Falcons, Braves and Dodgers. I mean, we have a full week of interesting and entertaining games that we have to get ready for. Yeah, I like it. I feel the energy, man. I really, really feel the energy in the city and just around whoever you meet, and it's a happy energy right now. It's not one of those negative vibes at all. Yeah, I think um, what I'm looking for tonight is an answer. If the Dodgers score first – Braves answer. Uh, if the Braves score for it first, answer with a one, two, three, or get out of trouble. An answer inning. Don't uh, do something great and then let the Dodgers feel good about themselves. Put together a three-run rally. <laughs> Let's make sure they don't get a three-run poke in the bottom of the inning. That that kind of thing, Joe. It sounds easy, huh? Is, that, it, is it that easy? That's all you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> I know that drives you crazy. What I'm you make this All game. you got to do Man. is not let them have the beginning when we have the beginning. That's correct. And, again, it goes back to something you said earlier in the show. Runners in scoring position. You got to cash in. Hey, make sure you uh, check out the 680 Fan YouTube channel. We are streaming live and will be streaming live uh, all day long. We are broadcasting today from the Atlanta Braves dugout. Thanks to the Atlanta Braves for this uh, opportunity. You want to talk about, uh, you know, a kid getting the chance. Now he's a grown man getting a chance to come and sit in the dugout and be happy. That's me right now, Joe Hamilton. And I join in with that. I'm very happy. I'm very, very happy. And it's an experience I've never done before. I've never sat in a dugout and seen a view of a baseball field like I'm doing now. I got a chance to come. I'm grateful. uh, When they were still constructing the ballpark, they gave the media a tour, but it wasn't quite finished yet. So this is the first time I got a chance to sit in here. See, I want to go stand where Snit stands. Right over there. Yeah. The other thing is I've measured it out, Joe. For me, as out of shape as I am, it's six seconds from the dugout to the mound. If Urania or a Marlin ever hits Ronald Acuna Jr. again. So it should only take about three or four for p- folks to hop the fence and get out there and uh, let, let a message be sent. Oh. Now I can see for myself <laughs> how long it takes. You're funny, man. They're doing some groundwork, so I can't run. I would run it and time myself, but I want to mess up this lovely grass. I would not let there. you run out there in front of these folks. If it was just you and I. Well, neither will Brave Security. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I would not let you do that. Coming up. 
We're going to get a chance to do a roundtable discussion uh, with a man who can tell us how victory can be guaranteed. Chris Domino going to tell us the winning ways the Braves need to be a part of when they take on the Dodgers tonight in game one of the NLCS. That's coming up. He's Joe Hamilton. I'm home team. It's the home team in Hamilton show here on the fan, 680-93.7 F. Atlanta, I'm home team. 
Brandon Leak. This sports update is brought to you by Georgia Natural Gas. Sign up with G&G &G today to get a low rate plus $100 off your first bill. Heat things up this winter with G&G &G at gng.com. Braves face the Dodgers for game one of the National League Championship Series tonight. Game one has Walker Bueller facing Max Freed. First pitch slated for 8.08. You can hear all the action right here on the fan. Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov relieved of their duties after the Falcons fall 23-16 to the Panthers. Falcons 0-5. Dan Quinn was in his sixth season. ALCS action saw the Rays beat the Astros 2-1. Raheem Morris will be the interim head coach for the Falcons. And there it is. You're listening to the most powerful voice in sports and your home for Atlanta Braves postseason baseball, the fan. 680-93-7-FM. <laughs> this is Home Team and Hamilton, live on the fan, presented by Wellstar Health System. Welcome back in Woo! to the Home Team and Hamilton show Woo! here on the fan, 680-93-7 FM. Home Team Brandon Leak, Joe Hamilton. Did we get a winner? 404-231-1680 giving away that four pack for the watch party here at Truist Park. I want to remind you that every Friday we have our small business spotlight and it's presented by Georgia Primary Bank. Primary, Georgia Primary Bank, your community, your bank. Visit GeorgiaPrimaryBank.com. Joined with Joe Hamilton, and now a masked man, Joe, <laughs> joins us. Chris Domino. I'm being socially responsible. He's got a mask on, a different kind of mask. He told me to wear a mask. Now, we've seen some catchers with some masks on. Yeah. You've got a catcher's mask on. Uh-huh. As you get ready for uh, your jaunt through the sports talk radio world with Nick Cellini coming up here at 11 o'clock. Right. I was told a long time ago, treat every event like it's an interview. <laughs> Who you, knows? They might carry three catchers next year. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. You I'm got me fired ready. up. You, you got me fired up again. All right, Chris, you got me fired up again. All right, man. let's do it, Joe. I wasn't I anticipating you coming in like that. No. You're ready to rumble. What are you looking for then <laughs> tonight? What are you looking for more importantly tonight? This First pitch strikes. Okay. Uh, you got two pretty aggressive offenses, the numbers would tell you, but the idea of trying to get a guy to go a little bit further, Max Fried, bigger spot than he was in the last time. Walker Bueller, same thing. You know, these guys got experience, certainly more than the Braves when it comes to these types of games. Doesn't mean they're going to be better at it. I think the other thing is keep an eye. I asked Brian Snicker yesterday on Zoom about pitching to a shift, and he said, no, we don't do it. You want evidence? They shift about 7.5% of the time in the Braves, which is as low as it gets percentage-wise in all of baseball. You know what the Dodgers are? 53%, number one in baseball. Go the other way. So keep an eye on what they do with Freddie Freeman, Marcelo Zuna, Dansby Swanson has seen a shift. Uh, I think they think their pitchers, if you're going to go 53% of the time in a shift, you think your pitchers can actually pitch to the shift. We don't play that. Snit said we, we play to our strengths. We try to move guys around a little bit, but they don't move guys around nearly as much as other people. These guys don't have to get cute. We don't need to see a bunt from Ronald Cunha Jr., <laughs> then a bunt from Freddie, then a bunt from Ozuna, do we? I think no. we're good. No, I don't even know if they have signals anymore. I don't even know if Ron Washington has that in his, uh, in his back pocket yeah, when he good. walks out to third base for some of these guys. I'm thinking that um, – just answer. And I told Joe, it drives Joe <laughs> up the yeah. wall when I say all you got to do because mm -hmm. it makes it seem like it's just easy sure. to do any sport. Yeah, write it down and it'll happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All wish you got to do. Wish it you, into the universe. Are, are you say it um, uh, enough times, it'll happen. <laughs> all you got to do is answer. And when I say answer is if you score three runs, don't give up the three-run homer in the right. bottom of the inning. Right. If you are down a run um, and then you score, don't let them go back and forth. See if you can just hold because we are playing a very dangerous and potent offensive unit as well. Against Cincinnati and Miami, you can make mistakes. Against this team, you can't. And I, I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. They hit bad pitches, but they hit good pitches. You can make a good pitch, and this team is good enough. I got an MVP in Bellinger in sixth or seventh. So that'll tell you how deep they are. They got a catcher position, which, by the way, they've been terrible offensively in the last few years in the postseason. They had a kid, Will Smith, the other day pick up five hits, and their catchers are hitting over 350, I think, for the postseason so far this year. They got nothing out of that position in the last couple of runs that they tried to make to a title. Give me somebody unsung tonight, Chris, unsung that we're not expecting. We know the superstars and home team like to say, yeah. follow the money. Somebody that, you know, is due. Somebody that's almost due for a good one right now. Well, the nation knows who Travis Darno is now because the numbers were good enough where when you're talking about Carlton Fisk, Johnny Bench, and he's done things that those guys didn't, people know that. I'll go with Dansby tonight. Okay. You know, I think Dansby actually middle in. We certainly know he can go down the line. Uh, it'll be interesting. Everybody knows the story about this ballpark. For a ballpark that's only had 30-something games played in it, mm -hmm. we've really written a narrative on it. It's big, not a lot of home runs. It's not Dodger Stadium in the middle of the day. It's not Truist Park. 
One home run and 23 runs scored for the Dodgers. That's very far off, about 50% of their runs this year being scored via the home run. It'll also tell you how good they are. San Diego did not have its best two starters. Life was easier for them to score runs without home runs. I'm really curious to see at night how this ballpark might actually play. And, again, Freddie Freeman said it yesterday. It's big. It, it's big. It played out big, no doubt about it, in the series we just saw. You're part of the Ford leadoff show, part of our Braves uh, broadcast team, and you guys have the call. Um, first pitch slate for 8.08. I'm just looking for them to, to play, and we, we've said it, just Braves baseball. We, we know they can score early, and yeah. if they don't, we know they can score late. Just don't have a power outage with the bats. Let Snit in the bullpen. Let things fall where they're going to fall. I'm a huge believer, Joe. You turn the football over, what happens? Oh, you get beat. Yeah. You turn it over multiple times, what happens? Oh, you get blown out. Yeah. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Playing the game clean. Again, I was on a Zoom call with Freddie yesterday and talked about the defensive play he made, the one that Nick Markakis made. You can't give them more than 27 outs. You get to 29 and 30, that's like letting them play 10 innings. And remember, they have the home field advantage in game one and two. They'll get the last ups. Uh, we'll talk about bullpens and everything else that comes with it. But you can't give them extras. If you've got to turn a double play, turn it. You know, if, you, if you're supposed to make a play, make it. Same thing for the Braves. The good news is the Braves' offense is in the same position. You make a mistake against them, they're supposed to make you pay. The Dodgers are a little bit better up and down their lineup at making you pay. It, it, my bad home team, and you don't like when I say this at all, but are the Braves playing with house money, Chris? No, <laughs> Joseph. No, please. The World Series run now, Joe. Please. Okay. I'm gonna, no. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm you know what? This deal off. They're playing with Liberty, Meet, Liberty Media money. They're playing with their own money because they got some free agents and some guys who are going to go to arbitration. I'm sorry. I know money's I'm involved. Sorry. So we're expecting to beat the Dodgers. Oh, they can beat the Dodgers. I'm not expecting them to beat the Dodgers. I know they can beat the Dodgers. Oh, I, listen, you're getting me fired up again. <laughs> they, they were better than Cincinnati. They were better than Miami. Are they better than this team? No, they're not. The reality is, though, they're not like the 2018 where you just looked around and said, we need a lot of things to happen. Okay. This team can create things on their own if you give them one or two. But it goes both ways in this series. Other big story in town, the Falcons uh, relieved Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov. Yeah. Of their duties, uh, you have personal relationships with both of them. I have a, a relationship with TD. I'll, I'll call him sometime this week. Mm -hmm. Great people, yeah. great guys. Yeah. There aren't guys that can't come back to town. There's some people that can't come back. <laughs> Jeff George <laughs> and Bobby Petrino <laughs> cannot come back. There's going to be no Boot reunion them. tour. They, they need to be booted when yeah. they come back. Yeah. These guys, they could come back. Yeah. Your thoughts on uh, when you heard what you heard and uh, what that means moving forward? Look, it kind of stinks because you get to know guys and you certainly don't wish it upon anybody. When it comes to the Atlanta Falcons in the last few years of playing NFL football, it hasn't been good. And when it's not good for a period of time, what happens? More so than ever before. Had, look, I will say this. Had you won that Super Bowl, might you have bought in the end of this year? Yeah, yes. you might have. Because they think there's Super Bowl equity. That's yes. what I call it. It's Super Bowl. It's championship equity. You don't have that on the resume. It still might have happened at the end of the year, but I'm not sure if it would have happened in season. I think there's a respect factor and everything else. The big thing now is going to be the search. And we'll hear Rich McKay and Arthur Blank later on today. I'm curious to see what it is they're willing to tell us about the search. We know Raheem Morris is now the interim coach. Did he deserve it? No. Uh, who on this staff did? I don't know. Nobody. I wanted maybe a CEO to come in and maybe handle this thing the rest of the year. But the other thing is people are going to be talking about a draft pick already. Well, be, We're not in the middle of October and we're already talking about a draft pick. We're not that's, even, a bad, that's a bad week in an NFL city. Six weeks in, yeah. and we have no coach, no GM, and we're looking at the future of the Atlanta Falcons. That was a fun run. Yeah, man. Let's open up the week, Joe. Uh, we'll probably take more calls on the dogs and jackets tomorrow. Bring your gloves tomorrow. I think I will. We'll be up top. We'll yeah, I, I, I need to borrow one. I want to throw you a throw pitch, one. and I want to shag a fly from Joe Hamilton. <laughs> That's what I want to do. Put the mask on. All right. I want to say thanks to everybody that helped out with the uh, broadcast today. Sean Nerney, producer. Keith Ivolito, uh, a fantastic job here on site. The best in the business, Brandon Joseph. We have Brandon Harper and director of social media, Caitlin. Thanks to everybody. Thanks for everybody who called. Thanks to Jeff Collins for calling in. We'll see you tomorrow, 9 to 11. Coming up next, Domino and Cellini here on The Fan, 680-937-FM.
680 and 93.7 FM, literally sitting in the Braves dugout. You can watch us at the fans' YouTube channel while you're there. Like and subscribe as well, of course. Game one of the National League Championship Series is tonight. 808 first pitch, 650 the Ford leadoff show comes your way here on the fan. we got a couple of things uh, worth mentioning. First of all, we know that the viewing parties are going to be happening right here at Truist Park throughout the NLCS, hopefully beyond that, into the World Series. We've got a, a four-pack to give away for tomorrow night's watch party, braves.com. If you want more information, we'll provide more a little bit later on. So, Domino, the onus is on you to create a question, oh my perhaps challenging to a certain extent for someone to win those tickets a little bit later on for tomorrow night's viewing party here at Truist Park. If nominated, I will run. All right. If elected, I will serve. I appreciate that. No problem. And it's a monster beginning to a monster week here on 680 The Fan. It's monster week fueled by Monster Energy Ultra Watermelon. When fueling up for the NLCS, the dogs, the Tide, or the Jackets, and the Tigers this week, try the brand-new Ultra Watermelon. Zero sugar, tastes like summertime in a can, Domino, now available at all Atlanta Quick Trip locations. So the Monster Week begins, and we'll talk more about one of the Braves facing some of his heroes tonight in Game 1 of the NLCS in just a couple of seconds. But uh, last night, as we all know, the news does break. Arthur Blank finally makes the move. He fires both Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov. I thought because he was the GM, Thomas Dimitrov would make it through the rest of the season. Not the case. Rich McKay will kind of handle the front office, the GM side of things, on an interim basis until the season ends. Same deal with Raheem Morris. He is now the interim head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. I don't know what the trade deadline is going to be around the NFL. I don't know what it will be for the Falcons. We'll certainly be looking, I'm assuming, to grab draft picks if it happens. That's why I think you thought, I don't want to speak for you, Thomas Dimitrov would be around. There's still football business that Rich McKay has been out of for quite a while now. I have no idea if they're going to bring in. Look, we'll hear from Arthur and Rich today. Are they going to bring in somebody else? Is somebody else inside the building now going to be the person responsible to call GMs or capologists, get together and figure out who is it that might be wanted? And by the way, it's not as many guys as you think, so you're not dealing from a position of strength when it comes to the trade deadline. Will you look to acquire something in a trade, uh, give up a future draft pick if you think you get a certainty in here where the draft doesn't become as burdensome next year as it might be as you're now going to try to find a new general manager who figures out, look, here's the good news. Whoever comes in as a GM, and whether it's the end of the season or not, there are going to be a couple of people who know they're going to be talked to. They're going to start doing Atlanta Falcons work. When you walk into that meeting, this is not going to be one of those, here I am, here's my resume. You're going to have to come in and, I think, pitch the idea of how you're going to get this team back because unless you can do that, I'm not so sure that I want to go to a second interview. Falcons 0-5 for the first time since 97. Dan Quinn. 14 and 23 since 2018. Counting the playoffs, he's 43 and 42 overall. I mean, you saw more of the same yesterday. You saw a team give up in the first half. You saw a team allow a long touchdown drive right before halftime. And you saw a team come oh so close in the second half only to make a major mistake. Nothing has changed all season long. Well, what is it they say? You have to be either arrow up. Nothing stays the same. Jeff Van Oat was the one who told me that. Nothing stays the same. You're either getting better or you're not. And getting better in the NFL is not close. Getting better in the NFL is not leading for three quarters instead of a half and then losing a game. That's not better. Better in the NFL is results, and the team hasn't gotten any better in that department. And like we said, you can uh, watch us today all day long. In fact, Hut and Buck will follow us on the Fans YouTube channel later on. Chuck and Chernoff right here in the Braves dugout. Before we get to the Braves, want to mention the fact you can also follow us at the Ameripress Fresh Off the Press Twitter feed at Chris Domino at Sean Nerney. At Cellini, Nick, it's our Twitter question uh, of the morning, what was in it fact. This morning? If you're Arthur Blank, the first call that you're making, is it to a GM candidate? Is oh. it to a head coaching candidate? What's the first thing you're doing as far as starting up the process? Because now you're going to have to pretty much tear everything down and build it back up. Unless you have a, uh, you know, a short list, and we do say this all the time. I don't know if Arthur Blank was in the, in the short list business. You know, I say whether it's in your head or locked in a drawer, three names. If, if given an opportunity to hire again, and that's a GM thing, I don't know if Arthur's thought about it. I don't know if Arthur's really in a position to be thinking about it. He's got other stuff going on in his life. Might he have somebody that he covets? Sure. If I'm an owner of, uh, of an NFL team, I'd like to think that I'm qualified to cover somebody. But I think you've got to do the GM thing first. What's going to be really interesting is do you get that process started immediately? As in, is the guy that you want someplace else? Got to wait. Or is there somebody out there that you think, you know what, this could be an interim general manager thing as well. If Rich is running this show from a GM point of view, 
I really want to hear him say that today. Because whether it's the trade deadline, working with cap people, trying to figure out, there's a board. I'm not letting anybody in on anything, but there's a board that you will not see unless you're invited into that part of the office that has 2021, 2022. You have money numbers. You have all the things that you think you're going to need at your disposal. I don't know if Rich is going to look at Thomas's and go, okay, I'll roll with that now, or if he's going to try to bring somebody else in to evaluate those boards. And people are emotional right now talking about players. They were emotional after the game before the announcement was made. Keanu Neal on Twitter after the announcement was made put this out. Bro, I'm hurting fans, in quotation marks, think they know or really think they know to be exact. Again, you're emotional. I understand it. Todd Gurley, Alex Mack. Matt Ryan, Deion Jones, everybody after the game said, we've got the back of our coach. The bottom line is this was a change that probably should have been made last year. There's nothing you can do about it now, but understanding how this season began, not how it ended last year and two years ago, it didn't matter how it ended. It was more important how it began. Uh, They were out of gas. So can I answer to at least a couple of those guys? Sure. Read the uh, Keanu Neal one again if you can. All right, bro, I'm hurting, dot, 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 fans, in quotation marks, really think they know. Okay, I'll tell you what fans know. Fans know about wins and losses. Fans know about whether you're competing or not. Fans know whether this team is going to be good next week or good next year based upon some of the things that fans have. I'm going to say this with all due respect. You play one down in the NFL, you have a right to talk about the game in a way that I don't. But I'm going to promise you something. People who have lived here five years, ten years, fifteen years, three generations worth of Falcons fans, you can't speak for them. They don't care how the sausage is made. I talk about it all the time in baseball. You know what fans care about? The tip of the iceberg, the part that's above the water. Baseball, more than any other sport, football's kind of close. The NBA's got nothing going on below the water. That's, that's just cooking cashy. That, 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 that job is so cushy. But in, in baseball, nobody cares about your minor league teams, what their win-loss record is, what it is you've done. If a kid's going from A ball to double A, oh, my God, why is he not? Nobody does that. They care about the 25 they see and the win-loss record. Same thing in the NFL. Now, in football, what's different is we have people who think, oh, just go get me this guy in the draft and we're going to be better. If you get me these three guys, we're really going to be better. That's the part that gets a little bit goofy. But Keanu Neal is wrong about this. The fans do have an opinion about this. When you haven't won in two and a half seasons and you've lost historically, I know whose back you had. I believe it. Well, he's the guy that drafted you, and some would say he reached to draft you, Dan Quinn, at 17 overall. Hard for a player to talk about a fan. Hard, in my opinion, because quite honestly, I know you've been a fan in your life, but you haven't been a fan in a while because college is business. NFL is business. These are fans who just look at win-loss records and say, you might love them, but I promise you guys didn't win enough to keep them. So the Falcons are headed in one direction, the wrong direction. The Braves are still headed in the right direction. As we said, game one of the NLCS, 808 first pitch here on the fan and the fan app and 680thefan.com. So if you're at home, just say Alexa. Play 680 The Fan, and you can listen to our crew call the National League Championship Series. Max Fried will get the start. Walker Bueller going to go for the Dodgers here in game one. If you don't know the story, we've talked to Max Fried as he's been in studio with us a couple of times about it. Born and raised in Los Angeles, grew up a huge Dodgers fan, cultivated relationships with one-time Dodger right fielder Reggie Smith over the years and also got to meet and talk to Sandy Koufax a number of times. He said at least once a year, maybe more than that, we would go to Dodger Stadium and watch games. And so now, at least it's not the first time in the postseason he's pitching against the Dodgers, but it's an entirely different atmosphere oh. now with him being the game one starter. Yeah, it's it's nice to be a four-year-old going to get lessons from Reggie Smith. It's a different thing to try to go beat the brains in the Dodgers to get a one nothing lead. Uh, I know you might find this hard to believe, and we do have some bad news, sad news in baseball. Again, it's just the hits keep coming. Another Hall of Famer. We'll get to that in one second. But I texted with Reggie Smith last night, and I might actually be speaking to Reggie a little bit later this afternoon to just maybe get a soundbite for the pregame show or when Max Fried pitches again in this series uh, because it's funny. Max Fried was a positional player, and one of the reasons he went to see Reggie Smith is he was working as a positional player, so he wanted to know all about hitting. When he turned into a pitcher in college, and it looked like he might make a living at this part of it, he said, why am I not talking to Reggie Smith to ask him about hitters? Not about hitting, ask him about hitters. So their relationship is still in play. And Reggie last night told me, no doubt about it, he said, as good a head on a, as good a, head on a shoulder as you're going to find for a young guy who made the evolution to be where he is starting game one of a postseason series just a few years into his career. All right, here is Max Free talking about going tonight. I'd say the biggest one is experience. Uh, just being able to, you know, for – 
yourself, but you are the game one starter against the best team in baseball, some would say, in the Dodgers. Trying to create normalcy is a big part of it. Again, I'll say it again. I'll say it all week long until this series is done. They're better than Cincinnati and Miami by a lot when it comes to what they can do. Everybody's got a game plan. The Dodgers were able to enact their game plan better, and, and I'm going to go with what I've said. They'll hit your bad pitches, but they'll also hit your good pitches. They have an ability to do things offensively that these other two teams, and I'll tell you this, if you put an all-star team together of Reds and Marlins, you wouldn't beat the Dodgers in any category at all when it comes to the offensive side of things. No, you wouldn't. Let's hear more from Max Fried. Of course, uh, you know, last year, kind of the first full year starting, I felt like I was, you know, really feeling things out. You know, as of right now, I'm ready to take the ball whenever they – Whenever they tell me, and uh, it's game one, so I'm going to go out there and try to give us the best start possible. And Well, he's made three career starts against the Dodgers, one in 2018, two in 2019, 0-2 overall with a 6.55 ERA. That means nothing going into tonight. Well, if you Those like, are just numbers to mention. If you like the idea that that guy sounds like he can go take a nap right now talking about game one, that's good. He certainly seems to have that personality. Now he's just got to go out and pitch like it. And we'll see what happens tonight as you talk about the top two home run hitting teams in all of baseball playing in what is very much a pitcher's park based on what we understand. When you look at the dimensions, 329 down the left field line, 326 down the right field line, left center field 372 over 400 feet, 407 to be exact to center field, 374 to right center. And the Braves had a chance to work out over the past couple of nights there. Brian Snicker talks about the fact that this park is quite the spacious one. It's big. It's a, it's a big, it's beautiful. They did a great job here. I mean, this place is something else. Um, but, it, yeah, it's a, it's a on, like I, was, I think I said honest yesterday. It's definitely honest. And just listening to, you know, talking to, I know, and getting feedback from some of the guys that have, that have played here. I mean, it's, it's a big ballpark. It is a huge ballpark, and not only is the National League Championship Series going to be played there, but the World Series also going to be played there with fans. Around 11,000 fans or so can attend the National League Championship Series and the World Series. The American League Championship Series is being played out in San Diego. No fans are allowed there, and incidentally, it was the Rays once again winning a one-run game over the Astros last night. Yeah, I got a 200-lifetime hitter in Mike Zanino actually coming up with a big hit last night because that's what happens in October. The thing about this ballpark, somebody asked me, advantage for the Dodgers playing three games there? Yeah, to some degree, but it's not quirky. It's just big. I think the big thing is going to come if you see a defensive alignment change in the outfield for the Braves in that one-run, two-run game. Do you maybe go to it in any earlier if you think Pache is ready to cover more ground than Nick Markakis is? Those are one of the things that's going to happen. I think the other thing, and I was talking to, with Brandon and Joe about it, Dodgers shift 55% of the time, the most in baseball, 55%. The Braves are at 7.5%, the least amount in baseball. So what does it mean? It means that the Dodgers believe that they know you better than you do, and they're going to do things to try to grab the line drive over second base. Middle outfielder, softball guy over there uh, with a Freddie Freeman, try to steal it out that way. There's a whole lot of things. I asked Brian Snicker, do they try to pitch to the shift? And he said, no, that's not what they do. They pitch to strength, and they will play it more straight than it. In case you're wondering, the next fewest shift numbers, San Diego is 18.5%. So not only are the Braves the fewest in baseball, they're the fewest in baseball by a ton. And you have to have pitchers that are going to be on when it comes to location. We know what the Dodgers starters are because we saw it in that Marlins series. If you are in a shift and you're a pitcher and you don't hit your spot, guess what's going to happen? The shift can be rendered meaningless. And there might be a little bit of that card in the back pocket, card in the hat thing going on because these teams haven't faced each other, and everybody's talking about the idea of, okay, what does it mean? Well, you do know each other. They certainly know these hitters. They've tried to scout it. You know, they've scouted off uh, video and TV, but it will be interesting to see if anybody actually looks like they have a decided edge in game one or, or game two because you're pitching against what you normally want to do. You're pitching – to your strength, which might be a strength of this team because they got a lot of strengths offensively. The 11 o'clock hour brought to you as always by Reliable Heating and Air, offering deep discounts on replacing your heating and your cooling system. Check them out at ReliableAir.com. Perhaps the biggest difference in this series could be the fact that the Dodgers aren't necessarily free swingers. Everybody's a free swinger in baseball today. 
with the exception, relatively speaking, of the Dodgers. Their chase rate, something new seemingly is invented every day, but the chase rate, as far as swinging at bad pitchers, pitches, the Dodgers don't seem to do that a lot. Well, and they're still a home run team. I don't know if it's count-driven, and certainly 2-0 is an unbelievable count when you're a good player. Uh, 3-1, unbelievable count when you're a really good player. The 1-2, one, 0-2, two, oh, two, those things, I know the numbers certainly will bear out that you get an advantage as a pitcher. But if a guy's willing to work 1-2 two to 3-2 two, because he says, nope, don't want it, nope, don't want it, that's when good teams become better offensively. And I got some numbers on first pitches. I got some swing rate stuff. I got some things that we'll talk about over the course of the week. I'm just sort of ready for the whole thing to begin tonight. I mean, there are a lot of things you can talk about in trying to break down this series. I find myself having a hard time looking beyond this game. The only thing I've looked beyond is Ian Anderson. We talked about the changeup. If it hangs, they bang it. If they don't like it, they spit it. So Ian Anderson's going to be interesting, but I do want to sort of pull the reins back a little bit and see what happens tonight before we get to tomorrow night. Now we have, again, a four-pack for the viewing party tomorrow night as well as some Braves autographed merchandise. Hmm. Domino, you need to craft a question before we get out of here. Yes, sir at 1 o'clock, and you've got different options if you want to make a purchase. you got the pod, four people allowed on the field. We see the squares out there that are set up in the outfield. That's $200 total. The Infinity Club seats are 20 bucks per person. The lower-level seating bowl, $10 per person. Club suites, $2,000 for a 12-person suite, including a $750 food and beverage credit. So check out Braves.com slash watch parties if you want to make a purchase for yourself and we talk about runs it's going to be entertaining the Dodgers led the majors 5.82 runs per game the Braves right behind at 5.8 so when you look at some of these numbers and based on the numbers and looking at this matchup on paper the right two teams are matched up in the National League Championship Series I think it's going to become more interesting if the park does play bigger and the home runs are not flying out stringing together hits and how much help do you get a bobbled ball a walk you really want to keep the mistakes. You want to do it on a, on a Tuesday in May. But you will pay a price in a non-home run park. You might get away with one. Two singles, I got a man at first and third. And then the three-run home run doesn't happen. Keeping the ball in front of you is going to be a big thing. Big outfield, we'll find out how they want to play to the gaps. Uh, how much line protection you have to do late in the game, which opens up the gaps. It's just so cliche to say it's a chess match at times during a game. But it really will be. And again, if it's played square, pitcher's advantage, ball's not flying out of the park, Stringing together a few hits in an inning is going to be pretty difficult against some of these arms. All right, obviously you talk about big matchups. It's Monster Week for a reason. A monster game is going to be happening in Tuscaloosa on Saturday night, 8 o'clock kickoff. Why? We're going to see two angry coaches, I would think, all week long, including today the Kirby Smart press conference. You can hear it live at noon right here on The Fan as Georgia gets ready for Alabama. We'll talk about that. And Matt Stinchcomb, the College Football Hall of Famer, will join us at 11.30 to talk about a crazy weekend. Never mind Georgia and Alabama. A crazy weekend all around the SEC. Some college football when we come back. We're at Truist Park in the dugout. You can watch us at the Fans YouTube channel. Domino and Cellini. Like and subscribe. It's the Fan 680 and 93.7 FM.
just right. Eleven twenty-five. Domino Cellini with you on a Monday Monster Week continuing. We get you ready for the Braves and the Dodgers in the NLCS tonight in Arlington, Texas. First pitch here on the fan at eight oh eight. We'll talk some college football with the College Football Hall of Famer Matt Stinchcomb from the SEC Network in about five minutes from now. You heard the man talk about Episode Four, celebrating the nineteen eighty Georgia Bulldog National Championship team. Episode Five is going to drop on Wednesday at 9 a.m. It's UGA40, hashtag champion, sponsored by Superior Plumbing and Southern Link. In Episode 5, hosted by Buck Baloo, run, Lindsay, run. Everybody as a Georgia fan knows what that means. The annual showdown between the Dogs and the Gators in 1980, the massive comeback that helped Georgia stay undefeated and win that national championship ultimately. Academy Sports and Outdoors, UGA40, hashtag champions, presented by Superior Plumbing and Southern Link, available at the podcast podcastpark.com or wherever you get your podcast in georgia is a five point underdog as of right now in some circles four and a half point underdog as they travel to tuscaloosa on saturday night at eight o'clock well they were scrambling for the record books no doubt about it to find out when was the last time a nick saban anything gave up over 600 yards of offense needing not the whole 63 but you needed a late touchdown to just ensure that you were not going to have one more moment of what's going on here uh, you put up 63, it's supposed to be a lot easier than it was. At the end of the day, the Lane Kiffin, Nick Saban, the week leading up to it, it was all fun. Let me tell you, it wasn't fun. 
And I have no idea. I said it the other day to you yesterday on the uh, NFL pregame show. If you told me I'd have to pay five ninety nine to watch what was going on at practices this week between Nick Saban and Kirby Smart, I'm all in. If you did a hard knocks about this week, the 24-7 series that they do for boxing on HBO, I'd really be interested to see what the messaging is if you got behind a closed door. Are you surprised that the over-under is only 49 and a half based on what we saw, or are we giving credit to the reputation of Alabama and what we know Georgia has done already defensively? Uh, who? good question. So, I mean, I, I can do the math for you. If it's a five-point game, that is what the number is. 27-22 gets you to 49. I know how to do the gambling math, and you're asking, okay, can Georgia put up more than three touchdowns? Is Alabama going to give up more than three touchdowns? Look, after what just happened, I know that Georgia's offense isn't that offense. They're not going to be able to do what Ole Miss just did. That ain't happening. They don't do it. They don't think that way. They don't practice that way. There's nothing about them that says they're going to throw that out. Stetson Bennett playing it close to the best and without turnovers, that's really the game for me. I, you, I'm going to ask him to make a play. Tennessee's quarterback may be a good player, but he's not a magician. He, there was nothing magical about him. And when they started to come after him, that second half was beastly. I mean, that young man was he, – he, I guarantee he went to bed that night flinching a little bit. Good for him. He made it through the game, made a couple of great throws early in that game. Georgia's defense I don't think is going to rattle the Alabama offense, the way that Tennessee's offense got rattled. They proved they weren't really ready for their close-up. Alabama's going to be steaming, and they've always been ready for their close-up. Well, we talked about the depth on this Georgia defense. I mean, they do come at you in ways, but you also talk about coaching points. The fact that you had Josh Palmer score touchdowns against two separate corners for Georgia, and D.J. Daniel and Tyson Campbell will tell you that certainly Kirby Smart's going to lean on that. He's also going to talk to his offensive linemen saying, look, you guys got stuffed. And incidentally, he said it after the game and into yesterday, I'd do it all over again. When they needed short yardage on yeah, fourth they down, got they got it. We didn't do it twice, but it also really turned the tide the first time around because on the very next play, as they got stuffed at their own 36-yard line, Tennessee scores one of those touchdowns on the pass. And then right before halftime, I just think that Zamir White has to run to his abilities. Surprising. I don't think he's consistently doing that. I'm not blaming him. But I'm saying he's got to run harder. You would think leg drive, uh, it wasn't something whether he, whether he didn't get to where he was supposed to, whether he saw something that closed down quickly. I didn't really know tennis, Tennessee's defensive line was going to be, even in a year where Georgia's offensive line is a work in progress, and it is, Alabama will make you pay. And, and I'll give you one more they'll make you pay for. That first touchdown for Tennessee, we just look at a final score and you go, wow, it wasn't a defensive touchdown. That wasn't on anybody other than a center. Now, I did think at some point you've got to fall on that football. That's got to be a safety. Now, they'll get the kick, and, you know, maybe your defense shows up a little bit earlier to be down 7 nothing because of a mistake. You better not trot that out in the third quarter of a game against Alabama. A couple of younger players worth taking a look at now. They both had fumbles in the game. Jermaine Burton at wide receiver and Kendall Milton at running back. You look at those two five-star recruits, and based on the flashes that we saw against Tennessee, I got a feeling I don't know how much we're going to see them against Alabama, but as this season goes on, you're going to see more and more there are players that just look different. Those two players, based on what I saw against Tennessee, just look different. I just find it amazing that Nick Saban wanted this style of offense outlawed. Georgia fans want to see some of that style make its way to Athens. Because I do think, I heard Brian Finneran say something this morning, is it going to be more of the same? Now, I, I can't ask Stetson Bennett to do the things that I want a five-star quarterback to do. He's good enough to help you win games like this. Will he have a little bit of the magic I just talked about? I don't know. He's going to be pressed like he hasn't been pressed in his college career. And I put that in quotations because his college career has been all over the board. Stetson Bennett is a great story. Stetson Bennett, I think, has to play in realizing, I watched the whole game, so please don't at me, realizing what Alabama did not do defensively against Ole Miss. It's still Alabama. They're going to get screamed at all week long by Nick Saban. Stetson Bennett, the little runs that he had against Tennessee, the flip over the middle for the touchdown, the wobbler that he threw to Karis Jackson, I don't know if that stuff is going to consistently work against a team like Alabama. Tennessee just proved, I said, they're a guy. You went eight in a row, you're a guy, but you're not the guy. You weren't ready really for your close-up, and you might not have enough talent. Alabama does, and Alabama, the closing speed, if you want to throw a duck, it's going to get something's going to happen. You want to get outside, that's really good. Look, I respect the kid because I think he's willing to take a shot. He's going to, because I know the limited amount of time he's played, he's going to take a shot, multiple shots in this game, but he's going to take a shot early that he's never, never had in his college career so far. Somebody from Alabama, I'm going to tell you what they're going to say. 
look, I don't know what they're going to do with quarterback next. We're not talking about hurting a guy, but I'm going to make him know that this is not what you've been playing so far. Let's bounce around the SEC with a College Football Hall of Famer, shall we? He's a former pro, an SEC analyst, and a damn good dog. Matt Stinchcomb is only on the College Football Voice of the South. Presented by Georgia's own credit union and Wellstar Health System. Stinch, you had quite the game on Saturday yourself. We talk about a crazy weekend around the SEC as somehow, some way. Maybe it shouldn't have been that way, but Auburn does outlast Arkansas. And Bo Nix, what he did, I think you stand in agreement should have been a fumble. Well, it was definitely a backwards pass. I mean, must have snapped and turns around and throws the ball behind him. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that it was a backwards pass. And uh, to me, it looked like there was a clear recovery for the Arkansas Razorbacks. And you could even rewind earlier in uh, the fourth quarter where Tank Bigsby, uh, the ball comes out, it's ruled a fumble on the field, and that gets overturned, and the ball goes back to Auburn. Otherwise, uh, Arkansas gets the ball in a shorter field right there, and instead, um, I guess the replay official thought that there was indisputable video evidence that said that he did still possess the football. We we didn't necessarily see it that way, but uh, not the first time that uh, I've come to a different conclusion than what the replay officials did. Stinch, everybody talks about learning moments. The idea of getting on that football earlier, the idea of making a clear cut that you understood it was a loose ball, do you think that changes a referee's mind in a moment like that? Well, I mean, you know, in the video, you could see that the guy that ultimately ended up with the ball, um, Joe Fouché, number seven, their safety for Arkansas, he was the one that was diving towards it. And one of the Auburn players, too, was trying to get on that football. Um, And it just gets really gray. So, yeah, I mean, if they jumped on it initially – would they have said that it was an immediate, a clear and immediate recovery of a loose ball? I don't know. I don't know if they would say that. I think the biggest issue that came for the officials is that you've got the center judge standing right there. The ball ends up kind of bouncing off his leg, and he's waving his arms, um, you know, as if it's an incomplete pass. And, you know, the whistles, everybody's talking about the whistles. The whistles are irrelevant. Um, as far as I understand it, and speaking with the rules officials and speaking to an official that wrote the rule, um, it doesn't matter. It's a clear and immediate recovery. To me, it looked clear and immediate. Uh, there are other officials that feel that way. The conference doesn't. And somehow the replay official didn't think that the ball should have gone back to Arkansas. I, I want to ask you, we'll get to George in a second, and I'm not questioning his football IQ, but do you think Bo Nix knew the rule? Or do you think that was just a hot potato moment? Uh, Because, again, that's another teaching moment. Every quarterback in in college football is going to know about this now. Well, it's true. and It's definitely a hot potato moment, all those things. I don't think he knew. Uh, First of all, you're already almost immediately flustered because you muffed the snap. And this goes back to, you know, teams that live in the shotgun. And you're getting short yardage, you're getting goal line, and now you're outside of your comfort zone. And in a clock situation, you're not going to shotgun snap it and then clock the ball, but that's your comfort zone as the quarterback. So as soon as that ball bounced off the turf, as soon as it bounced off his hands because he's trying to get out from underneath so quickly, as soon as that happened, I think Bo Nix was like flipped into the panic mode. But there's no doubt in my mind that he turns around, he dunks that ball backwards. It's a backwards pass. That's a live football. And whistles were blown, didn't matter. There were players that were still playing through the play. I'm, I'm still very surprised that it wasn't ultimately overruled and uh, determined to be a fumble in Arkansas ball. Matt Stinchcomb with us, the College Football Hall of Famer, joining us every week on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker Line. We talked about Alabama and Ole Miss last Monday, and you said Ole Miss, they want to score points, they don't care about defense. Uh, boy, was that on full display on Saturday night. How concerned are you, though, about Alabama's defense or lack thereof at times? Uh, you know what, here's, here's the thing is that Ole Miss, and it wasn't that they had their signals and all that stuff. I, I thought that was kind of shocking that, that that came out. The pace at which they play um, doesn't really allow for, hey, let's see what the defense is doing and how they're signaling. Maybe we check, they check. Um, the biggest issues that Alabama had was with the tempo. Um, they were a little bit more deliberate at times. But otherwise, um, I, I don't know how uh, – signal awareness would have helped Ole Miss. 
there's definitely concerns. You know, we're doing these SEC Now shows on SEC Network, and Roman Harper, great safety, played at Alabama. He's been saying it for a while. He's worried about that secondary at Alabama. The communication, there's guys running open. You could see it the other night. Um, wasn't as bad as some instances in the Texas A&M game for the Alabama secondary, but regardless, clearly uh, not only tackling, but also just the communication on the back end of who's got what. I'd put it on a, a, like a four on a scale of zero to LSU secondary as far as confusion is concerned, but that's a good bit higher than what we're used to seeing out of Alabama. Stetson Bennett is going to not only see things maybe he hasn't seen before, but he's going to actually see closing speed and everything else. I, I think, and again, I look for clean, but I do know what defensive players' goals is. I, I think he might get depleted like he's never been hit early in that game. If Alabama truly has to listen to Nick Saban all week, I'd imagine they're going to look like bulls. There's going to be snot and smoke coming out of their noses. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be, although that can be distracting, you know, and, and if you wear a visor, it could probably fog them up. They might not even be able to see Stetson Bennett. Um, those guys are going to get an earful. Uh, I, I do think, though, that it's not just a function of the players. Obviously, a lot of pressure on uh, the coaching staff as well. And what they'll see out of Georgia uh, is more reminiscent of what they saw with A&M versus what they saw versus Ole Miss um, as far as offensive approach. I don't know who their great pass rusher is um, for Alabama. And so I wonder, you know, there's still a deficiency for Georgia especially at right tackle. Uh, The offensive snap issues still persist. You know, if I'm Alabama, I take uh, Christian Barmore or uh, another defensive lineman and line him head up uh, the offensive center for Georgia and just uh, get in his head as quick as I possibly could, cover him up, and uh, because that's where it seems to be issues. That's where they seem to pop up, where Trey Hill either shoots a fastball or a dribbler. Um you get three points out of that sort of thing. It might not even get to third downs or pass rush scenarios, but for sure Stetson Bennett, he'll see the best defense that he will have seen all season. Um, there's no arguing that. And regardless of their deficiencies, one of the more physical defenses. Now the question is, uh, I don't doubt that he can survive it. It's whether or not he actually gets knocked down to the ground because Alabama's arriving and they're arriving as they typically have. They're not finishing as they typically have as a defense from a tackling standpoint. Matt, it's a fascinating matchup when you look at this Alabama offense versus the Georgia defense. Already yesterday morning, I heard some of the talking heads say, okay, that's great what Alabama has done offensively, but they haven't seen a defense like Georgia's. Conversely, it's great what Georgia has done defensively, but they haven't seen an offense like Alabama's. They haven't. And, you know, the other night, so if you're Alabama, obviously you're just – Everybody's got to go score for score. The defense was very much rocked on its heels. But versus Ole Miss, it's not as if they had to go deep into the playbook. I mean, it was not as if they had to uh, diversify what they're doing offensively. There's a, a relatively vanilla approach. The concern you have, I think, for Georgia is the two shots that Tennessee was able to hit, and we talked about it last week. They're going to take shots. They did. They did it repeatedly. They were able to hit two. Well, the difference is, is that Alabama's way better and their downfield passing game. And their wide receivers are well-established. Jalen Waddle and Devontae Smith, chief among those. And so because of that, you know, if you're Georgia, you can survive versus Tennessee. You spot them a touchdown. You give them two big shots, uh, both to the Palmer kid in the end zone. But you know that eventually you're going to be able to bog that offense down. This week, I think that's the biggest concern. I think that Georgia should control the line of scrimmage. Um, And I would not have thought that coming into the season. I thought Alabama, maybe Kentucky probably had the best offensive fronts. You know, right now when you look at them, and Alex Leatherwood at left tackle for Alabama, who was just dominant the other night um, versus Ole Miss, albeit a different animal, I still think Georgia can control the line of scrimmage. They've got speed on the edge. And the size inside that they have, the way Jordan Davis is playing right now, um, you know, the way Devontae White's playing right now, these guys inside, the fact that they're able to not only move the line of scrimmage but run the way that they can, tackle to tackle, Alabama, I think, is going to have to come up with a different approach in their run game. And now, it what, might have to be perimeter-oriented. What about the idea that you didn't get a couple of short-yarded situations? I don't even know if coaches go in ones versus ones. I don't know how much banging they're going to do this week. But do you as an offensive lineman believe that they're going to need work to actually physically move people around at some point in practice this week to maybe get that more in line with what you need it to be? 
Uh, sorry, Chris. I'm, I'm trying to do this interview from – apparently I'm in Detroit all of a sudden. Uh, I was going to say, what are you, on the everywhere. lamb? What's going on? Yeah, I, I, makes you wonder. I hope somebody's okay. Yeah. The, uh, you said something about the short yardage scenarios? Yeah, do you think they'll hit this week? I don't even know if anybody goes ones versus ones anymore, but the idea that maybe you didn't pick up a couple of short yardage situations, do you think there's going to be some banging one day this week at practice? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's still early in the season, right? And, and well, I think one of the issues in the preseason this year, the um, abbreviation, we'll call it, of uh, situational football, that was one of the areas of concern coming into the year, is how well will these teams be in the coming out offense. You're backed up. You're trying to pick up yards, regain field position, because you're on your own five-yard line or your own goal line situational football what about your four minute offense we're trying to melt clock two minute offense all those things end of half sequences uh fire alarm field goals these are all like set piece plays that come up how about a clocking scenario um we saw that pop up obviously in the arkansas game that's all the situations in football that in a normal preseason and in normal preparation you've got time to devote to that um, and you wonder if short yards and goal line, as important as those snaps are, got kind of uh, glossed over because you're too busy spending time in your normal field place. Hey, Matt, real quick. As an offensive lineman, uh, have you ever walked by a quarterback and apologized? And maybe it wasn't a big apology and a long apology, but has anybody ever gotten cracked on your watch that you just said, maybe, maybe I'm just supposed to let that guy know my bad? No. Nah. I mean, it's. You know, if I wasn't given the best that I had, then I guess I would. But, no, I never felt compelled to apologize Yeah, to you've never guy. been hung over. I mean, like you've never uh, played a game hung over. You never really thought the need to apologize was in order. I'm not going to answer the first part of that question. <laughs> the, uh, the second part of that question, I, yeah, I just never felt the need to apologize. Hey, uh, Matt, before I've we let you go. I've played that way. I may have practiced that way. Listen, it happens. None of us are perfect. We're all flesh and blood human beings. Kendall Milton, uh, Jermaine Burton, I brought up a couple of the younger Georgia players. They just look different, albeit ball security is a concern. Do you think we'll see more of maybe Kendall Milton, especially in the backfield on Saturday night? I just, yeah, I love that. I love the way he runs. Um, it's just... Uh, physical finishes i can't knock him off his feet just a refusal to go down you know early on this season um between uh milton and the bigsby kid at auburn and the way he ran on saturday um you're hard pressed to find guys that are playing that intensely um all the time uh that makes it a lot of fun to watch and there's new faces throughout um the roster for georgia i think that are coming on uh, but Milton among them, chief among them. I think that running back room uh, is a good bit deeper, and everybody has known that they've re- recruited incredibly well, especially that position. But it goes well beyond, you know, Zamir White, James Cook, as has been evidenced here in the past couple of games. All right, let's finish up with this. If you were given a dollar every time you heard a coach, and I don't know what the new world order is, I don't know if we can't yell at the kids anymore, I don't really know what's going on, uh, but if you heard a coach in a – in a film session, say, and we gave you a scholarship for what reason? Questioning scholarships. How often did that actually happen if, if, if film day didn't go as well for a couple of people as it's supposed to? Yeah, how often they bring up, like, why did we give you a scholarship? Yeah. Never heard it. Really? Never heard that. Nah, never heard a, heard a coach be like, man, I can't, why did we put you on scholarship or whatever? Um, and I think that's, you know, stuff like that is, you know, unless a guy's dogging it, you know, a guy's not putting in film work, that sort of thing. And even then, you know, unless you're going to yank him, I don't know what good you get out of it. And, you know, you see this sometimes, new coaches coming in, new coaching staffs, and they're inheriting that football team. Well, he also took the job. Yeah. So, Mike, Mike Leach, you know, it, Mike Leach you know, just what do we said give you a scholarship? He, yeah, Mike Leach just said he might have to clear a guy's out. I guess that's what happens when you score two points in a game. Yeah, you know, and, and what I would say to a guy like Mike Leach is you're getting paid to win games with these guys. You know, we, we didn't bring you in here for next year. We brought you in here for this year. 
So and now you're gonna. I mean, you had a chance. Did you did you not take a look at the roster? You saw the season a year ago. It's just you know to me, uh, that's a little bit easy. And we all know that it's going to happen. It comes back to that stuff happens. Happens all the time. It happens with with staffs that haven't turned over, where they bring guys in, it just doesn't work out. Poor evaluation. Maybe they get injured. Maybe they lose interest. Maybe they just don't have it in them anymore. You know, the game does take something out of you. I get all that. But depending on them now, you know, especially after you're, you're shooting videos, if you ride on the back of a wagon or whatever, get yeah, on the bandwagon, the bandwagon and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, you're right. Yep. you got to yeah, take the good little, with the bad. late for all that. Yeah, with Mike Leach again. That's the good. exactly right. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I've not seen that. I, yeah. I don't particularly care for that very much, and <laughs> I can't imagine – the reaction that that got in the locker room. Yeah, the good by far outweighs the bad sometimes, and it's vice versa with uh, Mike Leach. You've got Vanderbilt and Missouri this week. Missouri, they're not laying down, so be careful uh, if you have them on the schedule, and that includes Georgia. No, yeah, you know, it's another one of those where you got a little bit of new energy. Um, you know, Coach Drink, I think, is what we're now going with, with Drinkwitz. Mm-hmm. Um, Coach Drink gets the quote-unquote signature win. Looks like LSU – at least for a little while, is going to be the team that provides people with their signature wins. <laughs> I don't know at what point in time do we realize maybe they're just not very good. Yeah. But regardless, um, he's kind of believing that they're better probably than they would have ended up a season ago The way from a mental and emotional standpoint. The fact they went back to Basilak at the quarterback position, that was a good idea. I mean, he played well versus Arkansas. It's a guy that's been banged up, but he's been in the program. And that was a difference maker for them. They weren't even they didn't even have some of their top receivers in this game versus LSU, and they still carved them up. Great goal line stand that, at the uh, end. Doesn't too. matter how talented you are, you got to know where you're supposed to be. Yeah. yeah, and Dan Mullen actually, I think he was complaining about the crowd at Texas A&M. Look, I'm pretty good in math, 25 percent, 40 percent. I don't think it was any of those things. But Dan Mullen, right after that game, talking about what he wants in his building, seemed a little bit silly to me too. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, and that got shut down almost immediately. I don't know how many minutes passed before I think Scott Strickland confirmed that, yeah, we're not going to do that. Um, and, and I will say that I think everybody wants full stadiums. Um, but that's just not a possibility right now and doesn't seem to be uh, the most prudent of steps. So because of that, um, you know, these these schools are going to do what they think is smart. And, and let's be real, I think in the context – Probably a little bit of frustration from Coach Mullen. I think we all know that they didn't lose that football game because right. of the crowd noise at Kyle Field. Exactly. All right, Matt, have a good call over the weekend. We'll talk to you next Monday. Listen, Appreciate I, the time. I, I hope Johnny right, Blue guys. doesn't get Thanks. you. Keep running. Run fast. Run. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him he'll never take you alive. Matt Stinchcomb, the College Football <laughs> Hall of Famer, with us every Monday here on The Fan, 680 and 93.7 FM, as he joins us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker Line. An impressive streak is on the line this weekend right here in town, how this local team can bring it to an end. We'll talk about that when we come back. Watch us on the YouTube channel. We're at the dugout in the Braves dugout, literally sitting here at Truist Park, getting you ready for first pitch tonight, 8.08 between the Dodgers and the Braves. Kirby Smart coming up live at noon on the Fan 680 and 93.7 FM.
Park in the Braves dugout. Get you ready for tonight's 808 first pitch game, one of the NLCS Dodgers and Braves fourth leadoff show coming your way at 650. You can watch us all day long on the fans' YouTube channel as well. Like and subscribe. This Saturday, noon kickoff, you can watch the game on ABC. Hear it right here on the fan. Number one, Clemson coming to town, and the Tigers have won 25 ACC games in a row, including postseason games. Also, 33 consecutive regular season games, the latter standing as the longest such streak in the history of that conference. So that's on the line. Can Georgia Tech shock the world after a nice victory on Friday in the rain over Louisville? Yeah, uh, our ranking's also on the line. Clemson is looking to hold on to whatever it is uh, you know they have before the Big Ten starts, I guess before the Pac-12 starts. So you don't want to give one away. You don't want to give one away to a conference opponent anyway. Uh, we'll find out. Look, it's a good test. Friday night you didn't turn the football over. What did you do? You had a better chance to win the game, and then you did it. And i got to tell you something. you got a freshman running back. We talked about this yesterday. Uh, the Clemson defensive staff, when they pop the film, and they're going to go, you see that kid? That kid could play any place in America. Treat him with that kind of respect. Jameer Gibbs is the guy Domino was talking about. We'll talk more about that game as Monster Week rolls on. When we come back, plenty of things for Georgia to work on. Alabama, too, as they get ready to meet this weekend. The Kirby Smart Press Conference next live here on the Fan 680 and 93.7 FM. Community, the word that best describes Georgia Primary Bank. Hi. Rocco's after this. Rocco.
where we are sitting in the Braves dugout. You can watch us in the fans YouTube channel. Like and subscribe. Coming up later on, we're going to give away one of those four packs for a viewing party tomorrow night for game two of the NLCS as Nino drives you around the majors. You're going to hear from Kirby Smart. His press conference live each and every Monday here on the fan. In just a couple of seconds. It is Monster Week. And of course, we know what is going on. Saturday night, 8 o'clock kickoff in Tuscaloosa. Monster matchup between Georgia and Alabama as of right now. Depends where you look at You know, Georgia is anywhere from a five to a four and a half point underdog. The over under in this game, 49 and a half. So I guess a lot of people are banking on the fact that Alabama won't be quite as explosive against this Georgia defense. Yeah, uh, we saw what happened to Florida, and we know now what that means in the East. I'm kind of disappointed. I wanted Florida to actually be undefeated. I say it all the time. Give me as high a ranking opponent as you can find. Well, Alabama's that. You got no problem in terms of playing the ranking this week. So whether it's bragging rights and a lot more, uh, this game's going to offer that with two teams coming off moments, and Alabama more than Georgia because theirs was an extended thing. Probably Coach is not very happy about what it is they saw. Alabama has had their challenges defensively. They beat Missouri but allowed 19, 24 against Texas A&M, and 48 in that game against Ole Miss. The College Football Hall of Famer Matt Stinchcomb was on with us earlier. He's not necessarily buying the excuse, not that Alabama called it that, but the excuse some are calling it of Ole Miss perhaps knowing Alabama's defensive signals. Well, if I know Lane Kiffin, I'm calling him and asking if he did know anything because I'd like to know that and have that in my back pocket as well. It is amazing that Clemson and Alabama in the same weekend playing against the locals. Then you throw in the Braves, and then you talk about all the news that's going to come in and around the Falcons. Rich McKay and Arthur Blank are going to be speaking talk later to today. We'll find out how it happens. All right, to Athens we go. Kirby Smart addressing the media. Now we go live to Athens for a press conference with Dogs head coach Kirby Smart. Presented by Georgia's own credit union and Wellstar Health System. Hello, everybody. We'll uh, begin with uh, a few opening comments from Coach Smart, and then we'll take your questions. Coach Smart. All right, well, we're moving forward. Uh, <coughs> oh, gee, it's the COVID. Oh, for the oh. He's got COVID. Hey, Nikki, talk to me. Uh, um, yes, sir. Remember, when it's down to the last question, you'll just take it up. Are they things on the sound sheet, or are you talking about off the sound sheet, Domino? All right, let's uh, go to questions. Uh, we'll okay. take the first two. Uh, Chip Thomas you want it? And then, uh, Dean Lake. Go ahead. I'm with you, Nick. Coach, uh, uh, obviously this Alabama All right. is some, I mean, uh, excuse me, their offense is something else. Uh, it, it, I'm just. All right, then, Domino, do me a favor. If you want any audio, shoot it to Keith. He is still here. I'll make his ass work for a couple minutes. It, it just seems just more prolific. Oh, okay. Never mind, Keith, you're off. You useless you know, piece of shit. All right, thanks, boys. That's owed to is 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 it a change in in uh, strategy and philosophy and all that?
here on the Fan 680 and 93.7 FM. The 12 o'clock hour brought to you by Auto Gallery Chevrolet and Commerce, home of the lifetime warranty. Check them out at autogallerychevrolet.com. When we come back, Arthur Blank finally pulls the trigger. Could the plan to replace Dan Quinn be a simple one? And we give you a chance to watch the on the field at Truist Park. We're in the Braves dugout right now, Domino and Cellini. Watch us on the 680 The Fan YouTube channel. Like and subscribe as we get you ready for pitch one of the NLCS tonight in Arlington. Dodgers and Braves, 808 first pitch right here on The Fan, 680 and 937.
690, it's the fans, 680 and 93.7 FM. Here at Truist Park in the Braves dugout. Watch us, why don't you, on the 680 The Fan YouTube channel. Like and subscribe as well. The 12 o'clock hour brought to you by Auto Gallery Chevrolet. Hey, don't forget something we do each and every Thursday. It's called the Small Business Spotlight here on The Fan. Try to talk to each and every show, that is, a small business owner. Email us your contact info at smallbusiness680thefan.com. The uh, Small Business Spotlight, as always, brought to you by Georgia Primary Bank, your community, your bank. Check them out at georgiaprimarybank.com. 808 first pitch tonight, game one of the NLCS here on The Fan, the Ford leadoff show, as we said during the update, coming your way at 650. Domino, you're going to take us around the majors, plus give somebody a chance to win a four-pack for a viewing party tomorrow night here at Truist Park. Now, don't forget, every night you can watch the NLCS right here at Truist Park. Do we have Braves anything got, to give away? Um, I think we do. I think I just told you what mm-hmm. we have yeah, I'm not to give away. Uh, Braves.com slash viewing party. A little drunk, too. Um, well, it is a Monday yeah. afternoon, so you'll do that in just uh-huh. about five minutes. Sure. Last night around 10 o'clock, we find out through a statement issued by Arthur Blank and the Falcons that things were official. Quinn and Dimitrov shown the door. Rich McKay, again, as we said during the update, the interim GM, Raheem Morris, the interim head coach, I think you have to break the mold here, and I think I know Bobby Petrino was an offensive guy, and it didn't work out. But yeah, but I, he was a scoundrel. He was. I think you need to reach out to a young offensive mind. Douche. You need to, well, not in this instance, Bobby Petrino. Yes, you yeah. need to reach out to a young offensive mind, pair him up with a veteran defensive coordinator, kind of like the Rams did years ago mm-hmm. with Sean McVay, Wade Phillips, veteran. Young guy as the head coach, also calling the plays. To me, that's what Arthur Blank needs to do. Some of the names floating around already, Joe Brady, Lincoln Riley, obviously Eric Bieniemy, Josh McDaniels, ties to the Falcons, not through Thomas Dimitrov, but they've had conversations before when there's been a head coaching opening here in town. Lewis Riddick is one of those names being talked about, of course, doing work for ESPN and Monday Night Football right now. He says he wants to get back into the game. Perhaps he could be your GM. So all possibilities we're thinking about right now. I, I Listen, Urban Meyer's name came up. I mentioned Bob Stoops if you wanted a CEO-type guy and then go make sure you get the coordinators right. I don't know if either one of those guys wants to do anything other than sit in their piles of cash. One name that was interesting, and I'm going to use the word interesting, was I think Peyton Manning wants to be in football. Now, I don't know if Peyton Manning wants to be a part owner. He's got enough money to say, hey, Arthur, you know, I know you sold a kind of small percentages. Do you think Peyton Manning, and again, I'm just saying it's interesting, running football the way that John Elway did, and you can say what you want because John Elway can't pick a quarterback, which is incredible, but they did win a Super Bowl, and he actually picked Peyton Manning to come help them win a Super Bowl. Peyton didn't help much that year, but he certainly put them on the map, and he certainly had a good year before that. So I don't know. Is Peyton Manning a guy that you look around if you're Arthur Blank and you go the respect factor, let's build a little bit of credibility? I don't know. I, a couple of people have sort of brought that name up, and, and I'm not adverse to at least having a conversation. I don't want a gimmick. I don't want to win a press conference. I don't want any of that stuff. I, if Peyton Manning tells me he's all in and wants to actually find out what he might have, what kind of role could he have here, I don't know. Make him part owner and see if he actually wants to help pick the groceries. I mean, I don't think it hurts to make the phone call. He's never been a guy in the front office before, so you got to be careful in that regard. I'm not giving him the keys to everything. Yeah, I'm not giving him the keys to anything. I'm just trying to find out if there might be some reason, if you believe that he's really the football mind that everybody says he is, maybe being in your organization somehow, some way, isn't a bad thing. See, I think it's now time to completely clean house. The entire staff has to go. Dimitrov is gone. Quinn is gone. Rich McKay has to go as well. Well, I appreciate everything you've done. You helped build a new stadium. You came in and helped restore this franchise to a certain extent. But now you got to go. Well, don't tell him that. He's got a 3.30 press conference today. I mean, I'm serious. I don't know if you're just saying he shouldn't show up at that. or No, he should show up at oh, that. Okay. But I'm saying once your time is done, as in once you're no longer the interim GM, I thank you for your services. Well, I'll, I, I can tell you one of two ways. You get your GM first who then picks a head coach. And then the guy who comes in, people who come in to be the head coach, have to absolutely tell you what their staff is going to look like because that's a real thing. Who can you get? Does it fit what we want to do? What about our cap situation? Who's going to handle that for you? There's a whole lot of things. Unless Arthur or Rich and or both of them have that list of three that I always talk about, if time, I want one of these three guys and we're going to go to those three first no matter who the GM is, maybe their list is of a GM. Maybe they've got a list of three to hire the GM and then find out, let them be in charge of who. That's the way that I would do it. I get the GM first unless you're steadfast set on having a guy that you think fits what it is you have, and then we're going to look to have the general manager and the coach 
work together in one of those, hey, we're an extension of each other, and add it up. We're 100% of the mind around here. Now, prior to Dan Quinn being fired yesterday, you had a bunch of players, including Todd Gurley and Deion Jones and Matt Ryan, say we have his back, Alex Mack as well. After the move was made last night, Keanu Neal on Twitter says, bro, I'm hurting fans. He puts fans in quotation marks. Really think they know. It's a bad tweet. I know what they know. 7-9, and 7-9, and nine, and 0-5. And That's what they know. 43-42, and 42, not enough. If you don't like the general manager, here's what he didn't do, here's what he didn't do, why are we in cap hell? All those things are real. I get really sort of – I get pulled back a little bit when I hear players talking about what fans should be thinking. I understand that there's times that you can have a discussion. Hey, I believe this is the fan mindset. Maybe they're not really seeing it our way. Fans care about the tip of the iceberg, the part you see above the water. Everything else, it's like how the sausage is made. I just got to find out, do we have enough wins in 16 games to go to the postseason? An emotional tweet certainly ties to Dan Quinn. Keanu Neal has. A lot of people said they reached to take him at 17 overall because Quinn wanted him to fit into this defense. They thought he fit perfectly. When he's healthy, he played okay. I got to tell you, he didn't play okay yesterday. No, and I'll, I'll say this about Dan Quinn because, again. One of I, many that didn't play okay yesterday. Right. I deal from the top of the deck, and I really tried to avoid dealing from the middle or certainly the bottom. I like Dan Quinn. I like Thomas Dimitrov. I actually can call them football friends, no doubt about it. If I had a kid who I wanted to pick what it is I'd like for them to go play for, Dan Quinn would be it. Whether it was college, whether it was high school, whether it was in the NFL, and I had a 21-year-old showing up you know, to begin his professional career, I'd want Dan Quinn as much as anybody I've ever been around. But this is a results-oriented business. I don't know what Dan Quinn's next stop is. I wish him nothing but the best. As a matter of fact, I wish him more than that. But I it wish was him time, better than that. as Arthur said, to make the move because of what you just mentioned. It's a results-based business. And the idea of irrelevancy is really, I don't care how old or how young Arthur is, the idea that your relevance is based upon the fact that it's a coach watch, it's a GM watch. At a certain point, Arthur, who was, you know, his suit game is still strong. You know, his suit game is very strong. I saw it yesterday. Looked like he was at a funeral yesterday with well, that black suit. B- b- black tie yeah, would have actually yeah. let you know, but he did have a red tie. I mean, he kind of sort of was at a funeral. Yeah. T-Mobile stands ready to serve those who serve us. That's why all of us at 680 The Fan are joining forces with T-Mobile to celebrate our local first responders and frontline workers. If you know someone, every Friday we'll select one of those nominees and give them a $250 gift card to show our appreciation. It's 680 The Fan Frontline Fridays presented by T-Mobile, who's proud to honor our local heroes. It's time for the Marietta Toyota. You got the giveaway I got, Freddie. At Marietta Toyota, every new Toyota includes our nationwide lifetime powertrain warranty. Family owned and operated since 1975. Stop in for a test drive or visit MarietaToyota.com. It's better in Marietta. Yeah, 2020 continues to kick us in the nuts when it comes to MLB players and their passing. Joe Morgan passes away today. We find out the 77-year-old Hall of Famer. Uh, I believe it was early this morning. Um, So I'm going to ask a question based upon Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan did something in the 70s that only a couple of handfuls of people have. The last one to do it, by the way, was Miguel Cabrera. What distinction does Joe Morgan have in Major League Baseball history? I'll give you the last three guys to do it, as a matter of fact. I believe it's Miguel Cabrera, Albert Pujols, and Barry Bonds. Joe Morgan is one of a couple of handfuls of guys who hold this distinction in Major League Baseball. We've got those Braves tickets to come see the viewing party tomorrow to watch Braves baseball here at Truist Park. If you can call up 404-231-1680 and tell Matt Edgar what it is we're looking for. And if you want to make a purchase yourself for a viewing party, braves.com slash watch parties. That's the place to go. Uh, Let me give you a quote from the late Jim Bout. Statistics are about as interesting as first base coaches. Let me give you something to great Toby Harrod. You know something about Toby Harrod, don't you? Toby Harrod played for the Indians. He's also a palindrome. They. You know what that means? His name is spelled the same frontwards and backwards. Well, Toby's not. T-O-B-Y-Y-B-O-T. Oh, oh. All right. I thought, he, are they the casino people, by the way? Are they uh, Harrahs? <laughs> yeah, I think so. All right. I don't know if he's related to them, but yes, it's, it's the same. Here's what Toby Harrah said about statistics. They, both, bikinis and statistics, show a lot, but not everything. The reason I bring it up, oh, I got a million of them. I can tell you about first pitches. Who swings at them? I can tell you who does and does it well, both the Dodgers and the Braves. As a matter of fact, the Braves hit better than anybody on first pitches this year. Keep an eye on this because the Dodgers throw more first pitch strikes than anybody in baseball, and that's not a new thing. For the last five years, they've been in the top two of first pitch strikes. Something that might not play that could have been a strength had the game not be played uh, in Arlington right now. Game one starter, Walker Bueller, his home run numbers were up. 
His curveball's gotten slapped around hard. Ball's hit hard this year. He's usually a better, more complete all-the-pitch pitcher. This year, uh, 1.72 home runs per nine innings. You might be playing in the wrong park to take advantage, but I am gonna, I'm curious to see. I know you want to think fastball, but there are numbers that would tell you that if he gets in a position where he thinks he's going to hang one, it's been hit harder this year than in years past, and he doesn't go six innings. I don't know what he's going to do tonight, but the opportunity to get to that bullpen does exist because in our shortened season, unless he flips the playoff switch, Walker Buehler has not been more than a six-inning pitcher. And who's going to close? Is it going to be Kenley Jansen, who has struggled, or is it going to be the man with the pouty face, Joe Kelly, who closed out the final game because Kenley Jansen just couldn't get the job done? At some point with seven games in seven days, four games, five games, I'd imagine you might see both guys getting an opportunity. Let's hope you take advantage of whoever it is. Runners left in scoring position per game. Do you know who was dead last this year? It's the Atlanta Braves. Can't afford that one either. Runners with scoring position, third base especially, less than two outs. They were not good at that I, number either. I need Freddie to hit a little bit more. What's Buck that? 67 isn't going to cut it. What's that? Buck 67 is what Freddie's hitting right now in the postseason. I need a little bit more. A couple of guys who you don't know. There's a guy by the name of uh, Will Smith. He's a catcher for the Dodgers. He had the five-hit game. Youngest guy to have a five-hit game in the postseason. He's been pretty good as of late. You don't know that name because the Dodgers have bigger stars. The other guy's second baseman, Chris Taylor. You don't know his name, and you would think you knew everybody's name on the Dodgers because they've been in the postseason a whole bunch, but that's another guy who can do a little bit of damage. The DH position is really interesting. I'll let you hear Freddie in a second. Jock Peterson's going to get a couple of cracks at it. I'd imagine Will Smith on a day that he doesn't catch will get a crack at it. But the Braves have been more settled at DH than anybody in baseball this year with Marcelo Zuna. How did it affect this Braves team? Here's Freddie Freeman talking about it. I'm a National League guy, so it's kind of weird. You know, I like the double switches, the bonds the, for the pitchers. There's more into it, but when you have Marcel in the lineup, it kind of changed my thinking a little bit and all the runs we were scoring and all the opportunities to score more runs. Five. But we'll see. I don't I don't know which way we're going to go next year, but obviously the DH worked out well for us. Yeah, loaded question when you asked Freddie Freeman if he liked the DH this year. He was honest. He didn't like it. He's a National League guy. He liked it this year, and it is the reason he's hitting second in the lineup. We know September 9th, it's Travis Darno going to the four hole, which is not talked about. It's really the first three, but Darno going to the four hole happened on that same night, the night they scored 29 runs. Can you do me a favor, text yeah, sure. him and tell him I need him to hit a little yep. bit more? Yep. Hold tell on. him that. I'm a little busy right now. Can it hold off for yeah, a second? Yeah, just five minutes or so. All right, what time is it now? Uh, 1243. During the break. 1143 their time. Yeah, I think he's probably up yeah. moving around, getting a little bit of breakfast with the wife and the kid. I can do that. All right, I do want to mention something quick. It's not the highest batting average on first pitch pitches, but it is the highest slugging percentage. It's 788. 26 first pitch home runs led all of baseball. Acuna, five. Darno, six. Duval, four. Dansby, three. That's the number that you want to have an eye on tonight when it comes to, I hate to do it, your whole idea of something's got to give. There is really some truth in that. I'm kind of curious. I don't to see say it that way. I say it's the irresistible force. Right versus the immovable object. And I, I think John Michaels actually said that this morning during the front row. That's gimmick infringement. Yeah. So will the Dodgers not, will they get away from first pitch strikes or not? I do know this. That 0-1 versus 1-0, I don't care who you are in baseball. Life becomes a little bit more of a party if you're in a hitter's count. And extending it to 2-0, batting averages go up 70, 75 points. Keep an eye on that tonight, and it does start tonight. I realize baseball's not like football. You can't go out there, we're going right. to get them this time. But the Braves have come up short twice now against the Dodgers more recently, mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. Is that in their mind I don't anywhere think so. that they want to prove people wrong? No. I think this goes back to what they I talked about being a different team now, but yeah. that's not something that's going to motivate them. Yeah, no, look, you have scouting reports. You try to find out how consistent the report from a couple of years ago might be playing out now. I get all that stuff. But, but that goes back to the narrative. This team has an opportunity to create their own. I am not holding them responsible for anything that's happened in the past. They're certainly a better team now. They can beat the Dodgers. A couple of years ago, I didn't think they could beat the Dodgers. I think the idea of the thing they have to get over now that they've won two mini-series is, can you play it in an extended period of time? Because I don't care what happens. You win four of seven, you were the better team. You might have won more moments. The other guy might have given some stuff to you. But nobody gets to cry at the end of seven games. If you win four, you're the better team. If you lose four, not only do you go home, but it, but it happened for a reason over the course of a seven-game series. What was the answer to your trivia question for the watch party tickets? Do we have an answer? Did somebody I, already I, win? I believe we do. All yes. right. Joe Morgan won back-to-back MVPs. Do you know you can make an entire lineup out of guys by position that have won back-to-back MVPs? And it is Cabrera, Pujols, and Barry Bonds were the last three to do it, dating back to about 2001. Of course, Joe wow. Morgan passing away today at the age of 77. We have viewing party tickets to give away all week long in similar fashion. So if you didn't win today, it's okay. You'll get more chances as the week and goes on. And we do on. know they're going to play on Wednesday. 
And we do know they're going to play on Thursday at a minimum. And so on and so yes, forth, sir. perhaps. You can stay connected to all your favorite fan shows through your favorite smart speaker. It's all brought to you by South Point Financial Services. Listen to the fan and the Braves on Amazon Echo, Google Nest, Apple HomePod, and more. Just say, hey, Alexa, play 680 we, The Fan. Are we on any place right now? Um, I believe we're, we're on, on the YouTube the World Wide channel. Web? Yes, anybody that has YouTube can watch us right now. This was going to be the almost question. What is this? These so, are like dodo birds. It is a left-handed catcher. These are really if you're rare. watching on YouTube, if you're not, that's why I describe what Domino is holding right now in his right hand. Yeah, and that, that's exactly what that is. All right, when we come back from the big game in Tuscaloosa to the Falcons firing everybody, we check in with Buck and Hutt. They are going to broadcast as well here from the dugout, the Braves dugout at Truist Park. They'll join us after Domino brings us one, one more thing. thing. You want a hint? Sure. Someone's going to catch it in the shorts because they're supposed to. I uh, and he's like a it. Champion on top of that. I love it. Domino and Cellini. It's the Fan 680 and 937 FM. One more thing.
Blaney will check in with Buck Blue, who joins us, and you can see him right now on the Fans YouTube channel. We're going to be broadcasting there all day long. Like and subscribe. One more thing. Sponsored by Rocco's European Garage. Are you overpaying for car maintenance? Save money and receive better value at Rocco's European Garage. Yeah, all you need to do is hear this. We just want our respect. Rob wants his respect. <laughs> Coach Vogel wants his respect. Our organization, Five. they respect. And I want my damn respect, too. Woo! Yeah, and then I'll finish up with this. Oh, God. Oh, God, really? On a night you win a title. Oh, God, really? Who's not respecting you? I know it's not 100% world. It's not. I said Mother Teresa might be the only one, and I'm sure she's got a few detractors as well. What makes you better than that? This is now the world we live in. Nobody, what you're right, is supported 100%. LeBron James and the Lakers do win on a night of the greatness, title by last the way. night. On yeah. a night of true, unadulterated greatness, Buck. This guy couldn't help himself at the end of the game. Well, now remember, uh, the respect's been hard to come by because King James, I believe, has lost more finals than he's won. So there's a little bit of a rub going on. Well, he's never going to be Michael. I'm sorry. Michael was 6-0, and and that's just the way it is. No one's Michael Jordan. King James was awesome though yeah now he was it's not it's a slight incredible. to lebron it's just credit to how great michael was so big game saturday night what's going to happen here georgia's defense can they slow down alabama's offense conversely can alabama do anything against this georgia defense well this is the best matchup offense and defense we'll see all year long in college football is this georgia d and this alabama offense you got strength versus strength here this is going to be good guys all right and there's a chance you're going to lose hudson mason in the middle of the show he just picked up a piece of bubble gum that was here from last year don't tell me it was last series and he just chewed it you know what that means worms well it was worms could the be rap. the rona <laughs> worms it's not going to be good. It was in the wrap. My guess is, really? My guess 20. is about 210 today. You might be seeing goodbye to Hudson. Well, we'll find out. I very much look forward to seeing you. <laughs> good Hudson spot survives. to do a show, don't you think? Yeah, here at the uh, dugout. Buck and Hutt are next. We want to thank Matt Stinchcomb, the Brandons here, for keeping us on the air. Hoyt and Keith Ippolito and Sean Nerney and Matt Edgar. It takes a group to form this radio show. Domino and Cellini will talk to you tomorrow at 11 o'clock. It's the Fan 680 and 93.7 FM.
cut, punch the clock here on the fan. One to three, new slot, new show, new focus. Going big time today, live from Truist Park. We're in the Braves' first base dugout for the show today on 680, 93.7. Streaming on 680thefan.com. We've got our fan mobile app brought to you by T-Mobile. And also today, we're... We're live on our YouTube channel today, Hut. You YouTube. ready for the TV thing today? Yes, sir, I am. I got a face for it. Face for radio, face for TV. Let's do it. Well, I tell you, we got a lot going on. In fact, it's a monster week, and we'll tell you about <gasps> why it's fueled by monster energy coming up. But we've got the Braves NLCS getting underway tonight, game one with the Dodgers. We've got Q and T getting fired. Overnight, we've got George, Alabama, number one Clemson rolling in the town, uh, taking on Tech down in the 404. And we got that episode five of the uh, UGA 40 podcast <laughs> detailing the Georgia Florida game this week. So, yeah, monster week here on the fan. It sure is. It's uh, one of the more exciting weeks that I can uh, remember uh, and for Atlanta sports in general. And uh, we're going to have the best content right here. Make sure you download that app. Uh, listen to the Braves tonight on the 6A of the Fan app. And uh, got a lot of great guests today. Mort coming up at 2 o'clock, who'll uh, talk to us a special Mort report on a Monday talking about Dan Quinn and Thomas Dementroff getting fired. Absolutely, and the Matt Schaub Show at 1.30. So two appointments today on the show, Mort at 2, Matt Schaub Show at 1.30. Let's don't bury the lead. Let's get, Let's right get to started it. with the biggest story of the day. It's time for the lead, driven by Maxi Price Chevrolet. Find new roads to Loganville at MaxiPrice.com. Where's Loganville? You know where Loganville's at. It's right over there in Loganville. Yes, sir. Maxi Price. So Braves and Dodgers game one tonight in Arlington, Texas. 8.08 start time. First pitch on Fox. You can hear it right here on the fan. Get that mobile app. Listen to the game. Uh, listen to the series as you go out and about around town. Uh, listen anywhere, anytime on that. We'll be streaming the game, 680thefan.com. So great ways to listen. So get ready for Freed and Walker Bueller tonight in game one. We're going to be breaking this down all day long on the show. I'm really excited. I think the Braves, to me, I believe the Braves and the Dodgers are pretty close. I'm expecting a rock'em rock sock'em series here, Hutt. I am. And you, if you're Max Freed, kid who grew up in Southern California, L.A. area, probably grew up wanting to play for the Dodgers and dreaming of playing for the Dodgers, an opportunity for him uh, in game one tonight to uh, not only make his stamp in the postseason against a premier team, but you've got the Dodgers who are kind of World Series or bust and the Braves who are trying to establish themselves as the top three team in Major League Baseball. We are, uh, we are, we're in for a treat with these two teams for the next uh, four games at least. Dodgers' last World Series victory, 1988. It's been a while for them. 808 start. You can count on 680 the fan, the home of the Braves. Give you some great coverage. Big game week in college football. Here we go. Looking forward to this one. Georgia and Alabama, 8 o'clock kickoff in Tuscaloosa on Saturday night. Bama, a five-point favorite. I think it opened at four, moved to five. If you're a gambling man, something to keep an eye on. Saban, 21-0 against his former assistant coaches. Undefeated. Georgia and Kirby Smart trying to get over that Alabama hump. They've lost five in a row. Not Kirby, but Georgia's lost five in a row to Alabama. And under Kirby... Two losses that just ripped the Georgia fans' heart out. Yeah, uh, that's test week for the dogs. It's uh, it's like uh, you know midseason exam, and this is going to be their toughest test, obviously so far. Alabama is the most complete team, although they showed some holes maybe uh, defensively after giving up 700 yards of total offense against the Lane Train and Ole Miss. Uh, we'll be talking about previewing this throughout the show and all week. Uh, super excited, best matchup so far, and by far the best matchup of the college football season this weekend. Uh, we've got three lead stories today. We've knocked two out already. Here's the third. Learned it overnight. Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov fired by Arthur Blank and the Atlanta Falcons. Raheem Morris will take over on an interim basis through the end of the season. I would imagine he handles the defense. You see Cutter will handle the offense. And uh, Mr. Blank and Rich McKay, who will monitor things now with Q&T out, will uh, – Start looking at that list of general managers and head coaches. In fact, I think they, the short list has been prepared months ago. Yeah, no surprise that Dan Quinn was let go anytime you start off 0-5 after uh, what happened last year with the slow start and really since the Super Bowl. That's what you can point back, point back to uh, and, and say that was the beginning of the downfall for the Dan Quinn era. 28-3 will always haunt him. 
a little surprised uh, that Thomas Dimitrov was let go at this point in the season. I thought they may have uh, held on to him and maybe fired him later in the season, but uh, this is clearly looking like a, a, a retool, a rebuild. We'll get into that uh, as we go throughout the show. But, uh, and we'll have Matt Shalman at 1.30 to talk about it as well. So three lead stories today. Makes for a good show? I think it makes for a great show, man. Yeah. If we can't make this a great show, they might need to find two other guys. Ha. Well, let's not go there. We're just getting started <laughs> here. I was repping the A earlier today. I had my youngest son, Rhett, and I out the backyard early this morning with the Braves gear on, repping the A. You got a lot of it. You were taking some photos here. You're a big social media guy. You get here over here early and – you want to do it for the gram and get those filters working? I, I applaud you for it. <laughs> you, you, you're not just a guy who punches the clock and when the show's over, you're, you're not like the guys that work at the bank. As soon as 3 o'clock hits, you go home. You're here before and after. I appreciate the hustle, Blue. And I need to mention Georgia Tech with a big win on Friday night, HUD, as they take care of Louisville. And what about Jeff Sims? Did a great job. He took a big step forward this past Friday night. He didn't turn the ball over one time. Huge step. And if you remember on Friday, I said if Georgia Tech turns the ball over one time or less, I think they win. Uh, and they did, and obviously on that bye week, they preached and they pounded into Jeff Sims' head, take care of the football, he's electric, you can see the things with his arms and his legs he can do. The only thing uh, is the asterisk next to him is is does he turn the ball over, and um, he didn't, and he gave his team a chance to win, and, and pretty you know unideal, non-ideal weather situations too, the Friday yeah. night. So big week in college football, number one Clemson rolling into town. We got Georgia going to Tuscaloosa, big showdown there. We're going to be breaking it down during the show today. Let me get a, go ahead and just download or vent or rant on this Dan Quinn firing overnight. Uh, let, let it be known that Dan Quinn did not nail it here in Atlanta with the Falcons. And, look, I've been on this from day one. The moment they hired Dan Quinn, I thought it was a bad move. And I thought he should have been fired. Uh, he should have been fired uh, a day after that Super Bowl loss. Huh, they've been playing the Super Bowl uh, over five decades, and that was the worst, most epic loss in the history of professional football. <laughs> and they should have fired him the next day for allowing that to happen. Should have been fired after the playoff loss to the Eagles the next year in 2017 where we had four shots inside the 10-yard line, and we watched the Eagles hold us and win that game and move on in the playoffs. Dan Quinn should have been fired the next season in 2018 after that 1-4 and four start. And if he didn't get the pink slip then, surely it should have come later in the season where uh, they had a five-game losing streak, for crying out loud. Uh, should have been fired last season after a 1-7 and seven start to the season. Uh, Coach Bro should have been let go th then. Mr. B wasted he's wasted so much time for this Falcons organization and I'm a little upset about that part of the deal they should have cut the cord on Quinn years ago or maybe not even hired that I'm not sure what lured him in on on this particular hire but uh, they gave Quinn too much power he had too much say in the personnel moves I'm talking about the draft I'm talking about what free agents they're bringing in and so many questionable uh, decisions as far as the coaching staff goes. He fired three dif defensive coordinators during his tenure, and one of them was him. And I think that's going to be one of them was him. Yeah, that's going to be the legacy of Dan Quinn. Is is you look at guys across football, and it's not a knock, but like look at Ed Ogeron as an example. To be a head coach, you don't have to be a great X's and O's guy. You have to be a, a great delegate. I prefer one. Right. Learn. Yes, it, it is a preference, but you don't necessarily have to be one to be a great coach. Uh, Dan Quinn could never and never did nail the hires, whether it was on the offense or defensive side of the ball. Uh, and then his defense was historically every year here, even in the Super Bowl run with Shanny, it was atrocious. Second worst, maybe dead last defense this year. I mean, look at the game yesterday in Carolina. The best defensive performance of the game of the season, you score, you give up about 20-something points and you still can't find a way to win. Uh, you know, that, that's going to be, that was uh, really the narrative on Dan Quinn while he was here. Poor, yeah. poor defense and never could get any of the offense or defensive hires right. Yeah, he didn't nail it. Too many space tacklers invested in. Too much of this bold and aggressive talk where we knew watching the team play, there was no bold and aggressive, at least on defense. We're in a soft cover three most of the time. That's the anti-aggressive. So I, I had a bad vibe on this the day he was hired. He established this weird culture, as I see it, too, this brotherhood thing. Like, uh, and I didn't realize it really until last week how 
Uh, outside the box it was when, you know, LaFleur from Green Bay was able to talk about it, that Quinn was the only head coach that he's ever been around that was totally obsessed with the players having fun. Yeah. I mean, there's something to blame right now. Uh, looking back at the players having fun, what's that got to do with winning right. football games? Yeah, Matt LaFleur said that uh, last week. I remember on Monday Night Football they referenced it, saying the number one thing that he learned from Dan Quinn was how to have a, a fun environment. It, it, we're, we're talking about the NFL, right? It's not about having fun. It's about a bottom-line production-based business. If that's the number one thing an assistant can say that he took away from coaching under you, that's – that's not a, uh, a very positive, overarching compliment by any means. Well, he was full of catchphrases uh, that were, you know, made me roll my eyes most of the time. And then, you know, after Shanahan left, we got outcoached on game day every single game. Every single game since Shanahan's left, we've been outcoached. It drives me crazy, this idea that we're going to play fast and furious, and that's going to lead us to victory. How about outsmarting the opponent yeah. occasionally? It's just I'm, I'm glad it's over. I'm glad I was able to get that out, and uh, so we can move on. We'll talk a little later in the show about what's next with both T and Q out. Yeah, so there you go. There's my rant. It's about time for crying out loud. We've wasted too much time. Well, and you look at the Seahawks last night, right? 5-0, and oh, they're the only team statistically, defensively, that's worse than the Falcons, yet the Seahawks are 5-0, and oh, and that's the thing you can point back to the Falcons is, yes, they had really bad defenses, but going into every game, Buck, they never – had the advantage when it came to coaching. You could say they had the advantage on the quarterback. They had the advantage sometimes, you know, with the running back or the skill position players. But what cost the Falcons so many games, and we've seen it this year, is you never could look over the sideline and just know emphatically you would have the coaching advantage. And I don't want to kick a man wise down. I'm glad you, it's over. But, you know, it's like we said, it's a, it's a bottom line production based business. And this defense this year was and, and still is in the secondary, looks like guys that really just don't even belong in the NFL. Dude, he fired himself as the defensive coordinator. <laughs> well, he, he's the first guy in NFL history that I know that has hired two defensive coordinators. He's got Jeff Olbert calling first and second down, and then Raheem Morris. Well, not anymore. Yeah, who knows? Not anymore. <laughs> We're live at Truist Park in the Braves' dugout. This would take you to 3 o'clock today here on The Fan. And uh, coming up next, these young Braves are all grown up, and that's what they – uh, they get a chance to show it beginning tonight in game one. You got Buck and Hutt taking you to three on the fan, 680 and 93.7. The one.
mowing the grass, Hut. Mowing good, the grass. Huh? I wish we could get him over to our house. To AquaGuard Foundation Solutions, bringing you the one o'clock hour of the Buck and uh, the uh, Buck and Hut show. It's okay. You, yeah, yeah, the I Buck know. and Hut show. You've mentioned your ex every You're on while. the fan. Wow, and we're repping the A. <laughs> if you're going to take uh, some pictures of your Braves paraphernalia, jerseys, hats, yep. put it up on social media, hashtag rep the A. And we got a little prize pack we're going to give away a little later in the show just for listening to Buck and Hut today. There we go. What's that going to consist of, do you know? Well, you get four of these tickets to tomorrow night's game. We've got viewing parties going on here at Truist Park. That's what's happening here. And so we're going to give away a four-pack of tickets plus a Red Deck parking pass for tomorrow night's Game 2 of the NLCS, plus some Braves autographed merchandise will go along with the tickets. We'll give those away later in the show. That's going to be awesome. My wife and I are going to plan on coming over one day this week to do a viewing party here at Truist Park, and they're letting the fans kind of come out here, or they have been. I don't know if it's going to apply for the NLCS, but you can bring a, a blanket and sit in the outfield and socially distance. It's by far and away the best environment to watch a Braves game in Atlanta. Uh, a little different twist today. You can actually watch our show today on the fans' YouTube channel. May, uh, you, you need to like and subscribe yep. while you're doing that to check us out today in the Braves dugout. You look good on TV. Yeah, I got a little history of being on TV. Sports guy down in Savannah, Georgia, before oh, I got right. this job. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Let's talk about the Braves. Let's go chopping. For the latest on the Braves, it's time to go chopping. Two years ago, they were the baby Braves when they faced the Dodgers. Uh, gosh, that was fun. Uh, Love the Acuna home run or grand slam off Bueller. That was a lot of fun. Had the boys with me. We're in the upper deck, checking it out, cheering it on. Yeah. Man, that was Bueller. a great moment. Now, though, these baby Bueller. Braves, I see them as all grown up. I, Not babies that's anymore. That's the way I'm seeing it. Now, we got Ian Anderson and Kyle Wright. We got a couple of young dudes there, but... Talking the majority of the team like Max Freed. He's getting the ball tonight in game one, which you can hear here on the home of the Braves. Uh, Freed now with 50 career starts. Yep, no baby there anymore. No. Uh, look at uh, Acuna. Acuna, a young 22, but he's got 327 games of Major League Baseball experience coming into this series. And has always performed, even the past couple of years when the Braves didn't advance past the DS really well. He had the Grand Slam, like you mentioned, a couple of years ago. And that's the thing that stuck out for me now is this is an opportunity for the Braves to change the narrative. Not about just any more buck getting to October. It's about going deep into October. And as long as the Dodgers, you're, whether it's this year or next year, the Dodgers are here to stay, right, with that payroll. you got to eventually get through the Dodgers. Uh, and with a game seven, the best of four series, uh, there's no way of going around these guys. You've got to go right through them. Uh, Albies, 23 years young. Fourth season with the Braves, though. He's played over 400 games. You think he's going to be nervous? No, heck no. How about Dansby Swanson? He's in his fifth season now with the Atlanta Braves. He's played over 500 games in the major leagues. They aren't babies anymore. No. And These guys are ready to change that narrative you're talking about. The only guys that you, you have a concern for for inexperience when it comes to postseason are the guys that the Braves will trot out in, in game two and game three, Ian Anderson, Kyle Wright, and then maybe game four. And as we'll talk about this as we go throughout the, the show, but you look at the lineup, I think the Braves are, are well-equipped. They're going to be an underdog, but I think I still think they're well-equipped uh, to beat them. But you start to get to game four, you go pitching rotation, depth. That's where you give the check to the Dodgers. But everywhere else, the Braves have just as long as a lineup, just as much postseason outside of game two and game three, who the Braves might throw. 808 first pitch, and you can hear it right here on the home of the Braves, 680 the fan. So four shutouts in five games so far against the uh, the Reds and the Marlins. Now a step up in competition as you take on the Dodgers. But I, I don't expect to shut them down, but I do think the Braves have a little bit of an advantage. Both teams are really offensively dependent on the home run, the jack, the bomb. They're all about hitting home runs, number one and number two in Major League Baseball this year. And we're playing in this Globe Life Field in Arlington, brand-new stadium. Ball pops. No, the ball didn't get out of there. No. The ball is uh, – wow. they. this place, Globe Life Field, is homer resistant, I they're saying. The exact That's opposite. the reputation. Uh. Uh, deep to center field, deep in the power alleys. It's going to be tough to hit the ball. you got to stroke it to get it out of there in center field and in the gaps. 
And let me just say the Braves have scored more runs than the Dodgers if you take away the home run. So if that factors in here, I'm liking the Braves' chances. Which we know it does, right? I mean, if you look at statistics, you always talk about if you want to win and win big in the postseason, you got to hit home runs and you got to prevent home runs. You look at the numbers, Buck, from homers allowed in the division series and how this plays into this matchup between the Braves and the Dodgers. The Dodgers only gave up two home runs in the NLDS series. The Braves only won. So the Braves are keeping the ball in the ballpark, which is great news. Now, that could change and, you know, might change because this lineup with, with the Dodgers is completely different than the Reds and Marlins combined. But good to know that the Braves have been keeping the ball in the ballpark up until this point. Yeah, it's just a pure baseball man. I'm excited about the matchups we're going to see in the series. Might see Ian Anderson, the young stud for the Braves, taking on Clayton Kershaw twice, game two and maybe a game seven showdown. Imagine that. How about at the top of the lineups, the batting orders? we got Ronald Acuna Jr. They've got Mookie Betts. These yeah. are two of the top ten rated players in all of Major League Baseball. Dynamic, exciting stars uh, at the top of the lineup for both teams. They're loving that. you got the dangerous, productive, left-handed sticks in the lineup. you got Bellinger for the Dodgers. we got Freddie Freeman for the Braves. Freddie, free, three for 18 in the postseason. And really struggled a year ago. Remember the injury last season yeah. Freddie was dealing with? Had a tough go in the postseason. This has got to be eating Freddie up right now coming into the series. He's heading back to his, his home state out in that Los Angeles area. He's been struggling in this postseason. I'm expecting Freddie Freeman to show up big in this series. Well, he has to, Buck. And, I mean, not only for his legacy – you mentioned what happened last year, but you can't be considered one of the greats of all time and get to the postseason uh, and, and kind of disappear. And so you mentioned the numbers coming in has been kind of overshadowed because of the Braves pitching and Ozuna. But, yeah, Freddie's struggling, and that's a concern for me because while he's still drawing his walks, he's playing good defense, the Braves need him desperately in this series. And, you know, if he goes you know, another three for 18 in this series, I don't see the Braves getting past the Dodgers without him. Yeah, and then you look at the core player matchup, and this is huge. This is how you get to the uh, championship series and advance to the World Series. you got other guy, you got a deep lineup, and we've got Ozuna, who has just been banging the baseball this year, busting out, stirring it up is what uh, he's been doing. He's been fabulous, and Darno has been tremendous, especially here in the postseason, stepping up big. Look on the Dodger side, you got Justin Turner, you got Muncy, uh, two veterans they've got that are sort of the core of their team, uh, very important for their success. So that's a really good matchup with the core players. I like the shortstop matchup too. You got Seeger for them that is really a good all around player, and we've got Dansby Swanson, who's a really good all around shortstop also. The thing about the Dodgers, when you look at some of the staple names in that lineup, uh, you mentioned Muncy hitting below 200, hit below 200 this year. Uh, Cody Bellinger hit uh, below 240. So there's some some cornerstone pieces in that lineup, and I know they're deep. Uh, and they, they're, they're not dependent on one guy, but some yeah. of their staple guys haven't been performing up to par. Mookie Betts put MVP-type numbers this year, but you hope that, that that struggle and that trend continues. Well, I'm, a, I'm big for the recent trends. What are you doing coming into the series? What have you done last week? Uh, the couple of weeks leading in, to this matchup. Cody Bellinger, make a note, he's hitting uh, six games in a row. He's now put it back together again, the 2019 Most Valuable Player, although he's not hitting lefties very well still, but keep an eye on him. Let's get to the Matt Schaub show here on 680 The Fan. Atlanta's quarter. Loud security systems, newsmaker line. And, and Monday after the game, we get to break down the weekend with Matt Schaub. Schaub, keep it, throw it. This is the Matt Schaub Show, exclusively on The Fan. Always great to have Schaubby on. He did this years ago on another show that we were doing, and so we're bringing him back this year. Matt joins us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker line. Probably not a day you were looking forward to coming on and talking to us, Matt, but were you surprised that the hammer came down last night? Yeah, I think any time that happens, you know, I'm def definitely, no matter how long you do it, you know, you're surprised by it. You know, you're caught off guard a little bit, but um, it's the harsh reality of the NFL. And, you know, the, it, we hate to see it as players because ultimately it comes back on us as a uh, group not getting the job done on the field and performing uh, to our standard and our capability. And that's, that's on us. And ultimately the head coach is the one that um, – 
you know, gets pointed at first. And uh, But we all love DQ. He's, he's been nothing but on our side and, and battle for us and had us ready to play uh, each and every week, you know, since I've been here uh, the last four and a half years. So, uh, you know, hate to see that happen. But, again, that's the harsh reality of the world that we live in. Matt, was uh, Dan or Coach Quinn able to uh, give you guys kind of a last departing word, whether it was yesterday or uh, even today? I don't know if you guys have off today or not, but uh, and, and if so, what was it? What was the message? Well, we were in there earlier today and, um, you know, got our little workout in and, and, and watched the game film, and we did have a, a team meeting, um, albeit with the way – 2020s working with the the COVID. It was virtual via Zoom, and he did. He spoke to us on that as a team, and then, um, you know, in doing so, passed the torch over to uh, Raheem Morris uh, to assume the head coaching duties. But uh, you know what he said to us. You know, we'll keep as a team and, and everything like that. But he's had our back through thick and thin, through ups and downs, and and you know, likewise, we always have had his. So Raheem takes over for the remainder of the year. I would imagine he continues to run the defense. You got Dirk set to run the offense. Do you see anything changing the rest of the year, especially on offense, which you're a big part of? Right. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. You know, I think the coaches um, convening today and obviously tomorrow, putting the game plan together while the players you know have an off day tomorrow. Um, we'll kind of set the course on um, where we're going to go and what we're going to do as far as responsibilities. But I, I wouldn't see much changing. But Again, that's for for those guys to get together, put their heads in the staff room together and, and figure out the course of action and what's best for this football team. But whatever that is as players, you know, no matter what, um, you know, we have a we have a game this week and we go to Minnesota playing a tough team, um, and we have to be ready to go. Come in here Wednesday, get the game plan and uh you know, like all things, you know, whether you're going through a situation like that this or, you know, when there's injuries that happen, which are inevitable in football, you know the show goes on, and then and you got to be ready, uh, bring your best on Wednesday in your game prep. Matt, you mentioned player execution, and any time a coach gets fired, the the reality of it is, is it's not a hundred percent on the coach. There's a there's a failure of execution for why you got to that point. I'm sure, you guys could absolutely say the same thing. As you guys have been doing self scout on your own offense through the first five weeks, what are some of the things that you've looked at? Uh, and said, man, we just we haven't lived up to, to our standard uh, for that that part of execution uh, for for what you guys want to be. Right, and and you know, there's so many things, that, so many factors in that. Through the first five games, you know, each week, you know, it could be one thing or the next. Uh, it could be penalties, you know, in 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 opportune times. It could be um, you know a misconnect or a miscommunication in the past game and a route or what coverage was being done or maybe it was a missed throw or, or a drop ball or a penalty or you know a missed block you know you never know there's so many things that go into that so many moving pieces that um, you know those things can hurt you and, and set you back and can prevent you from scoring points or get you behind the chains and um, you know, there, there's so many things that go into that, and, and we found a way to hurt ourselves in so many situations. So, you know, in a couple games when we had leads, not being able to put it away in the fourth quarter, find that last field goal or that last touchdown to put it out of reach just a little bit more from the other team, um, you know, could be pointed at as a problem. But, um, you know, each game, you know, it always comes down to a couple plays. That's the way the NFL works. And if you if you find yourself on the wrong side of those couple plays, in multiple weeks, you're, you're not going to win your share of ball games. It's the Matt Schaub Show on the Buck and Hut Show here on The Fan. Matt joins us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker Line. Matt, a few years ago, I woke up after a bad performance at quarterback, threw some interceptions, team lost big, and saw some for sale signs in the front yard. And boy, I tell you, my dad was none too happy about that. But uh, Matt's taking some heat right now for his performance level. And, look, the fan base, uh, typically they're going to get after the quarterback when you're coming up short. How do you see the way Matt's playing right now? Well, let me start by saying, you know, that's, that's the main thing. We, whether you're doing really well as a team or you're, doing, you're not living up to expectations, the, the first couple guys that get pointed at is the head coach and the, and the quarterback. And that's, that's the nature of the positions, and that's the nature of this game. And – you know, sometimes you get too much praise when you win, and you, you sometimes get a little too much blame when you're not. And, you know, when I look at Matt, you know, he's done nothing but everything right for this organization, for this football team, every time he steps in the huddle, every time he steps in the building, and um, he'll continue to do so. Um, like anything, do you want to have a play or two back here or there? Yeah. Or a throw or a decision here or there? Yes. But there, there's a lot of factors in that. What, what 
what's the defense doing, what, what is the situation in the game. Sometimes a throwaway is the best situation and you know, it may not look like much to the viewer at home or the fan, but you know, it is the best decision for the football team. And, you know, he had a number of those come up where he just dirted it and move on, live for another down. And I'm sure he would have liked to have that same situation happen on the one throw uh, in the end zone that ended up in an interception. But we've all been there as quarterbacks. And, um, you know, I know he would like to have that back. But, you know, we can't, we can't live in the past. We just got to learn from it, move on to this week. Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I thought uh, that specific play you're talking about, uh, Matt throwing the interception, looked like cover zero, uh, and they brought the house. But I, I thought that was a, a scenario in which Matt traditionally either throws it high and away where only his guy can get it or he throws it out of bounds. He usually makes really good decisions. Is that yeah. a byproduct of him pressing and feeling like he has to score on every drive? Uh, and if so – Talk about, like, how do you eliminate it, that as a quarterback, if, it, it, kind of buying into that, that fake yeah. pressure of we have to be perfect and score seven points on every drive? Yeah, they, you're exactly correct. It was a cover zero. It was a blitz, all-out blitz. They brought um, edge pressure on both sides, and we had the right uh, protection on and picked it up and allowed him an opportunity to make a throw. And I know, talking with him today, you know, he, he kind of floated it and would rather just have a, a firm, high – ball for uh, where it's, it's Russell Gages in the back of the end zone or it sails over his head and in the back of the end zone. But, um, you know, I don't think it's I don't think it's a case of him pressing too much. You know, we knew going in that it was going to be a defense that was going to rush three, drop eight, bend but don't break, make you move the football, matriculate it down the football field. And he did a great job of that all game long and, uh, you know, didn't force the issue. And, you know, it just so happened right there. You know, just didn't put enough mustard on the football and, um you know, that was the outcome. We were hoping then, okay, let's go get a stop and let's be right back on the field with that same opportunity. Uh, it just didn't happen until too late. Matt, isn't that a throw a quarterback has to make really before the cut's even made? That you don't have a, a chance to sit there and stare it down and make sure he's going to clear that D back? Yeah, you got to anticipate that thing because ultimately, you know, you are getting a six-man pressure with – a seventh guy that's going to hug up on the, the back that's protected. So you want to let that go with some anticipation where it's him or nobody because you know that there's going to be an edge in the protection at some point. And, uh, you know, I, I know talking with him today, just wish he would have put a little bit more on it where it just wouldn't fall in the DB's lap. Shabby, uh, your thoughts on uh, Dak Prescott, the injury he went down with yesterday. Same day Alex Smith is coming back from one of those devastating injuries. A really strange day yesterday. Yeah, it really was. I mean, is it – as excited as as uh, moving as it was to see Alex Smith get back out on the field after what he's been through, um, you know, it was just it was just amazing to see. And you know, and at the same time, the opposite end of the spectrum when you look at what happened to Dak. I mean, what a horrific injury that was to see that. I uh, could barely watch it, but uh, you know, my you know sympathies go out to him, and I just wish him well, pray for him. You know, to, you know, get a speedy recovery because that was just gnarly and. Uh, you wish that on no one and just hope for him to get back to full strength and be back out there because what a great ambassador for the game and the position and for what he's been through and what he's going to continue to do when he gets back. Matt, another Matt, Matt LaFleur had a comment last week that the Monday night crew was referencing of what he learned from coaching under Dan Quinn, and I thought it was a backhanded compliment. He said the number one thing that he took away from working for Dan Quinn is, is how to have a fun environment. And you know it's a bottom line production based production based uh, culture and, and environment in the NFL. Did you feel like one of the problems under Dan Quinn is it was too laissez faire? And, and I know you've kind of played in, in a bunch of different uh, under the different cultures. Is there a certain specific culture that you say or you know that uh, has to work and works uh, throughout the NFL in the locker room? You know, when when I, I did hear that from Matt LaFleur, and I, I know one thing, you know, I definitely don't look at it as a backhanded uh, compliment. To me, you know, it's such a long, grueling season. It can it can really wear on you, whether you're doing really good or bad. And, you know, you got to have fun. You know, you got to have fun with what you're doing. If you're not, you're doing the wrong business. And, you know, I think that, that Dan always had that same, you know, atmosphere, whether you're coming off a loss or you're, you're winning and things are rolling, you know, you're the same – have the same mentality, have the same makeup. Don't, don't be emotional. Don't be a roller coaster up and down with whatever's going on, um, you know, with you personally or as a football team. And, um, you know, I, so I, I appreciated that because you knew what you were going to get when you came in the building. 
and you know that can only help you prepare and help you uh, get ready for the game and and keep that you know positive mindset and that positive attitude for the positive outcomes to come. Shabby, you going to put your name in the hat? You want to get into this coaching business? Not just yet. I'm still enjoying <laughs> putting the helmet on, so I'm going to keep putting that hat on. Put buckle up that chin strap. But uh, we're so yeah, I'm jealous. Not, I'm not of, ready to throw my name in that. <laughs> yeah, we're Hut and I are so envious of you going out and throwing it to Julio and these guys every day. <laughs> You got a great job, man. I think we got a great job, too. Now, I'm not saying that. But. Yeah, you guys are doing a heck of a job. Now, you guys are doing good. Matt, speak on that real quick because, you know, uh, the NFL will show you that if your team is 0-5, you're not going to make the playoffs. But then traditionally, the backup quarterback is going to get a chance to play. What's your mindset uh, going into the rest of this season, knowing that, you know, if you want to play a couple more years in the NFL, you might get a chance here this season to put some stuff on tape to show 31 other teams? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm just enjoying today. You know, I take them one at a time, take the weeks one at a time. My, my mindset's never changed in all the years I've done this, whether it's years as a backup or when I was playing in Houston. It's it's to be ready to play and help the guy who's going on the field or all the guys around me to be ready to play, you know, because ultimately we're only either one snap from, you know, getting on the football field or in these days one COVID test from being on the football yeah. field. And some of these young guys need to understand that and have themselves ready to go. So a lot of that I try to take on myself with these young receivers or tight ends or linemen, whoever it is. And I'm just enjoying that role and, you know, whatever happens. But right now we just got to focus on what it was going to take to beat the Minnesota Vikings this week. And we'll figure all the rest of the stuff out as we go. Matt Schaub show on the Buck and Hut show here on the fan. Schaubi, we're uh, pulling for you. You guys hang tough, man. We appreciate you. Thanks, Schaubi. Yeah, thanks, Buck. Thanks, guys. It was Matt Schaub here on the Buck and Hut show. So that was uh, good timing for that. We got him planned to come on every Monday, and a uh, good time to have him on, obviously, with Q and T being fired overnight. Yeah, and look, I mean, nobody wants to come on and answer those questions, and so I appreciate, you know, Matt Schaub coming on and doing that. I mean, there's a lot of guys in the in the sports world, as you know, Buck, they, they would just call in sick, so to speak, on, on a day like this. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, Schaub's always, whether he's been a starter or a backup, has been super professional just like he was there, so we greatly appreciate it. All right, the Braves got a viewing party. Uh, it's going on all week, too, during the Braves' run in the NLCS. And Buck and Hutt with a giveaway. We've got a four-pack of tickets, a red deck parking pass for tomorrow night's game, too, plus some Braves autograph merchandise to go along with those tickets. What do you say we go ahead, go ahead and give these away? we got Los and uh, Hoyt back in the studio. We'll take the third caller, 404-231-1680, the number. And uh, good luck with that. Those guys are answering the phone right now. Coming up next on the show, the matchup of the year in college football is upon us. It's here. The best defense in the country set to face off with the best offense in the country. Buck and Hutt break it down next here on The Fan, 680 and 93.7. It's time for play. Reminder, Baloo, you'll do the UGA 40 into the nugget. Right. Including not the.
time slot, new focus. Glad you're with us as we take you to 3 o'clock here on The Fan, 680 and 93.7. Streaming at 680thefan.com. We've got our Fan Mobile app. Listen there, sponsored by T-Mobile. We're the home of the Braves, the home of the Jackets, the official sports talk home of the Georgia Bulldogs. Hudson Mason. That's right. Gotta love that. We're all over the place. And uh, also, too, we got a lot of things going on this week. Braves, NLCS, we got Q and T getting fired by the Falcons, Georgia, Alabama, number one Clemson rolling into the 404. LeBron winning the NBA title again. And also, I'm going to add this to the list. Uh, episode five of UGA 40 drops on Wednesday. And I want to thank uh, Academy Sports and Outdoors uh, bringing us UGA 40 hashtag champions presented by Superior Plumbing and Southern Link. Episode 5, we drop Wednesday morning, 9 a.m. Run, Lindsay, run. The showdown in Jacksonville between the Dogs and Gators. What a thrill ride that was. And uh, we detail that. I heard it on the way home Friday. These good people we've got on the project, Rob Jenners, got Matt Lear and Brandon Joseph working hard for us there, putting it together. Man, I almost teared up listening to the thing, driving home on Friday. A really good episode. Hope you'll... Check it out. Academy Sports and Outdoors, UGA 40 hashtag champions. Presented by Superior Plumbing and Southern Link. Episode 5 of the podcast drops on Wednesday. It's available at thepodcastpark.com. Breaking news. Throw to the dog beat after Lowe's. We've got breaking news. I would refer to this as more of a plan out your evenings accordingly. We do have start times now for games two and games three. With the Braves and Dodgers, both games will be 6.05 start times. Again, 6.05 for game two and game three this week. Yeah, and that is good news. I got a couple of football games I got to get to. Is that good news because it's uh, earlier or as opposed to the 8 o'clock uh, start date? Well, no, I miss if it's the uh, later start time, I miss the football games. Oh, uh, okay. Two sons, man. I don't want to disappoint them, right? Dad's got to be oh, there. Oh, yeah. No, you're exactly right. That's why you need that 6A the Fan app so you can uh, stream it and listen to the Braves games wherever you go now on the uh, on the Fan app. But, uh, yeah, it's good for Braves fans that uh, have been not been able to watch the uh, the first couple games of the series because the Braves are playing at launch, uh, now playing later in the day. Yeah, and we're live at Truist Park today during the show in the Braves' dugout. You can actually watch the show on the fans' YouTube channel, and you need to uh, like and subscribe as curiosity probably will lead you over there to check Check us out, you know, acting like big shots in the Braves dugout here at Truist Park. This is awesome, man. I uh, first base dugout. Uh, I was I threw a first pitch out with Tug and I for a game last year. I did not skip it. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that, Buck, but I did not skip it. It wasn't I missed that. It wasn't necessarily a strike, but come on, when you go out there, the whole goal is just get it to the plate, right? So, uh, but besides that, this is my first time down here at the field level. So uh, awesome to see and. Braves fans will be able to come out here and virtually watch the games in the outfield. The Braves have been doing that for the past couple of games. So, Yeah, and we gave away our four-pack of tickets there during the, uh, the previous break there in the show. Let's get to this Georgia-Alabama matchup and talk about this primo matchup on one side of the ball. Let's hit it. The dog beat, baby. There's no one in the Georgia beat that's more connected than these dogs are. Time for the Dog Beat, presented by Reliable Heating and Air. With a next-day installation guarantee, or we pay you $500, visit ReliableAir.com. All right, so this Georgia defense, we're, uh, Georgia one of the few teams in the country playing elite-level defense. They're going to match up with this Alabama offense. I had not seen a better offense than what Alabama has so far in this college football season. This is strength versus strength. This is mano a mano here. Georgia's D, Alabama's O. This Georgia D just dominated Tennessee. Now, look, they gave up a couple of touchdown passes on 50-50 balls. That Josh Palmer yeah. made some pretty big plays. But uh, Tennessee, four for 17 on third down. Negative one yard rushing mm -hmm. against this Georgia defense, who forced three turnovers and got five sacks in the game. Pretty good for Havoc right there, huh? Havoc rates going up on the defensive side of the ball. Now, how about this Alabama offense? Mac Jones, 28 of 32 for over 400. Didn't throw a pick. Had two touchdown passes. Had Najee Harris, 23 carries, 206 yards, and five touchdowns. In the game against Ole Miss this past weekend, Devontae Smith and Waddle lighting them up at the receiver spot. They got Mechie, too, that third wide receiver. 
this this side of the ball, I, it's Monday, and I'm excited about seeing this side of the ball go at it on Saturday night. Oh, it's week three of the college football season for the SEC. I can't keep up with all the different weeks. Uh, but Yeah, uh, week three. Week three, and you are not going to find – a better matchup, maybe the rest of the college football season in, that you are going to find as early as week three between Georgia's defense and Alabama's offense Saturday. Uh, and, Buck, to me, it's going to come down to explosive plays on both sides of the ball. Uh, how many explosive plays does Georgia's defense give up? And how many explosive plays can Georgia's offense create? That's the only element to me that the dogs are missing offensively. Stetson Bennett taking care of the football, no interceptions so far. Uh, last week, Georgia came in the 71st team in the country at creating explosive plays. That's not good enough. It's not where they want to be uh, in the run and pass game. Georgia's going to have to find a way to get some of those what they call 15 more chunk yardage plays against Alabama if they want to score in the you know score big boy points, which is really 30 or more. Yeah, Alabama's offense, so you got, you know, two preseason All-Americans on the offensive line. Best offensive line in college football we're looking at. Mac Jones is looking at. I'm sure he's loving that part. You got three big-time playmaking wide receivers in Smith, Waddle, and Mechie. Got Najee Harris and Brian Robinson, the running backs, playing alongside a guy, uh, guy, Mac Jones, that is solid in the pocket. He's making a lot of good quick decisions moving the ball around accurately. He's a guy that can move around in the pocket. He's not looking to run and hurt you. He's looking to move around in the pocket, perhaps uh, beat you with a throw on the run is what Mac Jones is all about. He's, been, he's the undertold story of the SEC so far. I mean, he coming into the season, I felt like there were a lot of Alabama fans rooting against him, <laughs> rooting for, him to, for there to be a short leash on him with that five-star Bryce Young behind him. He has overachieved. He is impressed, pushing the ball down the field vertically. I mean, he's right now – He's in contention for SEC Offensive Player of the Year, and that's including, you know, names of like Kyle Trask. Matt Jones has been way above what the expectations were for him this year. And this Georgia defense absolutely loaded. Kirby playing 25 to 30 guys over there on the defensive side of the ball, and there's no, not a lot of drop off when you go from the first team guy to the second team guy. Fresh legs, always on the field. They're going to need that against Alabama, who tries to grind you down during the course of the game. Georgia's got enough depth, quality depth, to offset that advantage. This is going to be one heck of a matchup. Minus one, negative one. What are you one. liking about the Georgia D? The number of uh, quality players are running out there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, think they, they turned up the heat a little bit here this past weekend. Ozizo Jalari, I mean, what he did on Saturday, force fall. How about Adam Anderson, too, coming off the edge? I mean, and that's the thing that I feel like is kind of missing from Alabama's front seven is they don't have that, that premier pass rusher that you know you can – you know, uh, sick after the quarterback on a predictable passing situation. And so the big question is, you know, what wins in, in 2020? 2019, it was big offense beats really good defense. We saw that in the SEC championship game. That doesn't necessarily mean that the same kind of theory and logic applies in 2020, but you heard Kirby Smart presser uh, this, today at 12 o'clock here on the fan, and he said we, we got to find a way to score more points. Offenses are going to score in the 30s, 35, 40s. It's just too hard to stop them. So uh, that to me is is kind of the matchup within the matchup is uh, explosive plays and creating some turnovers. But I can't remember in a long, long time where we've come into a game with this as this high-powered, potent offense going up with as publicized as a defense as Georgia has. Yeah, Wyatt, Jordan Davis, and Herring up front really uh, establishing a big wall there with Rochester, Jalen Carter, and Trayvon Walker, the second group in. Uh, that really makes for a very impressive defensive line. And then you got uh, Anderson and, and, and Nolan Smith and Aziz Ojolari coming off the edge. You got Monty Rice and Kobe Dean in the middle wreaking havoc, getting ball carriers on the ground. But I tell you what I really like in this matchup with the threats, the weapons Alabama has on offense at receiver. Georgia is so deep in the secondary. Uh, Seen has been a big time player. Uh, LeCount is a playmaker, going to need him to play big. And Stokes, Daniel, Campbell, that cornerback spot, they got a lot of depth to match up against this Alabama offense. This is going to be awesome. I thought a little bit of the concern was some of the one-on-one -on -one matchups that some of the guys lost in the secondary against Tennessee's, Tennessee's receivers, some of those one-on-one -on -one matchups, 50-50 balls. Campbell that, and Daniel. Yeah, that we didn't come down with. Uh, you know, defensively for Georgia, you know, how can you take – you can't take away three receivers at one time on Saturday, right? So if you try to double-team Waddle or you try to double-team Smith – 
Well, then you get you leaving John Metch. So somebody in the secondary for Georgia on Saturday is going to have to win their one on one matchup way more than they did Saturday, at least in the first half against Tennessee's receivers. Yeah, I watched some uh, Alabama video this morning before we came in today, and I saw an offense that has a lot of they really test the perimeter tackling ability. A lot of quick pass, a lot of screen, wide receiver screens, where these three wide receivers do a great job of blocking out on the perimeter. So they're going to test your tackling out there. And then you get Najee Harris involved in some of these uh, rock 'em sock 'em misdirection, power run plays that he's going to get the ball on. So you got to be rugged up front. You got to be able to guard and tackle out on the perimeter. I just think Georgia's got, got what they need to go over there and get it done. Yep. And, uh, you know, the other, we'll thing, see, though. the other thing, too, is, is you know, how will Alabama's offense, not only against Georgia's defense, look, but, uh, you know, the explosive plays, the screen game. I mean, Mac Jones is operating Steve Sarkeesian's offense uh, to the level of, of Tua did. A lot it, of quick pass, yeah. play action pass, and then some power runs, a lot of it misdirection. It's going to be the challenge for this Georgia D. Got to bounce. All right, uh, coming up next, where do the Falcons uh, go from here? Well, we got a special edition of the Mort Report. Chris Mortensen will join us next with the latest on the Falcons move. That's coming up next. Buck and Hud at Truist Park here in the Braves dugout, taking you to three on the fan.
Buck and Hut on the fan, taking you to three here on 680 and 93.7. Two o'clock hour of the show, our sponsor, Roof It Forward. Looking for a good roofing company, that would be it. Call them first. Probably the only call you're going to make. Uh, special day and a, a special Mort report today on the show. For the latest on the NFL, we turn to the fans' truest NFL reporter, Chris Mortensen. Presented by the Musgrove Law Firm, a personal attorney for everyday people. Mort joins us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker Line. Mort, I know it's a busy day. We appreciate you coming on. Why now? Uh, 0-5 start for the Falcons. Many people expected this to happen way before now, but why do you think it went down last night with Mr. Blank? Uh, a firing Q and, and T, as we call them here in Atlanta. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Buck, that, uh, you know, the first few games were, were y- you looked at them and said, man, the offense was so explosive. They, they found ways to lose, uh, which is not a good thing. Uh, but that they, I think it's like, okay, let's, let's take this week to week. And uh, I really believe, I think we may have talked about this on Friday, I think that the one game they, uh, that Dan Quinn could not afford to lose was the game against the Carolina Panthers because it was an NFC South game against a team that nobody saw before the season as being even in contention with Matt Rule and his first year as head coach as they go through transition. They've now won three straight games, as you know. Uh, but losing a home game to the Carolina Panthers was it. So rather than wait till week 10 to assess uh, at the bye week like they did a year ago, uh, and I know that fans really aren't going to be uh, filling up the uh, – the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, but, you know, this is an owner, Arthur Blank, who is responsive to, to, to consumers. He is a patient man. I think he's a man of wisdom. Uh, and then I think also you might look back, as much as some of us may like Dan Quinn personally and, and some of his achievements, and say, you know, when, the way they finished last year, when they finished 6-2 and two after a 1-7 and seven start, that happens sometimes, and it carries – that momentum doesn't necessarily – in fact, usually does not carry itself – into the next season. So I would say Arthur Blank probably is telling himself I've learned another lesson. More, uh, the term that's being thrown around now for Atlanta Falcons fans is rebuild. And that's a interesting word. It's kind of hard to chew on in football. Uh, to me, like the, it only applies in baseball because football teams don't really – they can't wait. They can't plan ahead right. that far ahead like baseball teams. Lifespan of a football guy is, isn't as long as an 18-year-old prospects when he gets to the minor league. So are the Falcons on the verge of, of really tearing everything down and stinking for the next couple of years? Or do you think this is more of like a retooling and kind of pivoting for the Falcons? Yeah, there's no there's no plan, uh, and I don't know a team that really says we're going to tear this down and rebuild it. I mean, I, let me say this: I, I can there there are there are, there are very few and far between. I mean, coaches and the people who work on staff, they don't work to lose. Right. I mean, they they work to compete. And listen, th- there are some good players, and they're not over aged players, and uh, on this roster. I, in fact, I spoke to Matt Rule about that uh, recently. But the bottom line is that it's going to depend on who they hire as their coach and or general manager, and or will that coach have the general manager duties? Uh, so I think that's that's going to be dependent upon that in terms of how the roster complies with their own philosophy. Every coach has his own philosophy, the type of, the type of team he likes to rebuild. Let me use John Gruden with the Raiders as an example. John likes guy, big offensive linemen. Uh, they're going to ma- uh, smash you. Uh, and they, you know, he wants, and he's learned certainly that he wants some vertical threats. Well, you know, the Falcons have that, but certainly they'll look and they'll they'll retool a little bit. But that's what I call it is is just retooling, and uh, and generally, I do not see any major rebuild here. Uh, you know, you, you can talk all you want about Matt Ryan, but 35, trust me, is it's really not old for a quarterback. Now, if you're picking so high and you're looking at the the franchise over there in South Carolina, or, or, or if you believe in Ohio State kid Justin Fields or something, yeah, maybe you would would have a discussion about it. But I don't see that either. Uh, the Mort Report brought to you by the Musgrove Law Firm. He joins us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker Line. Mort, why both? Why why the general manager too? Uh, QNT getting the pink slip, uh, clean start. And do you expect the the new GM to be hired first, so he hires the head coach? How do you see that going? I think it's a really good question. You know, Rich McKay this year, 
uh, kind of came back into the football fold after after over, help overseeing some of the stadium construction and other administrative duties for the Falcons. Uh, you know, this year both guys, Dan Quinn and uh, Thomas Dimitrov, reported to Rich under the new restructure. So, you know, Rich probably favors the traditional hire the GM first and then pick the coach model. Uh, I think that's probably Rich's preference. But if the guy that they are looking at, and you really don't know, we can speculate about names all we want, but you could all of a sudden be looking at somebody, and I, you know, and, and knowing Arthur, he probably will look at, like, who is the best head coach available out there, regardless of where they're at right now, whether they're in a suspended uh, step away from coaching for a year, uh, by themselves, not being suspended by any league or anything. And they're just not coaching right now, but they're, but they're still a good coach and, and they conform to what's coming up from the colleges. Uh, you know, or you can hire a, a huge franchise coach, uh, name coach that, you know, Bill Belichick would be a franchise type guy. You just, you can look around or you just sit there and say, you know what, well, let's go find our Matt Rule. Uh, and, and, and where is he? Well, you know, the, those guys are all available, but I think the traditional model is the most likely one. Even though these guys who have leverage, and there will be leverage because other franchises will be looking for them, uh, the head coach often will try to leverage for personnel control, and they have to work that out. Mort, the only other franchise we have to compare in terms of how enticing this job is for a coach right now is the Houston Texans. I'm sure more coaching vacancies will come up by the time the season's in, but just comparing it to the Houston Texans, is is the Falcons' job more enticing? And and just talk in general of how enticing this is with a 35-year-old quarterback and 32-year-old Julio Jones who's been banged up. Yeah, I've already stated that I have no concerns about the 35-year-old quarterback. I think it could – you know, some, some somebody may say, "Hey, I need somebody with with some legs uh, to really move around." That's that's the way I want to play football. But you know, I I don't think there's any reason to think that Matt won't be successful four or five years. Uh, you know, Julio Jones, different story. Uh, they knew that when they signed him to the extension uh, that they they were getting a guy that had some injuries recently, but usually he answers the bell. And I think that's a valid question. But the problem that they they certainly face is the salary cap. And the salary cap hits you would take if you cut or tried to trade a Julio Jones. And we're speculating on this right now because the cap, as you know, is going down to $175 million, whereas it's about $200 million right now because of the lost revenues from the uh, coronavirus uh, impact. Mort, we know you're busy. By the way, I, I didn't answer that. But to be honest with you, hey, anytime you can get Deshaun Watson, that's a very attractive job. Everybody knows that. But uh, I think the Atlanta Falcons has a special place for a lot of people, too, because the city is tremendous. Everybody knows that. Mort, you're on SportsCenter. you got the NFL show. We appreciate you carving out a few minutes for us today. All right, guys. You take care. Thanks, Mort. That goes Mort, brought to you by the Musgrove Law Firm. Normally it's Friday, but on a big day like today, it's great to be able to get him on. And as far as uh, where they go from here, as far as the Atlanta Falcons go, I've got a surprise candidate. It better not be another defensive coach. That's all I got to say. Got a surprise candidate I want to throw out at you. And look, the the, the most obvious thing right now is to look at uh, who's a who's the hot guy. Well, it's Eric Bieniemy, who's helping the Chiefs run that high-powered offense. And so you got to beat the Texans to get him. I would imagine. Uh, I, I like Byron Leftwich. Really? He's with uh, Bruce Arians. He's a little too green for me, Buck. Bruce Arians running his offense, uh, learning from Arians there. Uh, uh, working with Brady, at uh, I would like to interview him. I'm not saying hire. I'm saying these are the guys I want to get in front of. Eric Bieniemy, Byron Leftwich, uh, Todd Bowles. If you're looking for a second chance candidate, is a uh, a guy you might want to take a look at. Uh, Joe Brady, with the uh, Charlotte Panthers, uh, running their offense has been very impressive. Uh, is he a guy you need to get in front of there as far as the head coaching job goes? I'm going to throw out, and we're going to hear Lincoln Riley and, and take a Dabo look at his Sweeney. contract. Uh, take a look at both of those guys' contracts and see what it would take for the Falcons <laughs> to get them in here. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. I'm going to throw out a guy. You don't hear his name mentioned very much, but I, I really think highly of this guy. My surprise candidate. Oh, gosh. For the Falcons, I would want to get in front of Brent Venables. Brent Venables? The Clemson defensive coordinator. All right, sell me He's on this running one. an NFL caliber scheme. I'm not seeing it. He's scheming it up every single week in these big games. You're seeing him doing different things. They're getting after the quarterback. They're stopping offenses. Uh, a guy that can obviously scheme it up. 
and uh, motivate. Uh, he's coached a lot of NFL talent that have flourished under his scheme. I'd want to get in front of Brent Venables also. I don't want a defensive coach, Buck, for a couple reasons, whether it's at the college well, or, the, or, sucks. The, or the NFL level. I look at the young quarterbacks and the potent offenses around the league. Uh, and yeah, and that's the trend. Uh, you might want to get a guy that can slow those offenses down. Well, I mean, we got that with Dan Quinn. We, oh, did we? we? Well, that's the approach we went with. My we were going to go. We were going to go get the guy with the the system in Seattle. And what we learned the was the system. It, it was it was because he never really had the He's players playing an off cover three zone. Well, I, I think you need young, innovative. You got to score points in the NFL now. Uh, and when I say score points, you so got to be in enemy. You, I think B enemy is a very intriguing cho- cho- choice. Kellen Moore for the fact. No, not Kellen Moore. Are you kidding me? He's in the Byron Leftwich category with me, where just he's he's way too much of a risk, especially coming from um, Bruce Arian system, where they're extremely undisciplined, one of the most penalized teams in the NFL. Uh, you know, I want, especially if the Falcons are going to be drafting a young quarterback for the future, I want his co-tandem offensive coordinator, much like Jared Goff, Sean McVay, uh, where you can build an offense that's going to be able to score points and then go out and get a young, a bright defensive coordinator, you know, like Shanahan did in, in, with the 49ers, where you can focus all on the quarterback, Salah. all on the offense, and, and get a defensive coordinator that you trust. Sean McVay did it in his early days there with the Rams. Uh, when he I'll tell you Will- one guy that nobody's going to get excited about is if that Josh McDaniels name starts There's a retread. There's a retread there with Josh McDaniels. I th- I'm not as down on the retreads because I think there is value in getting guys who have learned from their previous experiences. But one thing that I'm emphatically against is is the defense approach and the and the defense of mine. Yeah. I, I think modern. So NFL, you don't like my surprise candidate? No, I, I really don't. Especially that he's at the college level. I mean, well, you think I like Brent Venables is going to get the job before Dabo Sweeney? Well, Dabo's not going anywhere. His contract prevents him from moving on. And you're going to pay a fortune to get him in here? Clemson's paying him ten million dollars a year. Is Arthur Blank going to pay that? I would think not. My goodness, at least Venables is a guy that can scheme it up on defense where you can slow down some of these offenses. Uh, look, at, at, we'll agree with this. To me, and I'll say it right here, anything's going to be an upgrade <laughs> from what they had. Any of these guys we just mentioned would be an upgrade of what Q was bringing to the table, There's Coach only, Bro. Only one way to go, especially on the defense side of the ball. <laughs> That's up. Absolutely. Coming up next on the show, the Braves get a shot tonight to change the narrative. From up and coming to a team built to win it all now. Plus more on uh, Todd Monken's system over there at Georgia. Uh, We got all that. You'll hear from Dan Mullen in the next segment, too. I can't wait to show you what he had to say over the weekend. So a lot coming up. Glad you're with us. We are live at Truist Park in the Braves' dugout. And that's Buck and Hutt taking you to three here on The Fan.
Park in the Braves dugout, first base dugout today. Getting you ready for the big game tonight. You're listening to 680. Maybe on 93.7 you're listening. Uh, we're streaming at 680thefan.com. Got the Fan Mobile app sponsored by T-Mobile. You might be listening there. I'd go ahead and get that. Listen to the fan anywhere, anytime. By the way, listen to game one tonight. As we stream or also on our uh, Fan Mobile app, you need to uh, check us out there. And right now, too, a little special thing about today in our show. We are uh, live on YouTube, the Fan's YouTube channel. Right now, we appreciate you checking us out there. Make sure you like and subscribe. And 680 The Fan's Monster, Monster Week is fueled by Monster Energy Ultra Watermelon. When fueling up for the big uh, Braves NLCS Game 1 tonight, try the brand new Ultra Watermelon. Zero sugar and tastes like summertime in a can. Now available in all Atlanta quick trip locations. Did you have one of those earlier today, Hut? No, I haven't yet. Uh-uh. No, I was, uh, as Dan Quinn used to say, I was just jacked up uh, <laughs> naturally about getting well. out here to the first base dugout in NLCS game one today for the Braves, so I didn't need any manufactured sugar in my body. Yeah. Uh, well, those Quinn euphemisms there, those little uh, – No longer with us. Yeah, those things are going away right now. Uh, Braves and Dodgers on it, though, as we uh, get it re ready tonight. You can hear it on the fan, as I was mentioning, the home of the Braves – Going to have 11,500 fans in that new ballpark in Arlington tonight. So finally, we get to see some fans instead of those cardboard uh, cardboard yeah. cutouts we've seen at all the ballparks this year. Yeah, that'll be good. And you think about a guy like without having fans in the stands, I think it's even more imperative why a guy like Ronald Acuna, the energy he plays with, uh, the team kind of feeds off him. We saw that in the first two series of the playoffs so far. Not only is it an opportunity for him to kind of capture the baseball world, you know, uh, Tatis Jr. said it last week, and I think it's so true. You make a name for yourself by the way you play in the playoffs. He's right. I think about Ronald Acuna and, and just nationally what this could mean for him uh, and the whole world to see him perform on a big stage. Well, you know he's getting respect, and LeBron would love that. The respect that Acuna's getting, uh, you see the national – uh, the promo spots that are running leading into the series. You're seeing Acuna and you're seeing Mookie Betts are the images you're seeing as they promote the NLCS this week. I think some of the banter that's been happening, some of the non-traditional uh, stuff that's going on in the field, the bat flipping. We saw Trevor Bauer and, and uh, Ronald Acuna kind of trading jabs on social media. I think that's great for the game. I mean, I think the way Ronald Acuna plays it, his energy is big for this team without fans. How about fans. when he gets drilled, though? Do you think that's great for the game? Uh, you know, I, yeah, I do. I think it's kind of like, you know. Well, because no, you're not Ronald Acuna. Oh, well, yeah, you said the game. You didn't say Ronald Acuna. You said the, for the game in, in general. I kind of subscribe to the whole, you know, there's no such thing as, as bad publicity. And I yeah. think for a younger audience, this is great for baseball. You know, I'm good with all of it. I'm not really into showing up the opponent putting it in his face like that. I don't think Acuna's You know, if it's a that. game winner or, uh, you know, a big three-run bomb that gives you the lead late in the game, I, you know, I'm all for that. But you're seeing some of these guys showboating uh, with a uh, second-inning home run when they're down four to nothing. I don't like that part of the deal. So you didn't like the selfie by Ozuna. Is that showboating in your book? Like, what's showboating? A bat flip? Does that agitate you? Well, if I was pitching on the other team, yeah. yeah. I mean, my response would be don't give up a, a meatball over the plate. <laughs> you hit the ball 415 feet, well, I, think what, I think you get to celebrate. You know, big picture, I, I think class is going away in our society. You know, it's all about the showboating now. But uh, that's that's for another day. Let's talk about the pitching matchup tonight. we got Max Fried. We're going to hand the ball to You know he's fired up. This is his childhood team. He grew up in the California, L.A. area following the Dodgers, and now he gets a shot to face them in the NLCS. I'm expecting we're going to see the, the best of Max Freed in this game coming up tonight. We're going to face another one of these Vanderbilt guys, the Scon L.A. on us, Walker Bueller, third season in the Dodgers rotation, and a guy making his 70th career start if you count the regular season and the postseason tonight. Good pitching matchup in game one. It's a fantastic matchup, and, I mean, really the first two games you're going to get great intriguing matchups I mean you start to look through where the Braves may have the advantage where they may not I think the one thing that concerns me for the Braves is does Freed give us the advantage tonight uh yeah I mean I I, I don't think you have a disadvantage I he's mean, been I, better than Bueller this year he sure has and I think 
the first two guys you're going to throw out there, I mean, Ian Anderson going up against uh, uh, whoever it is for the Dodgers today. Was it Kershaw game two? Yeah, I'm yeah. sure it's Kershaw game mm-hmm. two. Uh, that'll be another great matchup. But it's just the, it's the starting rotation depth, right? Like wh- The Braves have to win at least one game in the first two games. They cannot be down 0-3 going into potential game four. <laughs> Plus, with, I'm not. With throwing. And I know I'm, you know, you're laughing at me. I'm stating the obvious. But the reality of it is, is you cannot – uh, be going into game, you know, for throwing, you know, uh, Bryce Wilson. I mean, the starting pitching rotations. The Dodgers have a couple guys, uh, Buck, that have a two or three ERA that they may not even slide into the rotation uh, against us. So their depth is really what's Urias. I think is is the big uh, biggest advantage compared to our starting rotation depth. Yeah, well, I, I'm looking for Max Freed to go out, and he's a guy that didn't get a start in the postseason last year. So here's another motivating factor for him to go out and, and get it done here tonight. Uh, Dodgers in the left-handers, uh, Cody Bellinger, uh, he's a different guy against lefties. He's hitting 216 with three bombs against lefties, uh, 250 and nine bombs against righties. So a big difference there. Looking for Freed to get get after Cody Bellinger in the game tonight. Uh Looking forward to that. Bueller, we faced. He is. Uh, he's faced us. The last time he saw us was in the postseason two years ago. Uh, he lost six to five. Acuna had that grand slam in the second inning. And you look at uh, Max Fried. I tell you the the thing I like about Max Fried the most is that we win when Max Fried gets the ball. We're twelve and one with this guy going. And then you look at what the Braves have done well this October, and this is a part of the storyline for free. The Braves have a .92 staff ERA. Uh, one more shutout. We know the shutout that they had four uh, against uh, this playoffs and against the Marlins and the Reds. One more would tie the Major League Baseball record for the 2016 Indians. But, you know, to your point, Buck, how much do the Dodgers push our lineup? The Dodgers team ERA is two, so it's really good as well. And then you start to look at the pens. You know, the Braves have only given up one run in 20 innings. Uh, the Dodgers' pen has only given up five runs in 22 innings. So, Well, it, we're better than the Dodgers' pen in the series because their closer, Kenley Jansen, he uh, sounds like to me the Dodgers are going to throw him out in low-leverage situations in this series. Uh, now they've got some other guys that have closed before. Trinan's one of them. Uh, Gratterall's another one that, that can bring it up there. Uh, they've got a really good – Good bullpen, but I think right now we've got a better one. We've got Melanson that is at top of his game. Will Smith, to me, is a difference maker right now here at the end of the year. We're going to lean on him big time. Martin has been great. We've got Green, O'Day, and Mentor. I think we got the edge. Once these I, teams go to the bullpen, we got the edge there. I do think we have the edge, but I would point back to the recent World Series champions, the Nationals, the Astros, the Red Sox. Like Neither of those teams had a, a true legitimate high power closer, and they won a World Series, right? So whether it's Joe Kelly for the Dodgers or Kenley Jensen, I think the past couple of years have proven to you, you you don't really have to have that, that big-time closer to win a World Series. Well, here's a factor, and I'm going to throw it out there right now, is that Kenley Jansen was really the only swing and miss guy they had down at the bull, down in the bullpen. He could make you swing and miss, and, and that's what helps you win out of the bullpen in the postseason. You get a guy who comes in, doesn't allow the, the opponent to put the ball in play, to square it up. He's got swing and miss stuff. The other guys don't. Do you expect this to the be The other a, guys don't. Do you think this will be a high-scoring series or a low-scoring? I, I think it's going to be low-scoring. I think it's going to be the pitchers will keep it low. You look at the four remaining teams, there's no doubt that the two best lineups are the Dodgers and the Braves. And the Dodgers were the one team that, you know, can't out bat, can't out hit us. They had more home runs in the regular season. But they only outscored the Braves in the regular season by one run. That's That was a big surprise to me when you think about their lineup. So I just don't see it. I, I think it's going to be a – I may be wrong, but I think it's going to be a, a low-scoring kind of pitchers keep it low uh, series. I'm going to go medium scoring. Which is now, what? you didn't give me that as an alternative. You oh, said low scoring or high scoring. I think we see uh, five to four games. That's pretty high for these pitchers, though, isn't it? Well, look at the lineups, though. you got to expect they're going to yeah. score some runs. And that's the that's the matchup within the matchup is what's going to give. You know, is it is it the one through nine uh, bats for both teams that are that are going to push these, these starting pitchers? Um, or is it going to be more of a pitcher's duel as we saw against the Reds? Um, well, I'm a big guy of uh, how you're trending over the last week or a uh, couple of weeks. And you look at this Dodgers lineup, Betts is hot. I mean, this guy's coming in confident, man. He's tearing it up right now. Uh, Seager, 
uh, hot. Uh, coming in uh, four for 11 against San Diego. Three runs, three RBIs right in the middle of the action. He's helping stir it up. You got Turner and Muncie who are trending down. They are not hitting the ball well coming into the series. Not at all. Cody Bellinger, as I mentioned, he is trending up. He's confident right now. He's squaring the ball up. And you got Chris Taylor and and Pollock, those guys are trending down. So you're seeing about half of the lineup going well, the other half not so much. Look at the Braves. Acuna's trending up right now uh, in the postseason. He has been doing some damage. Freddie Freeman not. Nope, not at all. Uh, Freddie Freeman 3 for 18 coming into the NLCS. So we need Freddie to wake up and, and put it together in the series if we're going to have a chance to uh, do some damage and Walk away, uh, heading to the World Series. I think uh, Ozuna and Darno are definitely confident right now, doing damage, swinging hot bats in the middle of the lineup behind Acuna and Freeman. That can pay off big time if we can get Freddie going. Albies, not so much. Four for 20 in this postseason. Swanson doing some damage. Couple of bombs. Five RBI. He's a guy trending up. Duvall, Marcakis, and Riley, seven, eight, and nine in the lineup. They're all trending down right now in the postseason. So You can't have another three of 18 performance by Freddie and expect to, to beat the Dodgers. No, we're going to have and to you, be better than that. You mentioned Darno. The way he's impacted this team, Buck, uh, I, I I would argue the fact that he's on a two year deal too is a huge payday for the for the Braves or he would be up for a huge payday if he wasn't. But the way six for ten in the last series, MVP in my opinion. I mean the way that he's impacted these young pitchers, uh, when you lose a guy like Brian McCann and you have an upgrade at that position, I mean he has been just as big of a free agent acquisition, in my opinion, as a as a guy like Marcel Zuna. Doesn't get as much attention, but to me he's he is so under uh, talked about and undersold for what he's meant to the Braves. Yeah, as far as outside of the pitching realm, he is our most valuable player in the postseason. No doubt. Right now, Darno, what he's done. Really good stuff. And, again, you can hear uh, game one of the NLCS on our uh, fan mobile app uh, sponsored by T-Mobile. You can check it out there. Uh, streaming, too, at 680thefan.com. We're the home of the Braves. Giving you some great coverage this week. So we'll get ready for the NLCS. Also, a big week in college football, man. we got Georgia and Alabama coming up on Saturday. And doesn't get any bigger than this, right? This is one of the games of this season. Looking forward to seeing it. 8 o'clock kickoff in Tuscaloosa, Georgia, number three. Alabama, number two. Can't wait to see this matchup, brother. And I tell you, I was a little frustrated with Monken in the game on Saturday against Tennessee. There were three possessions at the end of the first half that really got me frustrated. There was a, a punt for Georgia, then a, a field goal for the Bulldogs, and then they got stuffed at the end of the second quarter yeah. down on the goal line, which was really frustrating too. That's when the Vols took the lead right there. I was getting frustrated, man. Conservative play calling, a lot of running up the middle going on, a lot of uh, complaining about that through the years under Kirby. And we found ourselves a, a lot in the third down and long situations. Open up the second half with two field goal drives. Not sure the field goal drives are going to help you beat Alabama on Saturday. The one thing I did like, though, is Monken has brought tempo to this offense. They're going tempo, man. They're, they're speeding it up. you got Stetson Bennett, and he's got him at the line of scrimmage, and they're running off plays left and right. And that's what, as you saw in the Alabama Ole Miss game, I mean, the, the tempo at which teams can put pressure on defenses, Nick Saban alluded to in the post-presser that, you know, Ole Miss and Nick and, uh, 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 Lane Kiffin had his signals. He didn't have their signals. You can't steal signals when you're going that fast. Uh, it's funny, Nick Saban, when any time somebody out-coaches him, totally as, agree. As, as Clemson did in the national championship and beat him a couple years ago, he always has an excuse. You can't go that fast and steal signals. Lane Kiffin out-coached Nick Saban at the end. He just didn't have the players to win. But that's the tempo that I think concerns me the most because Georgia doesn't really – they don't have what we haven't seen yet. Maybe they're holding on to it, that ability to go really, really fast. Although you look I at – I like them doing it in the red zone, down in the uh, goal line. Buck, those guys for Alabama were exhausted. I mean, you couldn't compare if – you, if you compare the players to Ole Miss and Alabama, we know it's uncomparable. But the way that Lane Kiffin used tempo to his advantage – I think if I'm Kirby Smart and Todd Munkin, I'm watching that tape, I'm going, man, we got to have some packages and some plays where we just push tempo. And Georgia so far this year is snapping the ball on average more than any year under Kirby Smart. 81 snaps is what they're averaging the first two How games. How about a year ago? A year ago, 61 snaps per game. 
2018, 66 snaps per game. 2017 under Kirby Smart, 65. So we talk about, you know, this Todd Munkin effect and is it working, and there's a number of ways to win a football game. We just assume that Georgia can only win one way, and that's with a great defense, and they're not going to win against a great offensive team like Bama. But, you know, it, it, could it be that the stereotyping that we've put on Kirby, that he's happy to ground out, grind out wins, is not only false, but he's at least changing. You know, he's trying to change, and you see that by how fast they're going on offense, snapping it 81 times per game this year and averaging 40 points. More snaps traditionally means more points. Well, I know what Alabama's working on this week over on defense, trying to figure out a way to handle the tempo. They know they're going to get it based on what Ole Miss was able to do and based on Monken already doing it with the Georgia offense. They're going to put the hammer down. It's going to be snapping the ball quickly. We're going to find out Saturday night whether Alabama's defense is ready to handle that tempo a little bit better. Did you think Monken got conservative because he lost a little faith in Stetson Bennett? Like there, After the first couple drives where and a couple of them should have been interceptions, I thought the play calling changed uh, drastically. Yeah. I thought they got really conservative, and to me it was showing that – they were losing faith in Stetson Bennett and credit Stetson because – Well, he flipped the switch. He did. And settled he made in. some plays. 23-21, they go for a uh, eight-play, 62-yard touchdown drive late in the third quarter. He goes uh, – Stetson Bennett goes four for five in the drive. That's the one where he hits Kiaris Jackson yeah. for the touchdown to put him up 30-21. to 21. Stetson put it back together there at the end. Well, and the other thing, Georgia traditionally wins their offense. They win on first down a lot. They didn't win in the first half against Tennessee on first down. That was where – and to me, Alabama, that's the storyline in the game is is Georgia averaging four yards on first down or five yards or more. They were against Arkansas and Tennessee in the second half. But if they can't win the first down battles, that's what puts Georgia into a an a, uh, unideal, a non-ideal situation because now you're in predictable passing situations. All right, every week we've got our small business spotlight, and that's presented by Georgia Primary Bank. Your community, your bank, GeorgiaPrimaryBank.com. Mm, tasty. <laughs> Time for the College Football Nugget. Presented by your locally owned and operated Ace Hardware. Find your neighborhood store at acehardware.com. All right, so the Florida Gators went out to College Station and got run over and beat by Texas A&M. And LSU, they, they got that, they're in that fix-it mode on defense. We're seeing a lot of teams, lot of teams. in that fix-it mode. And LSU's uh, at the top of the list trying to put it together. They're going to match uh, Knockheads and Gainesville down at the Swamp, 3.30 on Saturday. It's the CBS game. And Dan Mullen, the Florida head coach, he, he wants a full house at the Swamp <laughs> for this LSU game. In fact, here's Dan Mullen right now tell, talking uh, about filling up the Swamp this weekend. Crowd was certainly a factor in the game. I will certainly say that. I know our governor passed that rule, so certainly, hopefully, the university administration decides to let us pack the swamp for LSU next week because that crowd was a major factor in the game. And so I certainly hope our university administration follow Five. governor. Our governor has passed a rule that we're allowed to pack the swamp. We have 90,000 in the swamp to give us that home field advantage. <laughs> he said, Ron DeSantis let us in. You think we want to fill the swamp. That sounds <laughs> like to me, Mullen, the Gators, they weren't ready for the crowd noise. Well, did you or think, does it just simply excuses? Well, remember, they're pumping in crowd noise at a lot of these stadiums, even some of these Georgia games. Well, like, they didn't on Saturday in College Station, brother. Did you see the crowd in there? It, it looked more than 25%, didn't it? Man, they raised. They were awesome out there. The 12th man came alive on Saturday. Texas A&M came out after the game said, you know, only 24,000 were in the stadium, and I'm going, man. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's an optical illusion. <laughs> yeah, I guess. two for one ratio maybe or something like that, but – so yeah. what do you think the, uh, the Florida administration does? Are they going to pack them in there Saturday at the Swamp? Absolutely not. Uh, Strickland, their athletic director, came out almost immediately afterwards and was like, look, you know, we're not putting 90,000 in the Swamp. Will they put, you know, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000? Maybe. But, you know, it, it, that's that Swamp, by the way, they – I've never uh, been in a, a stadium that packs as many people in there I mean, you're like shoulder to shoulder with the people sitting next to you. They got the bench seats. I've never been there. And that, I mean, you you need a can opener when when it comes time to get up at the end of the game to get away from the two people that, uh, the one on your left, the one on your right. I mean, you're literally sitting here. There is no room at all at the swamp. They pack them in there, brother. They throw them in there. And went on a recruiting trip one time, and I. 
claustrophobic sitting in there watching the game. Yeah, I've never been there, so I can't really attest to it. But uh, I think this is a, uh, a guy in Dan Mullen who was upset that they had a chance to win, and they lost it, and they should have won because they're the better team. Yeah, they, they got to fix their defense, too. That was ugly. Well, and, and it makes you, if you're a Georgia fan, look around, and nobody's playing defense in the SEC right now. Uh, and Georgia's playing fantastic defense, the best Georgia defense of all time, in my opinion. I don't think that's an overstatement by any means. Did you uh, see how happy Jimbo was to beat the oh, Gators again? Man. I believe he's like 8-1 and one against those guys now. Buck, he was 0-5 versus AP top five teams since he's been at Texas A&M. They hadn't even been competitive in some of those games. Point margin of of 19 points he was fired uh, up he needed that badly and, and kellen mon answered it uh it was uh it was a much needed yeah. win for for texas a and but no i would not expect to see a a, a, a now did out. we edit the part of of uh, mullen saying that he wants to pack them in but they need to have mask on <laughs> i guess we, uh, yeah, we I could have edited that part out i don't think he said that i said he just said throw ninety thousand in there it's it's the swamp yeah COVID doesn't exist Poor Florida. I guess the Gators were a little bit overrated, I guess, apparently. Well, I think their defense is anemic. Um, Atrocious. I mean, what's Grantham doing over there? Kyle Pitts and Kyle Trask look as advertised. Look, I'll tell you this, and I tweeted this out on Saturday. Yeah, and, uh, Some you of have those, the tight end get a little dinged up in the game. Kyle Pitts, man. I mean, he's the best tight he end. Yeah, a little hitch in his giddy up. Some of these throws, he's double covered in, and he's still one of them. Kyle Trask, the first one, throws up, and he makes a great catch. I you mean, got all these prognosticators that took Florida coming into the year. They're backpedaling today. They're wanting to play for Dan Quinn and play that cover three zone where they can backpedal at the snap of the ball. I think Todd Grantham at this point will take uh, anybody's opinion how to fix that defense. Yeah, there's another big game coming up Saturday. Looking forward to seeing the outcome of that one, too. All right, coming up, our uh, blown call of the week and how Acuna can take all of the national spotlight beginning tonight. That's more to come here as we broadcast live. And we are at Truist Park in the Braves' dugout taking you to three. It's Buck and Hutt on the fan. The biggest names in sports. All right, we're back at 50.
Auburn game. Oh, gosh. This was a blown call of the season, maybe. So he had Bo Nix. He fumbles the snap. All right, he picks it up off the ground, and he spikes it behind him. We call that a fumble, a lateral. But it wasn't ruled that. In fact, Auburn was able to uh, move past that and kick the game-winning field goal. And, boy, Sam Pittman was furious over there on that Arkansas sideline. He should have been. Arkansas should be 2-1. and one. Pig Suey, they should be 2-1, and one, Buck. Uh, the ref clearly made the wrong call. What was crazy is they – Well, they nobody re reacted and jumped on the ball initially, which I think hurt Arkansas. They said uh, – like I heard Mike Piera talking about it today on Twitter. He was like, you know, the rule states and 7.735. You know that rule, right, Buck? Yeah, we all do. Uh, that nobody jumped well, on the, the ball. I know the rule of not fumbling the snap. Clear and concise. Yeah, whatever. But the reality of it is, is that ref, uh, the line judge, whoever it was, the back judge who called it, blew his whistle too quickly. That's where they went wrong. Uh, it should have been a fumble because he did turn around and spike it. You're taught as a quarterback, we're all taught, hey, whether you throw a bubble screen to the perimeter or you're spiking it, you know, make sure you step back and make sure the ball's going forward because otherwise it's a fumble. Yeah, Arkansas, Bo Nicks got lucky. Oh, or, or, <laughs> Auburn got is there any? Is there a luckier person in sports today than Gus Malzahn? Uh, yeah, that was the blown call of the week, no doubt about it. Let's get Chernoff in here. He's See what he selfies. thinks about that Auburn-Arkansas game. Come on in. We don't care. Walk right into the shot, brother. Yeah, we got it uh, going on. The YouTube channel is going to have Chuck and Chernoff coming up today so they can actually see you. Get right in there in Get between us. Get in here for us. our YouTube subscribers. That's okay. We can hear you in the oh, background. They'll turn you up here in a second. So, yeah, what would you think about that Auburn-Arkansas ending? Uh, whoa. Well, here, you can use this one. Uh, that's a little close. No, is that too close for COVID? Sorry. Social distancing, please. I've got to be honest, if there was no pandemic, I wouldn't be that close. Can, <laughs> can you all hear me? Are, are nope. we broadcasting live? Uh, no, they can't hear that's you. Good. It's working out well. well. You guys keep going, Tor. Well, oh, hi. There you hi, go. Matt. Hi, Matt. All right, so blown know. call of the week. Do you see anyone worse than the one in the Auburn-Arkansas game? Uh, that's a great question, though. That's uh, it was. How about the Vikings not kicking a field goal last night? All right, don't laugh at me. I didn't have a huge issue with that. Why? That Making an eight-point game. I Guarantee the game's not decided in regular. But you know, what's, well, you know what Zimmer's saying? Oh, you're I, about to call me Zeno. If oh. I can get a yard, if I can get a fourth down, I'm not giving the ball back to Russell with any True. chance to come back and tie the game. I didn't have a huge – that is I'm trying to win the game and – I know people don't want to hear about analytics and those things. The, the, I mean, the numbers will tell you go for that. Right so now. what about Kirby's decision to go for it on a couple fourth and shorts? Do you I have a problem with those? I hated it on his didn't own Didn't like 35. the play calls. I didn't love it on the own 35. I get it at the goal line, but I guess to me, it almost seemed like he was coaching the team that he thought was less talented than Tennessee. I always like the idea, if you're going to pass it in that goal line situation, I want a, a power run formation to pass it. All right, so you got the defense all packed in there with you, and now you got a chance to uh, get outside the defense with a uh, pass. I like if you're going to run it, I like spreading the field, spreading them out with a formation when you want to run the ball in that situation. Well, I, guess, I guess my point, though, is and, and, and you're on 35. It's just that's so – Well, he got into a little bit of a pissing match yeah. with, uh, with Pruitt there, and you could tell, he, and he even admitted that after the game. But let's be honest, without Georgia making the mistakes they made both, I thought some over-aggressive coaching and then the on-field mistakes, Tennessee's not within – Four touchdowns of that team. The fact that that game was so close in the third quarter had more to do with Georgia making mistakes. And I give Tennessee credit. They took advantage of short fields. But I thought Georgia, I just thought they were playing it as if they were the underdog. When I mean, you just hold serve. You're better than Tennessee by leaps and bounds. Matt Lana, what did you think about Pruitt's uh, mask thing that he was wearing <laughs> over there? It looked like he was from the Middle East. He did. He looked like my grandmother used to wear one of those when she, when she made her way from Russia back in the old days. <laughs> that was the highlight of the weekend, First wasn't all, it? I don't know. like what, what mask was he doing there? Was he keeping his head safe? That was it's, he was acting like you could contract COVID through your ears, you know? Like. All right, odd. you got a lot of content today. You got it stacked up, locked and so loaded? I figure today makes up for what we would call March April. Oh, yeah. yeah. Between, yes, Braves tonight, game one at 8.08. Uh, the Falcons' decision, which is long overdue. The Georgia recap. I mean, there's just so much to do that uh, I don't know the four hours is going to give us enough time, so we might stay later. All right. Well, you got uh, Oliver will be here in a little bit. Los is picking up the slack in the meantime. I guess Oliver's actually got the day off today. Picks a good time to take a day off. Wow. Is there a better place to be doing the show, though, from the Braves' first base dugout at Truist Park? I mean, this – I'd say this is uh, not a bad gig. Yeah, this is worth the price of admission, as they say. Oh, All right, we'll look forward to the show. All right, boys. Lead you right up to uh, Braves coverage coming up a little later right here on the fan.
So, Hut, good job. We'll do it again tomorrow. What do you yes, say? Sir. I'll be here. Yeah, we'll do Will it again you? tomorrow. I want to thank Brandon jo the Brandons here for uh, lifting us up. The T-Mobile team was with us today doing a great job. 30. Caitlin, social media over here working it for us. And uh, Hut's going to take a Major League Baseball home today. Uh, Domino show. brought in his batting bag like he was 13 at the cages again, so I, I ended up taking this Rawlings baseball with me. i got to give it back to him. All right, uh, new show, new time slot, new focus. Buck and Hut, one to three on the fan. Chuck and Chernoff coming up next.
scariest monster. Can it just be your? while since we've been able to say that the Braves and the Yodgers will play tonight right here on this radio frequency when we're done for leadoff show 680 game day and then first pitch at 808 right here on the mighty FAN uh, Charles Oliver has the day off he's on assignment we say hello to Carlos. Well, um, again I'm gonna be back tomorrow well that's good news Chuck let's say hello to uh, Carlos Medina hey Matt Yellows. guess what what we kept feeding my dog crab and he kept pooping orange Sounds like an issue you had to deal with all weekend. I'm sorry about that. The more you know. It is also the beginning of Monster Week. Who yes. 680 The Fans Monster Week is fueled by Monster Energy Ultra <sighs> Watermelon. When fueling up, getting ready for a big baseball game like the Braves tonight, try the brand new Ultra Watermelon Zero Sugar. Tastes like summertime in a can. Not available in all Atlantic uh, now available, excuse me, in all Atlanta quick trip locations. Monster Week. Arr. I love that our audience has caught up to this, but the hosts have not. So every time you happen to say that word. Monster. <laughs> you hear from the dragon. You will indeed. That will be a part of Monster Week. And yes, it starts <laughs> tonight with the Braves and the Dodgers. Game one. As we get ready for game one, let me give you the most obvious of statements. Game one is vitally important for the Braves. The Dodgers could tell you it's vitally important for them. It's more important for the Braves for a couple of reasons. Los, I don't think the Braves can set, uh, successfully play from behind in too many of the games themselves, but more importantly, the series. Uh, if the Braves can jump out to a 1-0 series lead, if we believe that the Dodgers are going to feel all the pressure in the series, they've got to win a World Series or bust, let them get down a game, see how they react. And then if you're the Braves after three games, I don't think you can be down 2-1. to one. I just think the Dodgers have too much pitching depth, um, I think the hitting, while it's close, the Dodgers have a little more. I think tonight is a huge, huge, huge spot for the Braves with Freed going to make sure they grab a 1-0 lead and not have to face Kershaw down 0-1. In every series, there is momentum and there's the pressure of expectations. And, and I think that's what is the giant ally for the Braves in this series. We've talked about it for years when we said, hey, the Braves window is just opening up. Look at the Dodgers. They've been doing it for four years, five years. Well, now they're into year eight, and there still isn't a World Series to show for it. So if you can grab that first inning lead and grab that first game, suddenly they're that team with the expectations of, really, we've gone at this eight straight times and we've got nothing to show for it? You want that pressure on them. I would agree. The other reason, again, I said if you get down two games to one, none of us can tell – a Brave fan, what game four or five is going to look like for the Braves? Well, like, and, well, none of us have seen a format of seven games in seven days. Well, we haven't, number one. And number two, if I asked you right now who's starting game four for the Braves, who is it? I have no idea. Okay, if I asked you who's starting game five? I have no idea. I think they would bring back Max on short rest, but I can't guarantee that. So that's why, again, getting out to an early lead in this series, the Dodgers can come from behind down 1-0. They can come from behind down 2-1. I just I don't love the Braves in that situation. Now, a couple of things about the ballpark. The games will be played at Globe, uh, Globe Life Field in Arlington. Uh, and, Los, all we keep hearing about is how difficult it is to hit the ball out of the ballpark. And they've already talked about in the years to come they're going to move in the fences. Like, that's already been the discussion. To give you some perspective on this, the Dodgers, who have a ton of power up and down their lineup, they only hit one home run in their last series, in that division series victory over the Padres. In fact, they scored 23 runs in their series against San Diego. They scored 22 without the benefit of a home run. So they're not just home run or bust. They can beat you in a lot of ways. The Braves have to be able to do that in this series as well. Do you remember when I would bring up possible places for Ender and Ciarte to end up, and I would always say, that ballpark over there, it's a lot of space, and they, they need a guy who can cover out there. That's what's going to be the important thing for the center fielders in this series. This ballpark that you're going to see at Globe Life, I've watched probably about 30 games in there so far. You're talking about the power alleys getting out to like 385. It plays so much larger than any park that the Braves have been in this year. It also that may be park. <laughs> it also makes you wonder if there's any chance anywhere where you can play Ozuna in the outfield in this series. When the Dodgers play a lefty or when the Braves want to 
um, you know, have Darno DH, I don't know that you can trust putting Ozuna in this kind of an outfield. But you also have to be situationally aware in this series because this is one of those series where a defensive replacement, you should be considering it. This is a massive park. This isn't a park where you get to say, hey, let's just move Cakes over by three feet and he'll be able to take away these. It is a big park. You've got to be able to cover it and speed in the gaps. The Braves have a ton of speed. Mm-hmm. I would love to see them running in the gaps with, with Dansby, with Osby, with Acuna. Now, back to your original point, though. That's where Apache defensive replacement. If you're up two runs in the eighth, whereas the Braves didn't do that, and it almost cost them. Marquecas made the great play in right field on the, the ball that dropped. you got to have Pache out there with a couple of run lead to cover more ground. So we'll talk all about it. Just how, how nice is it to say the Braves are two series wins away from a world championship? So weird. It's been a very long time since we've been able to utter a sentence like that. Uh, we do know game two and game three will be played at 6.05. I don't know why. They're going to give the Astros and the Rays the 8.40 start time. I, maybe it's because those games are played on the West Coast. I don't know. They're going to make the L.A. home market watch their team at 3 in the NLCS, so it's just weird, but uh, games 2 and 3 at 6.05. We have a lot more on the Braves. Stay with us on that. Uh, the big news, but the least shocking news, came in last night. The whoa, Thomas- whoa, whoa. Fill me in. What's out there? No. Oh, you don't know? Fortunately, Dan Quinn was filled in last night. Sorry to be the one to tell you. Uh, Dimitrov and Quinn fired last night. Again, no major surprise. Uh, I can make a great argument that this should have happened after 1-7 in seven a year ago, but the loyalty of Arthur Blank and him wanting continuity, it kept both guys employed. So now Rich McKay will take over football ops, which is kind of humorous considering the Falcons removed him from that position 12 years ago. Because of a hire that he made that blew up and everyone said, we can't allow you to have this ever, this opportunity ever again. Let me be clear. I don't think Rich will be – maybe I'm wrong. I don't think Rich is going to have a huge say-so in the hiring process. We'll see. I that think, was Bobby Petrino, yeah, by the it way. It was indeed. So he brings in uh, Rustin Webster, who was a former GM, also a Falcon scout now. He used to be a GM with the Titans. He worked with Rich in Tampa to help him with the personnel day-to-day. I would hope the Falcons have some sort of operations plan for the next GM and then the hire of the coach because the coaching hire won't happen to the offseason. They can start looking for the GM if it's somebody not employed in the NFL right now. I know we're all like gung-ho on this Lewis Riddick idea. You can talk to Lewis today if you wanted to sure fill can. him out or anybody else in that vein. Now, the Falcons also name Raheem Morris their interim coach today. At 0-5, it's the worst start since 1997. Um I've had a lot of problems with the way that I think Arthur's patience and his loyalty and his like for Dan Quinn has gotten in the way of making a good decision. Firing Dan Quinn is not going to solve the issue. The Braves, uh, the uh, Falcons aren't going to be better tomorrow. But I just kept asking, where's the accountability? Where's the accountability after that disaster at Dallas? Following it with the disaster against the Bears. Losing the way you did um, yesterday against a, just an average Carolina team who... It's so obvious how well coached they are. Sure are. How well prepared they're because they're a middle of the road talent team, and once again the Falcons were a mess. Uh, Self inflicted wounds, defensive mistakes. They don't look prepared, and that was the end of the line for Dan Quinn. Again, it's not going to get better the rest of the way, but accountability matters. It's weird how at the end you always look back at other administrations and go, all right, that's that's what we used to have. Remember when you used to be the team that was the least penalized in right. all of football? Yep. You weren't very exciting. You weren't very explosive. But Mike Smith teams didn't beat themselves. I think the story on the Dan Quinn teams were – at times you were explosive. At times you were you were one of the only teams to go to a Super Bowl, and then the next year in the NFC, the only team to get back to the playoffs. So it wasn't like this was all about failure. But in the end, the lack of accountability for little things is what got you beat, and and we saw it play out over the course of the season. The uh, Falcons also under Dan Quinn yesterday racked up the fourth, fifth, or excuse me, fourth five game losing streak or more, and he's only been here since 2015. Give you an idea, they've lost six in a row twice under Quinn. Five in a row now twice, and they go to Minnesota next week. So it's not going to be on Quinn's record, but I think that number is going to grow. They could never stop the bleeding. Um, whether it was adjustments in a season, in a game, series to series, half to half, it was never truly there for that football team. And it's something I've been barking about now for a very long time. But here's the, here's the good news, Lowe's. You'd much rather be this bad then live at the 7-9 and nine range. Like, we used to do this about the Hawks all the time. The Hawks were always just good enough to be in the middle of the pack in the East, but nobody ever thought they were good enough to win a championship. Well, if you're going to be a 3- or 4-win team, which I really believe this team is headed that way, that is sweeping changes in the coaching staff, same thing at GM. That is also an ability to pick 1, 2, or 3 in the draft. Both those things are very real, 
And while it's painful for now, that's so much better than picking 15th and winning seven meaningless games. I did this on Twitch over the weekend because somebody asked me a really good question on Twitter, and I just was like, I want to put together a video of this. If you go into the top five, you're a bad football team. You could be a bad football team for a year, but the way you get out of being a bad football team is you pick the right quarterback moving forward. And and that doesn't mean, hey, I drafted a guy and I'm going to kick Matt Ryan to the curb, but it does mean I now have a plan so that I don't go into the the game of going 2-14, and 3-13 and 13 every year until I can get a quarterback. When you're up that high, you get one so that you're never in there again. I would uh, be very clear if I am picking in the top two or three, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, you're taking a quarterback. No, if it's one, it's Trevor, and you, you do it. And you're done. If it's right. number three and it's Justin Fields, I do it as well. Yeah, Maybe. Tra- Trey Lance is an option. That's I mean, fine. You're, you're going to have a discussion about all these guys. You do it like Car- uh, like a Green Bay's doing it. Match your quarterback next year. You bring him in slowly, whoever the guy is. I'd love it to be Fields. And then your new coach, your new GM, and your new quarterback move Falcon football into their next era. That's the way that one's going to go. Uh, Georgia handled their business against Tennessee, although it was a little tougher than it probably should have been. Georgia outscores Tennessee 27 nothing in the second half. When you can do that, it lets me know that that first half, and as you guys were watching the game, you saw the same thing. A lot of self-inflicted wounds. A lot of, I thought, over-aggressive coaching decisions at times. Um, but the Georgia defense is the constant. When all else is still... You know, highs and lows like the Georgia offense, and, and that's what you should expect, expect when it's Stetson Bennett. The Georgia defense was just unbelievable, forcing three turnovers in that second half, completely taking control of the game. Tennessee could not get free in that second half. It was utter domination. And like a good team who wants to be great, they pull away, and, and they take away any chance of an upset in the fourth quarter. You want me to give you a quick uh, a preseason naughty number? I like naughty. Because, I mean, like 4 o'clock, you know, I'm, I'm going to deliver those. So Georgia's now the only team in the last 10 seasons – with multiple 20-point wins after trailing at halftime. That's funny. That is blowing yeah. teams' doors off. It, but I'm, I'm right there with you. You spotted them seven points to start the game. Yeah. When you went for it basically inside your own 30, that didn't make any sense because you are playing with the most dominant defense in all of college football, punted away, oh, by the way, with the best punter in right. the country. None of it made sense. They were able to go ahead and, and, and get you know, everything back to normal and, and put the points all over Tennessee. But that game really should never have been that close even in the second quarter. The other thing that was pretty obvious, and, and let me say on the front side, Stetson Bennett didn't play very well. It's not Stetson Bennett's fault. He's he's marginally ta- – I mean, he's, just, he's limited. It's not his fault. Uh, Stetson Bennett is going to need a lot of help around him offensively. That means running the hell out of the football. That means the offensive line doing a great job. And that means your, uh, your wide receiver skill weapons making big plays. And there is enough of that, but Stetson, and again, I say he can't play like this against Al. I think this is kind of what Stetson is, and I'll state 50 times over the next week. It's not his fault. Stetson is middle-of-the-road talent that you need to do a lot of well around him. Coach him well, offensive line well, skill play. It's all got to be on point or else you're going to have some major highs and lows with your offense. But this was the idea of installing the air raid concepts. Yeah, when you have the dynamic force at quarterback, you're really tough to deal with. But even if you just have solid quarterback play, remember we went through the numbers of of Oklahoma State in 2013 when they had to have three different guys start because they kept on getting injured. All of them were productive. All they're asking Sets and Bennett to do is use the weapons around you and make sure you get the ball out on time. This college football is littered with the Ken Dorseys and the Josh Heupels of the world that win big because they get the ball to the playmakers. Yeah, his numbers look fine. 238 yards passing. He had the the, uh, two touchdowns in the air, one on the ground. He did the – you just avoid the mistakes, make the throws that are there, and then hope all those other things. The run game – Zamir struggled, but McIntosh was good. Milton was good. There was enough uh, there on the ground game that uh, made George's offense work. And you mentioned, I mean, don't laugh at this stuff. The special teams matters. Hot Pod, who comes in to replace Hot Rod. (laughs) Boy, he was good, too. (laughs) We're not doing that. No, no, no. I'm putting my foot down. I stole that from somebody on Twitter. Hot Rod is gone. Now it's Hot Pot. That kid's well, leg. Wow. You need to give it back. <laughs> it's very impressive. And then Kamar did this First job. off, I, I thought that you were the McIntosh president of that. And K now Mac, you're the president of this. I was very impressed with K-Mac on the kickoff returns. And he was good. He was good. Did He's a lot dynamic. Of good things, yeah. And then congrats to uh, Georgia Tech as they had a very good second half themselves against Louisville. Jeff Sims just won freshman of the week again for Georgia Tech. And Jameer Gibbs, man, you can wow. see special with that kid. That hurdle, man, oh. that was that was an awesome play. 121 yards from scrimmage for Gibbs, and Georgia Tech beats Louisville. They'll be uh, at home. as We've talked about monster week. Jackets at home with Clemson at noon. Georgia in Tuscaloosa at 3.30. Braves all week, or excuse me, Georgia at night, I'm sorry. Georgia at night with Alabama. 
Uh, Braves all weekend, LCS. It is just an overloaded week of stuff. We're glad you guys are <laughs> we're, we're Hopefully you'll be with us all week. It's Monster Week fueled by Monster Energy. Let's get our winging it idea. It's time to wing it. Brought to you by Wing and Burger Factory. With over 50 Atlanta locations, find yours at WNBFactory.com. So you're going to send your winging it idea answers to the Ameripress. Fresh off the press Twitter feed. Since it's Monster Week, we do want to know either the scariest monster you have uh, encountered, either a movie monster or your favorite monster, whatever you want to do. Monsters of the Midday. (laughs) That was a great idea. (laughs) Um, Worked out for you. It did indeed. Is there anything scarier than The Fly? Go back and just look at The the Fly is beyond. Wait, do you remember the movie The Fly? No. Okay, Google just some pictures of The Fly. It will keep you up night after night. Yeah, that's a that's a creepy one as he's transitioning oh. into a fly. That was from that same era. Man, the first time I saw it was I didn't see Alien. Oh, Alien's I the same way. I saw Aliens. Same thing. And so just the idea oh. of, of something that would open its mouth and another mouth would come out, and that's what would bite you, that yeah. would freak me out. Wait. Uh, scariest one I saw, Leprechaun. <laughs> that is in a different way. <laughs> that is creepy. Not. See, I was wondering how we were going to play this. Like, is Pennywise, do we consider him a monster? Like, is Freddy Krueger a monster? That's what I'm, right? I, I don't know. Is it, like, it's a scary being, but is it a monster? I think it's a monster. Uh, Dan Matthews, you got one? And he sucks. Chuck, All right. please. You're getting punched in your sleep this week. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go with uh, The Hills Have Eyes. I don't, I don't, I don't think I, I know that, that movie. What, do, yeah. People get, like, stranded in, like, a yeah. weird town. Yeah, they get stranded out in the middle of the desert, and it's, like, these, like, weird, like, nuclear holocaust, like, oh, people. Yeah. Right. Tennessee fans. Yeah. It's it's creepy as, yeah. Boy, just said they're Tennessee fans. You got to work forward. Yeah. You, you can't I hate on the way past. It. Work, work it into Alabama fans. So who is the uh, scariest either movie monster or your favorite monster? We'll let you do that. Ameripress. Fresh off the press Twitter feed. We're live in the Braves dugout. You can watch us on YouTube all day long as we want to build it up to tonight's NLCS game one. And can we promote one more thing that we have going on? Sure. So we do have a watching place in Arlington for the Wednesday and Thursday games. I've heard of it, too. That's going to be their sports and social. I like So that is going to be right across the street from Globe Life Park. Since there are Brave fans that are going to make the trip out, uh, we're going to see what our start times are going to be because baseball is just kind of letting us know. So we know this. We know Wednesday is 6.05. Right. So we will basically have a table set up where for this leg of the trip, not sure about you yet. We're trying to work we're on efforting. that. But we're we got efforting. we got Dan and we got Hoyt for that one. Yep. And I am locking down our Friday place in Tuscaloosa. So as we start to find this sort of stuff out, uh, just understand there's going to be limited capacity, but we'd love to see you when you're out there. Details are becoming available. We'll give you ideas on all that stuff as the week moves forward. All right, coming up next, things will look very different this time around. But will it be enough for the Braves? We'll talk about (laughs) I didn't want the answer this early. We'll give you our answer next.
BradaPestSports.com. Good afternoon, I'm Carlos Medina. The Breda Pest Sports Desk has no gaps in coverage with Breda. You never have to be afraid of bugs. The official pest control of UGA Athletics, BREDAPest.com. The LA Dodgers and the Atlanta Braves will play game one tonight for the, in the National League Championship Series from Globe Life Park in Arlington, Texas. It'll be Walker Bueller, Bueller. starting on the mound for the Dodgers. Max Freed gets the ball for the Braves. First pitch is set for just after 8 o'clock. Your fourth pregame begins right here on the fan tonight and the app at 6.50. The Bueller. Atlanta Falcons have elevated defensive coordinator Raheem Morris to the role of interim head coach as the team fired Dan Quinn and general manager Thomas Dimitrov last night. The team is 0-5 to start the season. This is your home for the NLCS Atlanta Braves. This is the fan, 680 and 93.7 FM. Bueller. Shakira, Shakira. We are live in the Braves' dugout. It's not a bad view to start our Monday. We're in a baseball kind of a mood. NLCS game one will happen tonight at Globe Life Field in Arlington. Our coverage, well, it's now, but officially, you'll get pregame coverage tonight uh, at 6.50. First pitch a little bit after 8.05 on your home of the Braves as they will send Max Freed against Clayton Kershaw. Three o'clock hour of our programs brought to you by USA Insulation. Stop sweating, start saving. Go to usainsulation.com. Los is in for the king. Charles will be back tomorrow. Um, oh, he and, thinks he will be. Well, I, I, that's the plan. He anyway. always tells us that. Yeah, that's the plan. All right, coming up in five minutes, Alabama's going to give Georgia some chances. So you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> chances that were not available even a few years ago. Yes, Georgia, Alabama yeah! week. <laughs> so <laughs> excited. Here is here what a week i know this is so great all right uh so here's where i want to start los by giving some perspective on where the braves are today as opposed to the last time they met the dodgers in the postseason which was not that long ago it was 2018 in the nlds i think the simplest way i can do this for you is starting with the lineups and i'm going to see we'll see how, if, how much braves fans can remember about game one of the division series that began in la against hinjin ryu so i just want to tell you this because I thought this was a fascinating topic, and I kind of was wondering, why am I so much more confident? And I went back and did the exact same thing you did. So please, I, I'm not going to guess because I know the answers. All right, so the Braves lineup went this way. Acuna, Camargo, Freeman, Marcakis hitting cleanup, Tyler Flowers hitting fifth, Ozzy Albi sixth, Ender in center field batting seventh, Charlie Culberson at short batting eighth in front of Mike fulton -Evich. That was the starting lineup just two years ago in the Division Series Game 1. Tonight, Acuna, Freddie, Ozuna, Darno, Ozzy, Dansby, Duval, Marcakis, and the benefit of the DH gives you Austin Riley hitting ninth. So this time around, no Ender, no Camargo, no Flowers, and no Marcakis in the cleanup spot. Instead, Ozuna, who's an MVP candidate, Darno, who's going to win the Silver Slugger for catching. Dansby, who has had another really good year. Riley, who's capable of turning around any pitch and hitting at 400 feet. And Mark is hitting eighth in your lineup. It is night and day offensively. There is only, excuse me, there's only one team in baseball that can match what the Dodgers are doing offensively. That's been the Braves. Because when you take a look at where you were just a couple of years ago, I looked at one of the box scores for one of those games. You realize Ender batted second oh, yeah. a few times in that series. Okay, now it's a league MVP in, in Freddie Freeman. That That's the difference in the balance of this lineup. The Dodgers, here's what they feature, and it, 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 so you just understand and respect it. League MVP, followed by a former All-Star, former yep. All-Star, former All-Star catcher, and then former league MVP batting six. That's their lineup. The only one that comes close in all of Major League Baseball is what's going on here in Atlanta. And I'm glad you said it that way. The Braves come close. The Dodger lineup is better. And here's why. They're not solely dependent on the home run. They can beat you in any number of ways. They take a million pitches. They hit balls in the gap. They can single you to death. They can extra base hit you to death. The Braves sometimes can be home run dependent. And that's, you know, that's a thing where you we get to that frustrating point where there's a runner on second and nobody out. And it's the age old, can they move him over to third and get him in with less than two outs? They're going to have to figure that out in this series. There are going to be times when Clayton Kershaw's on the mound and you are not going to be able to have two or three hits strung together. You're going to have to get the double, the ground ball to second, and the fly ball. If you can't do that, the series isn't going to go as long as you want it to go at that point. Well, this is where I think this ballpark plays more to the Braves' style because a lot of the modern-day ballparks, it's hard to hit a triple 
when you're playing at Truist Park. That that it's got to bounce off that that the concrete brick wall, brick wall right. out there and shoot in a funny way. Globe Life is going to give Dansby Swanson opportunities for doubles and triples. The same thing with Ozzy. The same thing with Acuna. Agreed. This this lineup has considerably more speed than what the Dodgers have. Now the Dodgers. They don't have a whole lot of swing and miss guys. So this is going to be about when you get that opportunity, you got to turn it into a three spot. You can't settle for one. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because the Dodgers are also a, a very patient team. They're going to work pitch counts up. Like the hope we'd all love to see Max go six or seven. Same thing with Ian. I think five is is very realistic because you have so much trust and faith in the bullpen. The Dodger pitching, starting pitching is deeper. It's better. I mean, I don't think there's any debate about that. Now, two years ago, it was Hingen Ryu, Clayton Kershaw, Walker Bueller, and Rich Hill – this time around, it's going to be Bueller in game one, who I think the Braves can have some success against. He's been up and down. He's dealt with a blister. The, the blisters are, are a major factor. Right. They have been they have been a major factor in these playoffs. He's only got four innings in first his first two uh, postseason starts. And he's constantly working on the yeah. fingers, trying to keep it from busting. Uh, Kershaw has been really good. He's been Clayton's Kershaw, been very good. Yeah. Then they can mix and match. They have, uh, you know, if they want to start Dustin May, they can. They've been using him out of the pen. Um, if they want, they can start Uriah, uh, Urias. They, they can they can go so many different ways if they want to mix and match with that starting rotation. Los, I would tell you this. If the Braves, and these are ifs, if the Braves had a healthy Soroka and Hamels, it would be even, or I think the Braves might be a favorite in the series to go along with Freed and to go along with Anderson. They don't, so I can see why the Dodgers are a decent enough size favorite in the series with that alone. I just think that once we get to a Game 3 situation, if you're 1-1 or you're up 2 nothing, you're going to feel great because... Now that we have questions about our pitching, is uh, Kyle Wright and he the last his last two regular season outings plus his postseason outing. Great, I'll take it all day yep. long. The Dodgers then have more questions about their starting pitching at that point. You you talked about the options. The options have been all right. Dustin May goes out there, he throws an inning. Uh, all right, go to Urias. Okay, Urias gave him five or six innings. Okay, we're glad you did that. They have just as many questions after their one-two as we do here. Well, I think that's why the middle of the series can be really huge, interesting. Huge, Because I think the managers are going to be on the spot more to, to mix and match with pitching. Um, here's the biggest difference in the Braves from 2018 to now. And if you thought the offense was a big one, this is bigger. The Braves' bullpen in 2018 in the postseason was Kevin Gosman, Tukey, Chad Sabatka, Vizzy, Freed, Minter, Brad Brock, Julio Tehran and Johnny Venters. Now it is four closers, eight options. Left, right, doesn't matter. Three outs at a time. There's not many wrong answers for Snit in that case. The Braves can win this series. It would not be some gigantic upset, but I think it's going to be on the shoulders of the pen. If the Braves can get early leads, and the pens, they don't have to be perfect. They're going to have to be really, really, really good um, for the Braves to, again, pull a – it's not a huge upset, but a, a, a decent size upset. No, the, the last four teams are all the, the four strongest teams in baseball. They were the four strongest teams over the course of this year. There's not a whole lot of mystery guess. You don't get down to this point. Also, with having to play a quick three-game series and a five-game series, you've had to have won some games to get here. With that being said, to me, this Braves team has to get it into the seventh inning, and it's a tight ball game because the, the numbers – for what these two pens are doing, slide drastically into your favor in comparison to the Dodgers' pen. And their pen is good. And their pen's good. The Jansen yeah. thing is the one part of it that the, the all of a sudden part. Is, they don't have a yeah. they don't have a, a, a shut down closer. closer. Yeah. Right now, uh, one more item here is the one, two, three in the Braves' order. Again, these are obvious things, but you can't live eight for thirty-six with twelve strikeouts. Two of those guys, if they go one eighty in the series, and you know, are double-digit strikeouts, you're not going to win the thing. So you, you got to have those guys do what they. Dansby and Darno covered it up in the last series, which is fine. Los, I'll end with this. We in the city have seen the Braves be the better team a million different times and not win the series. And I'm talking the Vegas favorite, the you know traditional favorite. They had a better record than teams they lost to, the Braves have. 2019, 2003, 02, 98, 97, 96, 93. It's not impossible. That, that's happened many times. The Dodgers had their time. It's your time. This is our time. This is your time right now. You you get to go take Up it there, it's from, their time. Down, down here. Like the Nationals last year went, that was awesome. And, yeah, they had a horrible year this year. And they don't mind because, you know what, you got your title done. But here's the next opportunity for you to say that your time with your group is now done. It's our time now. Well, if you believe, indeed, the pressure is all on them, win tonight. Get a one nothing lead. Have Kershaw, who has had hiccups in the postseason, have to go out knowing if I don't pitch my tail off, we're down 0-2. All of a sudden, the pressure does matter. All right, it is uh, Monster Week here on The Fan for good reason. Braves postseason baseball. <laughs> Georgia, Alabama, 
Georgia Tech Clemson. Our Monster Week is all fueled by Monster Energy Ultra Watermelon. And speaking of Georgia, Alabama, Lowe says Alabama's going to give Georgia some more chances. There's some things that I realized every single weekend. What's so cool about college football, because it's it's not stagnant, you keep figuring out different things about different teams. Like I, I now am, am fairly certain Florida's not good at defense. They're just not. That's just a, a big surprise. And I'm coming around to the thought process now that I've watched a handful of Alabama games going, they're going to give you an opportunity nearly every game to hit them. And, and I'm talking about guys running wide open, and you've got to score those points. They have had so many times where you just say, I don't think the safety knew where he had to be. I don't think the corner knew where he had to be. And I started taking a look at it from this perspective, Matt. So in 2017, Alabama averaged 35 points per game. That's that's a good number to be at. If you're anywhere between 35 to 40, you're, you're contending for big things, conferences, championships, everything else. But then they made a change, and they realized we needed to go more up-tempo. We needed to score more. And so the last couple of years, they've averaged 45, 45. This year, they're number one at 51.5, scoring a ton of points. But here's what's changed. Back in 2017, the last year when they kind of played a, an Alabama style, as we like to joke around about it, they gave up 12.8 points per game defensively. That then moved up by a full touchdown the next year. That is now up to 30.3 points per game. That is not Alabama football typically. Alabama football, a lot of times the numbers get built on bad teams, and then, you know, they get into conference, and okay, now they're getting up 17 points per game. That's just how it is. But since they're playing, everybody who's in conference actually knows who you are, knows how to attack you. 30 points per game is not an Alabama team. Now, by comparison, last year Georgia gave up 12.2 points per game. It's 12.3 right now. And the difference with them, their point totals, their points per game, last year we didn't care for the Georgia offense. It was 61st in the country. They averaged 28.3. They're back to the more respectable level, 36 points per game, 20th in the country. If you want to compare that to 2017, they averaged 34 points. In 2018, it was 37 points. They're running more plays per game. They're running 81 plays offensively, so it's tempo. So if there's one thing that we've seen from Alabama, if you run tempo at them right now, they don't seem to react well to it. And so I think that's going to be one of those big things to watch early in the week. Let's see if Georgia is able to run their tempo at Alabama because it seems to be working against Alabama and working for Georgia. I saw a good number at uh, Pick 6 Previews on Twitter. said uh, Saban's Alabama defenses didn't allow 45 or more points in his first 110 SEC games. That was from 2007 to 2019. They've now allowed 45 or more points in three of their last six SEC games. It's weird. It, it's it's and it, it's with dynamic athletes, and you go, I don't think that they really know what they're doing all the time. Um, I want to give Lane a lot of credit though, and I want to give Matt Corral and that Ole Miss offense. Man, they were they were fun, dynamic. Yeah. I mean, they did things that, frankly, they had a beat on Alabama. What Alabama was going to do? Matt Corral's a really, I mean, he's a good athlete, he's a good quarterback. You could see all the different things. You just hope that Georgia can take the same advantage. Because in the first two games, Alabama would tell you we can live with giving up 19 and 24 points, and then it got track meet yeah. against um, against Ole Miss. But the other side of it becomes Georgia's defense, which is unbelievable. This will be that challenge that I don't think there's anybody else in college football right now that I would say is close as far as the potential challenge of trying to slow them down. No, this is by far. And, and again, you look at the numbers, 12.3 points per game. There's other schools that are right around that, you know, BYUs of the world, but they're not playing the same kind of competition. This one, though, is going to be the, the the monster matchup, the, the number one offense versus the number one defense. Roar! Very good. Roar! The uh, 3 p.m. hour of our program is brought to you by USA Insulation. Stop sweating. Start saving. Go to usainsulation.net. Can they come out here? I don't know if they come out here. I'm, I'm just. You, what do you want insulated? The dugout? Yeah, if we could. We can work on that. I'm going to turn that fan on over there. Listen, Ryan at USA Insulation, they know what they're doing. <laughs> All right, coming up next, uh, what is the one of the most informed minds in baseball think of the Braves' chances? Hey, no problem, Matt. Listen, really look forward to actually talking about this series and really the whole playoffs with you guys. <laughs> Domino, thank you, but no, this is a national perspective. Oh, so uh, that's the way it's going to be, huh? <laughs> Yeah, it's nice to have a local perspective. This is a national perspective. From one of, the, <laughs> one of the more informed minds in all of baseball tells us if the Braves can pull off this upset against the Dodgers next. This year.
We in the city have seen the Braves be the better team a million different times and not win. The Dodgers had their time. It's your time. This is our time. This is your time right now. Take Up it there, it's from. their time. Down here, it's our time. It's our time down here. Fucking Troy. That's all over the second we ride up Troy's bucket. <laughs> Which was more like Clayton's bucket. <laughs> it exactly. kind of feels more right that way. It's Chuck and Chernoff. We're live at Truist Park. We're occupying the Braves' dugout. Why not? They're not here. They're at Globe Life Field getting ready for the NLCS game one tonight. You'll hear it here on the fan. You'll see it on Fox, which is a perfect segue to our next guest. He's the great Ken Rosenthal from uh, Major League Baseball on Fox, who's kind enough to join us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker line. Ken, how are you these days? (laughs) We appreciate the time. How are you? (laughs) How are you going, guys? We're doing very well. Uh, Ken, let's start with a a quick glance at the Dodgers. We know they're, I mean, there's a lot to like about that team. Where are they vulnerable? You know what? I've been searching for the answer to that question for several days. <laughs> I covered the previous series uh, with the Padres, and obviously they swept that series. And people might say, well, they're vulnerable with the closer because Kenley Jansen has not been as good as in recent years. It's been kind of a steady decline, velocity and everything else. But they have all these other options that they can use in the ninth inning, and they've effectively already phased Jansen out of that role. So I don't really see a clear area of vulnerability i guess you might say bueller tonight because of the blister issue but man i don't know guys well <laughs> let, let, let me ask you yeah, this the Braves are pretty good too yeah they are uh, well, don't get me wrong how about the okay do you buy into the pressure angle in other words let's say the braves stole game one how much is the pressure we know the dodgers are about world series championship or bust is that a thing does that matter it matters there's no question that there is more pressure on the Dodgers because they have not won a World Series since 1988. They've been to the postseason now eight straight years, and it's time. But I don't know that this particular team will succumb to that. The addition of Betts has kind of transformed them or taken them to another level. And I'm not saying they can't lose, guys, because the Braves are really good, and the Braves' offense is perhaps the difference maker in this series, though these Dodgers' offense is just as good. So we'll see what happens, but I don't see them mentally succumbing. I don't see a glaring weakness. If they get beat, it will just because, be because they got beat. Ken Rosenthal, MLB on Fox, joins us right here on The Fan. And, Ken, I think that the, the only thing more unfair than facing the Dodgers is facing the Dodgers with the DH. Like, they get even longer as a lineup. <laughs> uh, it's kind of the same thing with the Atlanta Braves that we've been able to see them play with one. And, and I'm right there with you. I think this is a series that if the Braves are going to have a shot, it's going to have to be with the offense getting hot for a handful of days and then seeing where it plays from there. I agree. And here's my concern with the Braves. And – I love them because, frankly, I thought their pitching was too thin to get through maybe even the first round, and yet they've done it. Now, what's got to happen in the first two games is that Freed and Anderson have to give them length, and that means five, six innings at least, because if that does not happen, there's going to be a trickle-down effect with the bullpen, and then as you get deeper into this series, playing every day, remember, seven games in seven days potentially, then the bullpen starts to wear down. And that is the concern as you get into game four and game five, which are potential bullpen games for the Braves. That's where I see their vulnerability. And the Dodgers are a little bit better prepared to handle that. They have guys who can go longer, Dustin May and Tony Gonsolin and Julio Urias if necessary. No, I think that's that's a a fair point, especially in the middle of the the series. Let's go back to the offense for a second. Uh, These two offenses are really deep and really talented. I think the Dodgers are a little more diverse. They don't just live off the home run ball. Ken, we know how good the Braves' offense was, and then all of a sudden they moved Freddie to two and Ozuna to three, and getting those guys an extra turn every game. It didn't have a huge number in the Marlins series. Against this Dodger pitching, how do they match up? Well, no one matches up great against the Dodger pitching, but, my goodness, Freddie hits all kinds of pitching. Ozuna hits all kinds of pitching. Darno's been just fantastic so it's going to be the cat and mouse game and trying to run up pitch counts and all the things that we love about the postseason style of play and you know what you asked me about the Dodgers and pressure I look at a guy like Azuna he loves this moment Acuna loves this moment so it could work the other way too when you have guys that rise to it I think Bookie's a guy that rises to it as well so 
I'm expecting big things here from a lot of different players. And that's what's so exciting about the series. When you see great players doing great things, for instance, Dellinger robbing Tatis in game two of the previous series here. Ken Rosenthal, MLB on Fox, joins us right here on The Fan. And, Ken, uh, because you saw the previous series, and, and I actually grew up as a Ranger fan, so I probably watched 20 of their games this year at, at Globe Life. Tell our audience about how that big that ballpark is and how it plays for these guys. It is big, and the ball does not seem to carry the way it does in other parks, and it plays big. So what you guys were saying earlier, you're going to have to do more than hit home runs. And frankly, the Dodgers hit only one home run against the Padres, scored 23 runs in three games. You're going to see balls that you might think would go out and not go out. And they said earlier that, well, maybe with the roof open, the ball will carry better. That really didn't happen in the previous series. So, yes, it's a big playing yard, kind of like Petco, I would say, at certain times in recent years. Ken, one last one for you. Uh, Dave Roberts has taken a lot of grief in the national media for whether it's overmanaging, managing by the book too much. When you don't get the result, everybody's going to pick at it. Tell me what you think in this series. Is that, again, we talk about pressure for the players. What about on Roberts to know that one move away from somebody questioning him? And who knows if it doesn't go well this year, who knows what his future would be? Well, that's life in the postseason, no question. And you're right. There is pressure on both managers, and frankly, the two managers in the other series as well, because of this format. Because of the lack of off days, you've got to manage your staff differently than you would in a normal postseason. It's more akin to what you would see in the regular season, and these guys are certainly accustomed to doing that, but the delicate balance of knowing when to go to which relievers, under which score, that's going to be something that we'll be paying a lot of attention to. Kent Rosenthal will have all, all the uh, dugout action and all the great uh, analysis along with the crew tonight on Fox. Ken, we appreciate you spending some time with us. Have a great call. Thanks, guys. Take appreciate care. Appreciate it very much. There's Ken Rosenthal from Fox joining us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker Line. Um, there's so much to get into in this series. I, I do subscribe to the theory that they do play with all the pressure, but the Braves do have pressure too. You get to this point, you don't know when you're getting back. I would say this, not to the extreme of what um, we saw a few years ago with Carlos Beltran carrying an Astro team to a World Series. Can the Braves find one of those guys who has one of those eye-popping seven-game series? You right? had one last week. With, with, tra- with, with Travis, Travis Darno. Exactly That's exactly right. the kind yes. of play you need. Because that can level the playing field Absolutely. against a team like the well, Dodgers. You would love to see a guy like Dansby Swanson go hot out of his mind for right. about five games and say they can't get him out. That's exactly right. That's what you need. All right, coming up next with the naughtiest of naughty digits from the college and NFL world, front office Los is oh. the <laughs> just so weird. Is the man with the plan. He's ready to deliver us all the naughty numbers next. Oh. <laughs> now more than ever.
Live at Truist Park in the Braves dugout. Monster Week. That's right, it's fueled by Monster Energy Ultra Watermelon. When you're getting ready for any of these big games, like an NLCS game, make sure you fuel up with the brand new Ultra Watermelon for Monster. Los is in for the King. It's Chuck and Chernoff until we turn things over to pregame tonight for the Braves and the Dodgers. Game one of the National League Championship Series which will come your way tonight at uh, 6.50. 10 first, first pitch? <laughs> no, first pitch at 8.08. Tomorrow's first pitch at 6.05 in game three on Wednesday, also at 6.05. Later this hour, we will play the Monday edition of That Sucked with a good prize, Mr. Lose. I like prizes. We have a four-pack of the Braves watch party tickets, including a parking pass to give you for game two tomorrow. Is it drugs? It feels like that. It gets you, oh, okay, cool. gets you a baseball high. Yeah, I love baseball. Um, for future reference, when I'm doing a mention for a Braves read, you might not want to mention drugs. Anyway, we'll give that to you coming up at 4.30 for that suck. Somebody say Did somebody just say cocaine? Yeah, I thought I heard that. <laughs> uh, front office Los is about to dazzle you in a moment with some naughty numbers from the weekend. Let me remind you first, though, as we celebrate 40 years since the 1980 Georgia Bulldog National Championship team, our own Buck Ballou is taking Bulldog Nation behind the scenes of that epic season Thanks to Academy Sports and Outdoors as they present UGA 40, hashtag champions. Sponsored by Superior Plumbing and Southern Link. Episode 5 is Run, Lindsay, Run. Oh, they're going to win that. Wow, spoiler alert. You can hear about the annual showdown of the Dogs and the Gators, the thrill ride of that finish, all the stories behind the game. It's a ride through Georgia football history. New episodes drop every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Thanks again to Academy Sports and Outdoors. It's UGA 40, hashtag champions, presented by Superior Plumbing and Southern Link. It's available at thepodcastpark.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Nobody's listening. He's the man that knows the cap bonuses and all of that. He's the one that gets you cut. Front office, don't give a word. He's the guy who knows the law. Can't put him against the wall. He's the guy with all the answers. Matt and Chuck are battle dancers. Front office, no tools at all. Run all brought to you by Entry Point Doors and Windows. Are you a top-notch carpenter? Well, Entry Point Doors and Windows is hiring right now. You need to have be somebody who has plenty of experience installing doors and windows, and they got options for you. Medical 401k, access to company, truck, uh, weekly and monthly contests, a signing bonus of $2,000. All you got to do, text your resume, 770-904-0094. That's 770-904-0094. You know what? JC was a carpenter. Yes, he was. Aren't you going to ask me about the OPA? The, the Hopa. Next thing? The Hopa. The Hopa. That's always the next I'm line. a helpless romantic. I have I have a vision maybe tomorrow of you getting married under the Hopa. Hopa. Well, let's start with some college numbers because we did have a lot of fun stuff that happened on Saturday before I transitioned to sad NFL numbers. <laughs> uh, how about this one? So Georgia is now the only team in the last 10 seasons with multiple 20-point wins when trailing at half. I thought that was crazy. I don't know what to make of that, though. That's impressive, but it's also like – doesn't that mean you're a lot better than the opponent? Why are you, why are you trailing Tennessee at the half? Because you're down to Arkansas just slightly. Yeah. You're down Weird. to Tennessee, oddly, and then you blow them both out in the second half. I guess, you know, and, and it's asking a lot, but when you're elite, you want to have two halves where you're like, we're just flat out better, and we're going to dominate you from beginning again. It doesn't always work that way, but that's what you're shooting I for. think that's what you're working towards yeah. with that team of now trying to say that the last team that had this happen to him, you got to go back to 2008. It was a Tulsa team that had been down at half and won a couple of games by 20 points. That's from right. uh, ESPN Stats and Info. Another one that was fun, if you were following along with any of the sites on Saturday. So Ole Miss and Alabama combined for 1,370 yards. Okay? That is a conference record. But it is not a point total record for the conference because the other games that featured higher scores had seven overtime. So in like AM and LSU did their thing, fine. But the yardage totals ended up being a conference. So record. what about regulation points? Uh, for regulation, yeah. it was the most yards and, and uh, I believe the most points. It was the third most points in a game, uh, most in a regular season game. I don't a like, regulation game. I don't want condensed college football schedules. I want as many weeks as I get, but I will tell you this. With SEC football being an example of playing just conference-only opponents week after week. Saturday was kind of an example of how crazy things can get. The A&M Florida thing at noon, right? Uh, Georgia Tennessee at 3:30. LSU uh, battling with Missouri, out with Missouri yeah. in the middle. Late night, you get uh, Alabama and Ole Miss. it was like one after another of just like big-time games and upsets and big moments. It was 
so much fun to watch. And we are now, what, three or four weeks away from the Pac-12 adding their schedule back in so that we'll get those late-night games You're so right. you get more craziness. And you'll get some more uh, games with Big Ten at noon, Big Ten primetime, so you'll get all that. So Elias Sports Bureau, who always has a lot of good information, they just wanted to... It's almost like putting salt in a wound, or maybe you just said, fine, I get it, and they celebrated it. So they had the picture of the Dan Quinn kind of like deuces on the way out of the stadium that he gave to somebody, and they this was a note they had from two weeks ago, and they made sure to put it out again. Earlier this season, the Falcons became the first team to lose two 15-point fourth quarter leads in one season in NFL history. In the last five seasons, the Falcons have lost four games when leading by 10-plus points in the fourth quarter, including the playoffs. Hat tip Elias. Just wanted to remind you as to why this happened yeah. w- with that picture there. there uh, there's so there's so much, and, and again, like when a guy's fired, you can start piling all this stuff up. When the Falcons had a winning record in 2017, I just said he's not a good coach, and I know that because we're all results based. Everything's results based. We'll look past the bad decisions in a win, and we'll look past the good decisions in a loss. Los Dan was just I, I don't think Dan was ever a very good coach. And those numbers you just gave, they weren't good at closing doors on people. They weren't good at adjustments in game. When the rah-rah of Dan wears away, there just wasn't enough substance there. It was I, never there. I, I think that's where I'm, I'm there with you. Once the, the element of excitement of, hey, we're all in this together, well, now it's got to be results-oriented, and the results just weren't there enough. Okay, how about some some cool Todd Gurley numbers? Because those were cool. Todd uh, Todd has been a bright light in this, and he's gotten better and better as the season along. Yesterday, that was there were some flashes. He'll never be Todd of two or three years ago, Los. There were flashes yesterday. So he, he housed one from 35 yep. yards out. Now, check this out. We talked about the one thing you could never question with Todd Gurley, even when the knee isn't right on a given Sunday, he can just find the end zone. That's just what he does. He now has scored 75 touchdowns in his career. He becomes just the fifth player in NFL history to record 75 touchdowns before his 27th birthday. Those guys are Emmitt Smith, Jim Brown, LaDainian Tomlinson, Randy Moss. That's it. Those are the only ones that have scored 75 touchdowns by the time they reach their 27th birthday. Also, this is from NFL Research, too. Most scrimmage TDs by a running back in their first six seasons. LaDainian Tomlinson, 111. Sean Alexander, 100. Emmett Smith had 100. Jim Brown had 81. But then the next grouping, Adrian Peterson, 80. Eric Dickerson, 78. Todd Gurley, 75. It sounds odd to say, but uh, Todd was trending towards a Hall of Fame type career. He's not going to get the longevity. He's not going to be able to sustain, I don't believe. But do consider this. And I know that the bars have all changed, Carlos, for running backs. There's a pretty good chance Todd Gurley is going to be 1,100 yards, 12 to 14 touchdowns. Some okay, I wish they'd throw him the ball more. Some okay uh, catch totals. Like that number, it's going to seem meaningless in a bad year, but he's going to put up really productive running back numbers. NFL Next Gen Stats, again, one of my other favorites on Sunday because as soon as something happens and it's in your game and you see it pop up, you go, wow, that's interesting. So the play DJ Moore made in the second quarter to house that one from 57 yards out, it's a good play by Isaiah Oliver. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh Moore hit a top speed of 21 and a half miles an hour. It was the fastest play of his career. He, that was the difference maker. Oliver topped out at 21.4. Yeah, but he pro- was a split behind, yeah. and he couldn't catch it. That's not the issue to me, though. The issue oh, is positioning how, and everything. Yeah, else. how he yeah. got, got spun around and got to the sideline. That's happened. Uh, I saw the number, and I hope you don't have it here. I don't want to step on you. That was the 27th explosive play the Falcons' defense has given up in five games. You can't win anything, do I mean, that's... You want to make people drive 12 plays, and you're going to go 84 yards on me. Kudos for you for not making a mistake. The Falcons give up chunk, chunk, chunk every game. Well, remember this. We talk about Isaiah Oliver having the opportunity, and this, again, next-gen stats gives you such good information. So check this out. So on that play, Moore gained 54 yards after the catch. So he had a three-yard reception that he then went and put 54 yards beyond that. But here's the thing. NFL next-gen stats basically says, Here's the, where the players are positioned on the field. The probability of him doing this should be this. They got him. He basically had 32 more yards than were expected. He should have been tackled for like a 12-yard, 15-yard gain. He wasn't. Well, and I, so that was the big problem with it. Two things with the Falcon defense has always been clear. Mostly, you know, if I just want to give it to the, the Dan Quinn era. How many times are players wide open? You saw the, the Mike Davis touchdown. Yep. The one, the defender within 10 yards. Or what you just referenced, yards after contact. Poor tackling. Ability not to get uh, people to the ground. It's just, it's a trend that's never improved since Dan's been here. And frankly, I've joked about this because otherwise I'd cry, Los. For most of my 40 years, 
on this planet, the Falcons have always been that type of a defense who is, is living in the 20 to 30 range in the league. Can I give you uh, some stats on the NFL MVP? I'm listening. That would be uh, Russell Wilson. That would be Russell Wilson. I'm glad you went there. Let Russell Wilson. So how about this from ESPN Stats and Info and another one from NFL Research. So Russell Wilson now has 30 game-winning drives since he debuted in 2012. He now passes Matthew Stafford. Here's the other one from NFL Research. The Seahawks are the only team in the Super Bowl era to start 5-0 despite being outgained by their opponents by at least 50 total yards per game. If you've seen their defensive numbers, they're 30 yards worse than the Atlanta Falcons. Correct. Like the Falcons are 31st in total defense. So the Seahawks are 32nd, yet they're 5-0, and and Russell Wilson keeps making things happen. Uh, that's why I had no issue with Zimmer being aggressive and going for the kill. I know a lot of people said take the layup, field goal, go up eight. Well, Russell was going to score from 75 yards out, and then I know you're saying make him go for two. I'm Mike Zimmer. I'm taking the kill shot and not giving the MVP a chance to come back and beat me or at least tie it. I had no issue with that. I'll give you one more note here an uh, NFL uh, research as well. CeeDee Lamb, the Cowboys receiver, has five catches and 81 yards for the Giants. He is the only rookie since at least 1950 with five-plus receptions in each, each of his team's first five games. Yeah, I, he, I, he, did, he just makes plays. I have He's no nice doubt player. about that. Offense is not that team's problem. No, no, they don't stop anybody. The Giants, who couldn't score or move the ball on anybody, put up 34. They're 32nd in, oh. the, off, in, in the entire league in total offense, and yet they can even get up and down the field See, on that. Part of their issue, again, is is a very similar a similar thing to the foul. You hired Mike Nolan. Nolan, yeah. It's, Mike Nolan was awful. washed years ago, and Mike McCarthy's got a relationship, a friendship with him. It's a horrible hire. You know the fun part about that game? This was the Mike Nolan game of, I'm going to move down to the sideline so that I can call the game from there. That's always that, that, that that's the step yes. before. Uh-huh. Okay, sorry, we're taking the play calling job away from you. There's a whole line of progress. You're so right. I'm going to go get a better view upstairs. I'm gonna, it's not going to change anything. Hey, let me tell you how this works. Like it's in, not your view. In, in radio, when something doesn't work out, we go, oh, we just need another producer. And then when nothing works out there, then it's like, oh, what's the next one you got to play? <laughs> how about it's, he hasn't been a good – I didn't think he, he was been a, very a coach good, for a while. I didn't think he was a good head coach. Nope. I didn't think he was a good DC here and a lot of other places. And I just I didn't understand that hire. All right, uh, coming up in 20 minutes, we will give away a four pack of Braves NLCS watch party for tomorrow. Parking pass included. If you can tell us what sucked the most from the uh, football weekend, we'll do that in 20 minutes. Coming up next, though, Los has watched every Dodgers game this postseason. I watched an episode of Cheers. Andy watched an episode of Cheers, but just one that year. He'll tell you where L.A. is vulnerable the most and why Sam and Diane could never really make that relationship work. We'll talk about both those things. We're live at Truist Park in the Braves dugout. That's next.
Um, good afternoon, I'm Carlos Medina. Up to the minute traffic is coming up. The Atlanta Braves and the LA Dodgers begin the National League Championship Series tonight out in Arlington, Texas at Globe Life Park. Game one is gonna feature Walker Bueller on the mound for the Dodgers. He'll be opposed by Max Freed of the Braves. First pitch is set for just after eight o'clock tonight. Your fourth pregame begins right here on the fan and the app at 6.50. This update is also brought to you by Bruce Hagen. This is Bruce Hagen, the people's lawyer. If you get hurt, you need to call me, 404-522-7553, hagen-law.com, for personal service on your personal injury case. The Atlanta Falcons have elevated defensive coordinator Raheem Morris to interim head coach as the team fired Dan Quinn and general manager Thomas Dimitrov last night. The team is 0-5 to start the season. This is your home for the Atlanta Braves. This is The Fan, 680 and 93.7 FM. He gives you a 680 up to the minute traffic. GNG.com is my out. Office. Here's the latest on right. p.m. hour is brought to you by South Point Financial Services. Find out more at spfs.com. So again, we'll play a round of that. Sucked in 10 minutes. We get you ready for the Braves and the Dodgers. Game one of the NLCS comes your way tonight on the fan with pregame at 6.50. First pitch at 8.08. It's Max Freed against Walker Bueller. Let's go. Braves have a chance to <laughs> steal game one if Freed can do some Freedy type things. We'll see what the bats can do I to agree. get things rolling. Now, speaking of the, <laughs> it's one of those Mondays, man. There's just there's not enough time. It's a monster Monday. It is a what's well, a monster week, and I'm I'm glad you brought that up, Los. All fueled <laughs> by Monster Energy Drink and their new Monster Energy Drink. That uh, once I find that copy, I'll tell you more How about. about the oh, here it is. Monster Energy Ultra Watermelon when fueling <laughs> up for the NLCS and the Dogs That's and the Tide right. or the Jackets and the Tigers this week. Try the brand new Ultra Watermelon. Zero sugar and tastes like summertime in a can. Now available in all Atlanta Quick Trip locations. Well, I mean, if you had it, why not just do it all the time? I, did, I, do it. All right. I think the giant fan blew it over towards me. <laughs> There's actually a fan, not just some guy watching us. Uh, but between the Dan Quinn decision last night, Georgia's win over Tennessee. We get ready for Georgia-Bama. All these playoff games, it's just it's a, it's a crazy time. All right, uh, in the meantime, Los, who has just buku amount of hours in the day to watch all these games, was watching every Dodgers playoff game, and he has diagnosed a formula for beating the Dodgers. I am a weirdo because every single time the Braves would play the noon or 2 o'clock game, mm -hmm. I then knew, hey, 8, 9, 10 o'clock, I'm going to see the Dodgers play blank, and in this case, ended up being the Padres. Uh, that they were able to match up with in the latest round. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, Matt. This is going to be tough. Yeah, they're the better team. They are the better team. As, as I joked around in the opening hour, when their lineup goes league MVP, mm -hmm. former All-Star, former All-Star, former All-Star, catcher, former league MVP. That's their top six. Oh, by the way, the catcher went off in yeah. the NLDS as well, Will Smith. Yeah, Will Smith yeah. got it going. So that's that's what you see. The back end of the lineup is when you go, Oh, look, they threw a Jock Peterson over there who's obviously had monster homer years in the past. He's kind of their version of, an, of actually, Austin Riley's our version. We hope that he gets to swing the bat like that. They can mix and match yeah. so much. Now, they stay pretty consistent with their lineup in sure the did. DS. But in years past, we have, we've seen this where it's Chris Taylor, Max Muncy, Jock Peterson, um, 
I mean, they just, they've had so many different options from the left and right side. This year, they've been a little more consistent with their lineup. But I'm going to give you the areas where I, I think you do have a Braves advantage. And okay. it's going to start tonight. So I've been following this whole Bueller situation with the blisters. And, and for the last two weeks, I've been like, man, he's been dealing with blisters. They keep showing him in these games where he's right now putting, like, some sort of epoxy or super glue or something like that. Remember how in, in years past you'd be like, oh, those guys, they put super glue on their fingers because they got to they gotta save that cut. Remember, Max Freed had an issue with blisters for a minute. Okay, he's got the same thing going right now. And so when you see him have the pitch counts get elevated, you see him go to the dugout or you see him on the mound messing with those fingers. I think for a game one, if there's a recipe for beating this ball club, it's going to have to be this you got to make him work in those first four or five innings because those blisters will open up on him. They've opened up in every single game. That's why when you looked at uh, some of his previous outings when I'm going, why is he out after four? That's it. The, he was not being strained. No. He was not being pushed around or anything else. The blisters were getting to him. Now, they are affecting him because there are higher pitch counts. Yep. He's still getting the strikeouts. The The stuff is still electric, but he's, he's missed at times, which runs up his pitch count. I don't know what it'll mean, but the Braves saw him in game three. A couple of years ago, that's the Acuna. That's Acuna uh, Grand Slam Grand Slam. And it was some wildness from Walker Bueller. Now, that was his first postseason start. And remember, it's on the road. This place in Truist is going nuts. So there is some of that. And you're right. Like, that throws off. If, for whatever reason, Walker Bueller can't go more than three and a third or four, whatever it is. Now, all of a sudden, they got to dip into it. Do they make the Dustin May call early? Because all of a sudden, he's been the guy bridging the gap to the later parts of the ballgame. Los, the other thing they do have, because they have more depth, though, is... They can make a, a Tony Gonsolid decision. They can make a you know a Urias decision. They can do those things to bridge the gap to the back end of their pen. They don't want to have to do that in game one, but that's an option for them. And that's my second vulnerability. They are really good from innings five through seven. Like five through seven, they're every part the team that the Atlanta Braves are. But the Braves are a different team in the eighth and ninth, and that's where there is some vulnerability for the Dodgers. The, the two games where the Padres made like the biggest run at them – they were late. We're talking seventh inning and beyond where they got in that pen. It wasn't just getting after Jansen. They were hitting and getting walks off of key guys. Like they, they were making things happen. And so the back end of their bullpen, I think, provides a significant advantage over what you're going to see with the Atlanta Braves. I, I would agree. Again, Dodgers are good. What you see with the Atlanta Braves. Dodgers are good pen. Yeah, right? they're, no, they're a good pen. Uh, Braves just, are better, though. Yeah. Like, if you're looking for advantages, Braves have a good offense. Dodgers a little better. Dodgers have significant advantages in the starting pitching. I think the Braves' bullpen is better because of the Kenley Jansen question. Yes. And right now it's a question. They had to yank him out of a game for Joe Kelly against the Padres. And yesterday, Dave Roberts was very clear. He's like, I'm not sure what my ninth inning decision. I think the game, in other words, if it's a one-run game, I don't know that Kenley gets the ball. Well, and, and that last outing by Joe Kelly, he was not good. Like, he survived the inning. He survived the onslaught by the Padres, and he was fortunate to get out of that. And so that's another thing. Joe Kelly has not been to a typical no. Joe Kelly of, of the past. Joe Kelly's well. the guy who can run it up at 99. Yeah. Sometimes doesn't know where it's going. Exactly. Sometimes just doesn't know. And, and here's my last significant advantage for the Atlanta Braves that jumps out to me. There is no Hyunjin Ryu. They can't who's, a, who's a Braves killer? He can't touch him. Braves killer. Yes, every single time he's oh. taking the ball against the Braves. Do you remember that game one that was seven innings and it went by in about ten minutes yeah, later he dominated the You had the Braves. no chance. And then as he moved on, you still haven't been able to hit him. So when you talk about a Dodger team, this is much more – of power pitching baseball and i think outside of trevor bauer we saw what bauer did in his lineup and that was a very impressive but this team has been pretty good as you've had in the past against some of the power pitchers out there a couple of things about that the dodgers to their credit they will make pitchers work as much as we'd all love to see freed and ian in game one and game two take you to the sixth i think even if they're you know you, you want to see them dance or you know through some raindrops because they're gonna have base runners the dodgers put people on base a lot if they can get through five or even four and a third, four and two thirds, and you feel like there's some trouble coming, you know what the Braves can do with mixing and matching in the bullpen. Conversely, the Braves have to make Walker Bueller tonight, and we'll see about Kershaw tomorrow, work those pitch counts. The, the Braves have had times where you look up in the third inning and the opposing pitcher, you know, he's at 34 pitches. He's economical, and that can be a big issue. I'll give you two guys to watch, Los. You need a moment out of Austin, Yep. and you need a moment out of Duvall. Neither guy is going to make enough contact at times because they're, I mean, they're, they're strikeout, high strikeout. You need a moment from one of those two guys. I expect a lot of moments from my one, two, three. <laughs> Darno spoiled me as well, hitting cleanup in the four. <laughs> I can't get that. But at the bottom of that order, I got to get something, anything, a moment somewhere in this series from Duvall and Riley to have a chance to steal the series. The biggest difference in the series with the Reds and then with the Marlins, both of those lineups you felt by the time you, especially with the Marlins, 
by the time you got past the fifth place hitter, right. you were good for the next four. There same wasn't thing with the Reds. Worse. Yeah, same thing. You felt very comfortable as you got into six, seven, eight. That's not going to be the case with Ooh, this lineup. They have Chris Taylor hitting ninth. Yes. Chris I mean, Taylor can have one of those games. Will Smith can have one of those games. They, they are so loaded yeah. the way you are. And they so sh- loaded. Here's the, they should be. They spend enough to be loaded. Yes. There's a reason that team doesn't have a hole. They spend <laughs> enough to not have any holes. And when there is a hole, you know what they do? Patch it with more money. They actually went out, traded for Mookie Betts. And as everyone said, well, that's just a one-year rental. Then they said, how about $300 million? Yes. And uh, no longer is it a rental. You're now here. There's a lot of those guys where they've, they've spent the money to make sure they won't have any holes. But because of how you've built, this is the closest you've been right. to looking like a Dodger lineup than you had in the last five years. The one frustrating part of this, and this happens to everybody with the injuries. Carlos, I'm dead serious. If, if you told me the Braves had a healthy Soroka and Hamels, I think they're either even or a favorite in the series. Like, lineup game one through four. Now, I don't know how the Ian thing would have gone because if you were healthy, you might not have brought it. You might not have brought it. But if you tell me that I would have had, imagine game one, two, and three where I had Soroka, Freed, let's say Hamels in some alternative world where he was healthy, then an Ian in game four. All of a sudden I'm like, oh, my God, I feel like combined with that pen in this offense, that's the National League favorite. You don't. That's why the Dodgers are a substantial favorite in the series. I love the idea of you've got right now the better pitcher when it comes to Freed and Bueller because of Bueller's blisters. That's the only reason I bring I, that I, up. It's because, even otherwise, but yeah. And, and you, Max, I, Lowe's, Max is coming off a very pedestrian start. I don't want to jinx it. or sp- But he I, typically bounces back. I don't expect yeah. that again tonight. And I will say this as well. You have one of the hottest pitchers in all of Major League Baseball going right now, in Ian Anderson. Who is untouchable Who is, who is yeah. freaky right now. And so we've seen this before, and you brought up some of the, the, the Braves teams of the past that have been better, that have been a betting favorite, oh, and yeah. yet you lose because you ran into the hot guy, the hot pitcher, the hot team. I think that you can hope that you end up having that, that hot one-two that can, that can ride you through this. I think we would all agree, right? Dodgers are better, but this is not some insurmountable no, no. Uh, mountain to climb. You can win this series. Yeah. Now, you, you got to play really well. you got to avoid the pitfalls of, like, we look up and Ozuna's two for 18 or something. You can win this series. There is no question. I think tonight, well, every game one is critical, and that's obvious. <laughs> the Dodgers can fall down 0-1 and still feel like we have Kershaw. We're fine. They've been here. I think the Braves, if they get game one with Freed, and you know that – at worst, you're getting out of those first two with a split. Now we're going to start getting to the middle of the series where the pitching sort of dips a little and we can take advantage of our depth with the bullpen. Maybe there's the advantage. You're flying to Arlington at that point. Oh, I'm just saying, doctor. You, get, you get a game oh, one tonight. Doctor. I'm, I'm going to start texting you tonight and being like, what's the flight? What's oh, the I'm, flight time? Listen, I'm checking off airfare. I've got airfare. I, I'd like to thank one of the, uh, the airlines for just emailing me. You didn't book your trip yet. Let me tell you, there were good seats available in that stadium. For even seventy-five dollars, like tell secondary me when, market. Tell me when you can get into a National League Championship Series at that kind of price it, with a team that you want to watch. And uh, eleven thousand five hundred fans will be in the building. I think you'll have a lot of Braves fans. That's a that's a Braves country type of you know Houston, Dallas. There's a lot of Braves yeah, fans. How do you think I watched all those games growing up? Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Reminder about the Small Business Spotlight. We do it each and every week where we reach out and let some of the great small business folks tell us how their business has been affected by the change in our world over the last seven or eight months. And so many great Atlanta businesses have done incredible work. We call it the Small Business Spotlight. It's presented by Georgia Primary Bank, your community, your bank. For more, go to georgiaprimarybank.com. Three receivers to the near side, one to the far side. Dobbs in the shotgun. Bringing you the best. Only a three-man rush and not much of one. He's got all day to throw, throws to the end zone. Here it is in the end zone, and it is... And not so good moments from the weekend. Caught! I don't believe it. Unbelievable. Yeah, that one's Touchdown, Tennessee wins. It's time for That Sucked. All right, so uh, there is a lot of good each weekend, but we tend to want to ignore that because we're negative by nature. We work in sports talk radio, and we give you a full segment and a platform to tell us what sucked most about the football or sports weekend in general, and we pay it off for you. We'll get your calls at 404-231-1680. I've got a four-pack of watching and viewing party tickets here tomorrow at uh, Truist. With a parking pass for the best example of that sucked. Los will have a choice. I'll have one. Hoyt, is our buddy Dan Matthews still hanging with us? Yeah. I'm here. I'm here. All right, DM. Dan will have you one as well. Suck. Chuck, Chuck oh, is so mean to him. He's just so cruel to Dan. All right. I might have to give him a punch right to the stomach. Yeah, Inziguri kick would do it. 404 231 168. If you want to jump aboard to tell us what sucked, I have one that. I know somebody's going to get just based on the weekend and how angry people were over this moment. Let's see if uh, these guys are on the same page with us. Blue. Who, me? <laughs> Not you, <laughs> Baloo. Baloo is on the fan with uh, Chuck and Chernoff. Blue, what sucked from hey the uh, football weekend? Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my phone call. Yeah. 
Uh, Dak Prescott ankle going the wrong way. That uh, sucks. Yeah. Also, also I wanted to say uh, the uh, miss uh, chance to say what up, Chuck, because uh, the refs blew a call against Arkansas. <laughs> Thanks for taking the phone call. It would have been two weeks in a row of just painful defeats. I had two. The first one was, yes, my quarterback having his foot pointing the wrong direction. Yeah. My next one was, man, if you're Arkansas, how upset should you be? I don't know how you deal with that. Oh, because like, as soon as that play happened, I turned around to my wife and I said, even if, even if it's not a fumble, right. it's still grounding. It's it's something that, that should have been backed up. I mean, and it seemed clear. It's, yes. Like, I don't know how it was nothing at all. The uh, Dak, and, and again, I was seeing some of the screenshots after the live, because you went right to Twitter and everybody's timeline was heartbreaking. Yep. Dak, it was just... And then to see his, his foot. I don't remember too many times surgery happening the night of an injury. That tells you how like quickly doctors are like, we got to take care of this. Usually they let the swelling go down to the next day. They didn't do that here. The last one I remember, if you remember Moise Alou, when he did that at second base sliding, and all he did, as soon as it popped the wrong direction, he just looks over at the dugout and motions like, you got to come get me over here. Yeah. That was the last one I remember where I went, oh, God, that looks awful. Tyler's on the fan with Chuck and Chernoff. Tyler, what sucked from the uh, weekend? Yeah, it has to be reading Arthur Blank's message to the fan base where he admitted that the shift's been going the wrong way for three and a half years, and he just finally made the decision. Appreciate the phone call. Yeah, Arthur sent out last night before the, the public statement, he sent out a letter to the, uh, the partners, to season ticket holders, to Falcons, you know, relationships with the franchise, and it was, I mean, the message that has been the same now for I don't know, two and a half, three seasons doesn't make anybody feel better. The timing... I mean, the timing should have been a year ago that this happened. Uh, ben is on the fan with Chuck and Chernoff. Ben, what sucked from your uh, weekend? Well, what sucked was Bo took my that suck, but uh, Bo next fumbling the ball there, and they called it an incomplete pass, and that sucked for Arkansas. Yeah, man, I feel for you. There, there, it wasn't nothing. What a job by Pittman, though. Yeah. I've been really impressed. The way they play Georgia, the win, and then just on the doorstep of another one was. It's been impressive. Just a lot. It's like what we joked around about, we say about with the Falcons. They're just more disciplined. They're not yeah. that much more talented. They're, they're just, they play their game, and they, they stick to it, and, and they're able to play good football. Yeah, Carolina is an example of a very average, talented team who you can see is well-prepared, well-coached, and they're 3-2. And, and that Barry Odom hire, maybe one of the bigger ones in, in all the SEC. Yeah, He's got quietly. the playing defense, yeah. yeah. Uh, Tim is on the fan with Chuck and Chernoff. Tim, what sucked from your uh, weekend? Go, Tim. He's listening on the radio. All right. Tim is gone. We'll go to another Tim. Bye, Tim. <laughs> Who's with Chuck and Charles? He's just now hearing that. <laughs> I guess so. Tim, what sucked? Hang up. All right. Two Tims. We're 0 for 2 on the Tims. Let's try Kevin on the fan with Chuck and Charles. Kevin, what sucked from your sports weekend? Well, as a Georgia fan, it was glorious with the gift that keeps on giving as Jared Garen turnover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the second half was plentiful of the turnovers there's no question eric is on the fan with chuck and Chernoff. eric what sucked from your sports weekend uh yeah as a georgia fan realizing that my most talented player on offense is essentially a second grader when it comes to maturity <laughs> i mean that's no, true put him in the he's in the clubhouse as the leader it's, it's true i've seen a lot of immature dumb things but george pickens like to hear kirby talk about it after the game that is what a seven-year-old does to another seven-year-old at the birthday party i got a water bottle i'm gonna spray you it's true. All, everything you just said there, absolutely 100% true. The most talented player on that offense is also a two-year-old. I do like that uh, Hoyt tweeted just minutes before. I know people like to give uh, George Pickens grief, so I'll call him selfish. He just made a couple of great blocks, and then four seconds later he sprayed a water bottle oh, at a, it's, an opponent. It's what sideline. happens. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's that devil issue. You it just is. know it's like everything's going great, and then he does something, and you go, oh, my God. Uh, Troy is on the fan with Chuck and Chernoff. Troy, what sucked from your uh, sports weekend? As I've said, the the uh, devastating leg injury to Dak took away from a great leg injury story in Alex Smith. That's yeah, how, sure did. How and, and that's a great point, right? So the day Alex returns in a game that, frankly, none of us thought would ever happen, where Alex was back and his family, the emotions in the stands, and then just hours later, you flip flop and it's Dak. And I think that's unfortunate too, because the, everyone who has commented on the injury say it's four to six months and you're back out on the football field. Alex Smith almost lost the leg, Correct. could have killed him, and then had to go through, what, how many different surgeries? So there's a point, and, and ESPN did an E60 e or one of their shows on this. I mean, he had, a, he had legitimate infection Yeah, where he, like they dug into his leg. I mean, he almost lost his leg and then almost 
could have died. Yeah, the way I mean, it's it a very serious thing to, to see him back on a football field. Good for him. All right, let's go around the room before we pick a winner. Uh, I will start with Mr. Lois. Besides Dak, what was your other? I also had what happened to Arkansas. Okay. I, I thought that was not cool if you're an SEC football fan. Dan Matthews? I'm going to go you with LSU. your job. You should be fired. <laughs> Chuck, well, no, and he, you know what? Chuck's on to something because Bo Pelini, he sucks at his job. 586 yards of total offense given up to by Missouri, they a so freshman bad. quarterback who wasn't even their starter. Throws for over 400 yards. Oh, and by the way, you 0 the for ball. 10 on third down. You also had the ball at the one-yard line. With yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. awesome. And oh you couldn't God. get in. I, I was staring at that game. Just Okay, first off, the point totals kept jumping, and you're like, okay, that's insane. But by the time they make the pass down to the, uh, the the left end zone, I go, all right, they're going to score yeah. here. The game's over. I almost was wondering why Missouri wasn't calling timeouts to save some clock. I stopped looking. I turned back around, and there's the game ending right yeah. there on the deflection from the cornerback. I was like, how? Oh, my God. I will say this to Dan. Happen? Your tone is a little much considering you just want a natty. I know See, you're frustrated, I'm, but I, I, I'm sorry. Everybody's telling me that, but it's eh. like it, it, you get the taste of it. You want to keep going. But you got a taste. Yeah, uh, Matt doesn't have any taste. I have no taste. He I, doesn't remember. I have, I have no smell. I have no taste. It was like baby food to him. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. I was going to do the Dak thing, but also Tony Romo sucked this weekend. (laughs) His leg is at a 90-degree angle, and Tony goes, I think it might just be a cramp. Let's hope for the best. We we explained to him that they're looking at the field. They can't see. uh, And There's a monitor right next to you, baby boy. This happened when Soroka tore his Achilles. Like Everyone's like, oh, hopefully it's a strain. I think you're just hoping for the best. You know it's You're not going to go, oh, my God, his leg just exploded. And he's dead. I don't think you're going to hear that up in the booth. (laughs) Well, there goes his career. They're not going to do that. That. I'm going to give you the elephant in the room. The hell is CBS 46 doing? Yeah. I'm sorry. I know how important weather coverage is. I've lived in Atlanta my whole life. I've, I've been through a million uh, tornado watches and warnings. They're vitally important. Here's my advice to CBS 46, and, and I know a lot of those people. Double box, baby. Small box on the weather. Scroll on the bottom of the screen. Don't take away the game on a fourth and one. And let me just speak for everybody watching that game. There could be a tornado in my living room. I would wait till the fourth and one play before I run to the basement. I'd be like a cow in the movie Twister. I would be yep. spinning in my living room. I'm not trying to deny the importance of the weather. I'm telling you, small box on the weather, big box on the game, scroll on the bottom. It's 2020. That's not the only way I'm getting my weather. Thank you. Can I can I give you my little tip on this one? Mm-hmm. I just want everybody to ponder this for a moment. Just the Cause, tip. Because, again, there's no FCC violation or anything for not doing weather coverage. That's not how that works. Let me just give you a little hint. Notice how those break-ins never happen during commercial breaks. Oh, odd, isn't it? Isn't that so weird? Hey, and oh, by the way, you have a digital platform, and, and give Channel 2 credit. They did their weather before Clemson, Miami, and then they said his kickoff approach, we're going to bump over to our digital here, and if anything happens, we'll have a scroll. There's a right way to do it, and I know they get very defensive, and it's important, lives are at stake. There is a way to, to play to both crowds. Nobody's arguing what's important and what's not just, you, you, you know why they on. don't. You know why they don't break in to commercial breaks? Because then you've got to write checks back. I don't. I, like, I'm not. That's, that's why it doesn't happen. I mean, I mean, I'm loyal to my friends at Fox. I that, get it. That wouldn't I, happen. I, I know Fox. the game. I know how it plays. But that's why I was like, "Come on, guys! Y'all, y'all know everyone's going to get upset." All right, about let's that. go over these choices. Blue gave us the uh, DAC injury and didn't have a chance to tell Chuck what up. Uh, Tyler didn't like Arthur Blank's email. Ben mentioned the uh, fumble in the Auburn game. Uh, Kevin brought up the uh, Guarantano turnovers. Uh, Eric had the George Pickens as a child, and uh, Tony, or excuse me, Troy gave us DAC and uh, Alex Smith returning. I like, I like that one. What, what could have been a great day to just say what an unbelievable job and perseverance and a return of, of Dak, or excuse me, of Alex, then you get the Dak. Kind of was that that sucked with something good. Yeah. Like, I'm glad Alex Smith got back on the field. Yep, agreed. But at the same time, you're right, the Dak injury made that completely it got lost. way, way yeah. in the backstory. Troy, you're going to go check out game two tomorrow. We've got these NLCS viewing party tickets. Game watch parties are happening here for every game at Truist Park. You can go to the Braves' uh, website to find out more. All different sections you can sit in, including on the field, suites, all around the ballpark. Game two, you'll be enjoying those, and I know a lot of folks are going to be enjoying game one here the same way tonight with a viewing experience here at uh, SunTrust, or excuse me, at uh, Truist, as uh, people will be enjoying playoff baseball. All right, coming up next, the next Falcons coach will have to fit two, or excuse me, one of two profiles. Oh, that's a black guy. All right, maybe three profiles then. <laughs> hadn't, hadn't thought about that one, actually. <laughs> because this Falcon job is one of the most unique in the NFL. We'll tell you why.
I'm Carlos Medina. Up to the minute traffic is coming up. The Atlanta Braves, the LA Dodgers will open up the National League Championship Series tonight at Globe Life Park from Arlington, Texas. Game one will feature Walker Bueller on the mound for the Dodgers against Max Freed. First pitch is set for just after eight o'clock tonight. Fourth pregame begins right here on the fan and the fan app at 6.50. The Atlanta Falcons have decided to elevate their defensive coordinator Raheem Morris to interim head coach as the team fired Dan Quinn and general manager Thomas Dimitrov last night. The team is 0-5 to start the year. This update is also brought to you by Convenient Real Estate Solutions. Do you need to sell your burdensome property or home in 30 days or sooner? Simply give Convenient Real Estate Solutions a call today at 770-299-2290 or visit our website to get a free, fair cash offer in 24 hours or less at convenientrealestatesolutions.com. This is The Fan, 680 and 93.7 FM. Clearly brought to you by Napa. In case you didn't pay attention, Chuck and Chernoff live at Truist Park. We're in the Braves dugout. I'm sorry, I'm out of the camera shot. I'm moving, I'm shaking. Los is doing that. Los is in for the king. I like to move around. It's a beautiful day. Uh, a lot of people are going to be here tonight for the game one viewing party inside Truist as the Braves and the Dodgers will get it going at 8.08. Your coverage on the fan at 6.50. Remember the fan app, I hope. You have that downloaded. Get away from me. You're making me very uncomfortable. Hope you have your uh, fan app downloaded so you can keep up with not only pregame, in-game, post-game, all of the activity. We're going to be all over the battery this week as we uh, dress up a lot of the fun for Braves and Dodgers. It's also Monster Week here on the fan. <gasps> Fueled by Monster Energy Ultra Watermelon. When fueling up for any of the big games like Georgia Bama or Georgia Tech Clemson, try the brand new Ultra Watermelon. Zero sugar, tastes like summertime in a can. Now available in all Atlanta Quick Trip locations. We will get Buck in his one shining moment here in just a few lows. I always think the Falcons, <laughs> the timing, they get very lucky, right? Braves are in the middle of this great stretch and they're about to begin the championship series. Don't look over here. Georgia just finishes a uh, nice comeback against Tennessee. Bama's coming. Georgia Tech, Clemson, and oh, by the way, Sunday night, which they didn't want to make the decision, or not the decision, the announcement last night, but the Athletic and Jeff Schultz did a very good job of beating them to the punch after the game yesterday. So Dan Quinn gone, Thomas Dimitrov gone. They can't begin a coaching search right now, but I'm sure they're already starting to discuss, talk about, look at names, both GMs and head coaches. Well, what happens is you, you hire a firm, and that firm then does all the background work firm. as far as making sure that – you know, a, a guy is uh, is who he says he is and where he's been and, and, and find all that stuff out. But listen, it's gotten other people before when yeah. they said something on their resume that oh, didn't work. Yeah, sure. So, but I think there's two player or two types of coaches at profile for this job. One, there's the 50 year old guy who's been passed over in this NFL. Think of an Eric Bieniemy, where uh, he's got as of one of the more dynamic, interesting offenses that he and Andy Reid. Uh, plot, plot and plan for every single week. They're very creative, but he's missed on opportunities that he probably should have been. He should, probably should have landed. Let me ask you about the enemy for a second, and we'll talk more about this next hour. I come with a opinion that I know a lot less about Eric Bieniemy than I'm hearing. He's never called a play, right? Like, and I'm not I'm not saying that ultimately defines him. John Harbaugh went from a special teams coach, but the way people talk about Bieniemy is almost a that's a lock. If it's me, and I and I've sort of gotten obsessed with this notion, give me a Joe Brady over an Eric Bieniemy, and that won't be as popular maybe in some circles. I'm watching Joe Brady call plays at the NFL level. He worked with Sean Payton at New Orleans. He put together a pass offense like no other at LSU. Those credentials intrigue me, and I'm not saying Bieniemy won't be a great coach. I'm just coming from a place of more unknown than I'm hearing. I don't think you can get Joe Brady, and here's why. You have such tremendous cap issues over the next couple of seasons that I think you have to present 
here's the only opportunity you may get to coach in the next couple of years if you want. Here's where I'll disagree. If you are 3-13 and 13 and you have the number one pick, you're sure as hell going to get whoever you – Joe Brady's going to go, oh, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, I'm in. Like, sure. If your draft pick is that bad, and you're not wrong about the salary thing, but I have come around through the years of if these teams want to make the salary cap thing work, even in, in a way that it pushes money and moves, they will. And I know this is an extre- extreme example. I don't worry about that as much as maybe I used to. Let me tell you this, and this is where I would I would beg for you to reconsider this. This is a league that's actually dropping significant amounts of cap space. Sure. We're going from 198 yep. to probably right around 175. Which is not something we've never experienced before. Never. That's never yeah. happened. We've had we've had one year in 2010 where the cap was frozen, and that was it, where it right. stayed at the number from the previous year. It's always moved up. This is what's going to happen this year. And so if I'm Joe Brady and I got options, I don't want to go to a team where, yes, I get to pick my quarterback, and right. that's, that's, that's the biggest incentive. The problem ends up being is that for the next two years – you're going to tell me in a $175 million cap league, I have to play at 145. Which, and now, a lot of teams are going to play at a lesser number, but you're not wrong. Well, but that's what I'm saying. They're, they're unless, not, unless the league sort of no, know, Matt, plays Matt, with this what, a little what bit. I'm telling you is that moving off your roster, Matt Ryan sure. or Julio Jones over the next two years, basically is going to pull $35 million of cap space off of, off of your salary cap. I, what I'm telling you is I just don't subscribe to this. He won't take that job thing. I don't, live, I don't, I don't think that's real. Because what are the other options available? Maybe it's Houston. Maybe it's you. Now, they have, a, they have an answer at quarterback, which I think everybody likes. I look at the rest of their roster, and I'm not as impressed as I would be. Again, the Falcon roster compared to theirs is not all that different, in, with exception of a few pieces. I, I just don't subscribe to he wouldn't come. I, I, I think that there's something to what Thomas Dimitrov has done since 2008. you got to give him credit for. The stigma of they won't play here, they won't sign here, they won't coach here. Like Bill Parcells looked at it and said, I'm going to use you to leverage money, and then Correct. I'm going to go to Miami. He did that, yep. This is now a place where you can go, man, they got good ownership. Yep. they got a good facility. They've got good, typically, general manager, a guy who was two-time general manager of the year. So it's a better situation. But because of the cap ramifications out there, I think you're either going to have to go older and passed over or even younger than a Joe Brady and say, here's your opportunity to do it here. I'm going to, again, we'll get into this more next hour, but I think there are four or five offensive candidates that are interesting. And I say offensive. I don't want to go defensive. No, like, we're, we're done there. Well, it's not even just you're done there. If you find a dynamic play caller, the only way you keep him is if he's the guy in charge. Somebody's taking him from you. Matt Rule's going to figure that out very quickly in Carolina. It's just hard to replicate really special play callers, whether they're 58 or 48 or 38. It's just very hard to keep them. The 4 o'clock hour of our program is brought to you by South Point Financial Services. Find out more at SPFS.com. <laughs> It's now time to see what Buck brought to the show. It's Buck's best line of the day. One shine and more. Let's get Chernoff in here. So, yeah, what would you think about that Auburn-Arkansas ending? <laughs> That's okay. We can hear you in the oh, background. They'll turn you up here in a second. <laughs> Uh, no, they can't hear you. <laughs> Brought to you by the Pecan Growers of Georgia. You'll know they're Georgia pecans when you see the Georgia Grown logo on the bag. I produced that. Well, listen, the best in live radio, it happens every afternoon with Buck and Hutt. It's unintentional comedy at times. <laughs> one to three on the fan. All right, coming up next, I'll share one very important number. Six. All right, then two very important numbers. 13. Ah, hell. How are you going to make those important? That will affect the Braves' chances of getting to a World Series. One. <laughs> Plus the strangest part of the Falcons' plan moving forward. 15. <laughs> We're live at Truist Park. We're in the Braves' dugout. All that's next.
Dodgers at 8.08 tonight. All the action right here on the fan, on your fan app. If you have still not downloaded it, I don't know what you're waiting for. Have it right there on your phone to take with you both pregame, in-game, and postgame. We're live at Truist Park in the Braves dugout. You can watch us on the 6.8 of the Fan YouTube channel. Carlos is in for the king. I'm getting my butt examined. Chuck is getting his... Yes, he'll that, be back tomorrow. It's happened to all of us. So uh, a couple of things, uh, Low. So game one tonight, 8.08. We know games two and three will be at 6.05. Don't ask me why. Tomorrow and on Wednesday, the Rays and the Astros will get 8.40 both of those nights. Again, don't ask. I don't know. I have a theory. Okay. I think they are trying to avoid – because we would say this is the premier series. Of course it is. Uh, the two markets, everything else. I think they're trying to avoid the football games. That's my only guess because of you're, what happened with the NBA Finals. Okay, you're not only wrong. Guess. But what I would say is – there's a Tuesday night makeup game. Yep. But when you put LA Atlanta on at six, what you're saying to the LA audience is it's a three. You're not right. going to have you're as watching many, them at three. It's the second yeah. biggest media market in America behind New York. I get you. I'm you're not going to have as many eyes there, but you're not wrong with what that, you're that's saying. That's the only thing I can think it's of. It's flawed thinking. Yeah. The, you're not going to beat the NFL no matter. You could play it one o'clock, eight o'clock, 12 o'clock. It's just weird the way they did I it. I think they they looked at it and they said, let's take our, our Rays and Astros series and we'll put that just, up against the league. And at least we're clear. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the could, only thing that makes sense. Could be. Uh, a couple of things about game one. Here's the obvious statement of the year. It's vitally important for the Braves. Somebody in L.A. is going, it's vitally important for the Dodgers. Not as much. The Dodgers, they're the more talented team. It's not a gross mismatch, but they're the, the more talented team. They have better and deeper starting pitching. They're a better offense, not by a ton, but better, more diverse. Braves have a better bullpen. There's their advantage. But, Los, what I would say to you is if the Braves lose game one and they're facing Kershaw, staring down that barrel of a potentially 0-2 with the middle of this series favoring the Dodgers because the Braves in game three will turn to Kyle, who's been good, but that's a lot of pressure to say, kid, 0-2, go save us. And then game four and five could both be bullpen scenarios. I think tonight is vitally important. I think the Braves cannot trail in this series. I think they have to play it even 1-1, be up 2-1. They're not coming back down 2-1. They're not coming back down 3-1. The Dodgers are just too good. That's not uh, hurling an insult at the Braves. That's a compliment to L.A. No, they're they're the best team in the National League. They've they've been that all year long. There was no doubt when they were going out. And by, and by win percentage, if we had played 162, look what they would have done right. to the rest of the league. So acknowledging what it is. But you have your shot, and you have the ability. It's not like 2018 where we brought up some of the numbers from before. You didn't have the firepower to play with them. Uh, their pitching was significantly ahead of yours, and they should be because they were in year, what, six of their Correct. Of, of their window. And for what more perspective, we'll do that in about 20 minutes, give you an idea just where these teams are and maybe the gap being closed a little bit. There's a better shot. When I say the Dodgers are a deeper and more diverse lineup, Braves are very good. Sometimes the Braves can be all too dependent on the home run. The Dodgers played in Globe Life, where the Braves will play tonight in Arlington, in the series against the Padres. Padres. And they scored 23 runs in their three-game sweep. 22 of those runs came without a home run. They only hit one long ball in the series, and everybody talks about Globe Life, big ballpark. Instead of a home run park, it's a doubles. It's a you know a big power alley park. The Dodgers can do a lot of different things, including forcing pitch counts up. They do a good job of working pitchers. The thing that jumps out to me about that series from watching every pitch in it they were really good about ball in the gap, score two runs. And and that's where yeah. if there's one thing that I think the Braves have a significant advantage, their team speed, the youth of their speed. This isn't this is an older ball club. You've got some guys that are, you know, Corey Seeger and Bellinger are both younger ball players. But when you've got like a thirty four year old third baseman, he doesn't run exactly like your twenty two year old second baseman. So th- th- that's the sort of stuff that jumps out to me that Ball and gaps with Dansby perhaps being the fastest player on the team, with Acuna obviously with his speed, with Ozzy with obviously his speed, they're going to be able to make some things happen. I think if you're going to beat this team, you're going to beat them not by hitting the ball over their heads. I think it's a good point, too, that it's something the Braves don't do a ton of, but some mixed-in hit and runs, sending runners a little bit more, taking some more chances on the bases. Um, that has been an issue with the Braves. And, and we've said it during the season. They were so bad about getting runners in from third base with less than two outs. Again, this is Captain Obvious, but you're not going to win this series if you have three or four of those that we can point to against Walker Bueller or Clayton Kershaw. Like, I like the matchup with Bueller. Bueller's yeah. also dealing with, with blisters, so that's another thing. But I think, the, number one, the Braves are the best fastball-hitting team in, in baseball. Walker Bueller can dial it up with the best of them. So I, I kind of like that matchup. Kershaw's in a very good spot right now. Kershaw has been, outside of a couple of pitches that he, he gave up 
some home runs to the Padres in one inning. He's been unhittable lately. He's been really good. He looks like the best version of Clayton Kershaw in the playoffs. I, I think for me, Matt, and I wanted to throw this out to you because I think you and I both subscribe to – I use analytics in order to set myself up to do smarter things. Sure. If you tell me that a guy does this percentage of the time, I'm going to use that to hopefully get a, 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 the bat on the baseball harder in a series against a guy. The L.A. Dodgers go strictly. They are an analytics yeah. crazy yeah. team, so they don't do certain things like steal bases. I think you have to, if you want to win this series, you have to jump out of the analytics book and you have to say, you know what, we may lay down a one here. It is we al- might steal a base here. But it's also worth pointing out, the analytics for them is a lot defensively too. Yeah. They are the number they one. They shift everywhere. I think they're the number one shifting team, and I think it's over 50%. Yep. And that's just based on the, the just metrics where the Braves – are one of the fewest, if not the lightest, amount of shifts. Now, I, I don't get carried away with that. They don't kind of shift when Dansby's behind second base, not on the right side of the diamond. So I, right. technically it doesn't, but the Braves will still move guys, not as dramatically as But LA, what right? I would, and this is where I would say a difference in these two teams, the youthful speed and the ability to cover is different for the Braves than it is for the Dodgers. The, the, the Braves' infield defense, I think, right now is one of the best in all of baseball. So they're not having to shift to play all these games to cover up these areas. That's somewhere where I think you can take advantage of, of, of the Dodgers. They're, by no means are they slouches defensively. I just don't think they're as good defensively as the Braves as a, as a whole. I would love to see the Braves get game one to see if that pressure thing re- is real. Clayton tomorrow night, who's had some hiccups in the playoffs. Braves up one nothing. Does that really put the emphasis? Dave Roberts knows. Everybody looks at the L.A. Dodgers as it's, super, it's World Series champions. Not get there. Or bust, so I think game one can, can provide a lot of that to You know why it's such a big deal, Matt, and why you're drilling down on it so hard and you should be? Because seven games in seven days means game one, suddenly game two, there's no off yeah. day there to then say, you know what, I got my guy coming back in game five. I'm going to be able to get that one. Your guy might have just thrown his one game for the series and – Hey, you might not make it to, to game six or game seven. There's just no resetting. No, none. There's none of that. All right, we'll talk more about the Braves coming up. Um, let me get to the Falcons, and we'll get some Georgia here quickly. So the, the news came in last night. Falcons, we're going to announce it today or tomorrow, but the Athletic got to jump on them, and, and Arthur sent out a letter to the fans, his season ticket holders, partners, all those things. We, the only question I wondered was, was Thomas going to go at the same time? And I thought about it. It makes sense. You can't have Thomas as a lame duck trying to make whatever moves. I don't know how many moves they can make before the deadline. There are not many pieces that other teams are going to want. But it makes no sense to have Thomas, uh, you know, sitting on players or not when it comes to the deadline. So Thomas and Dan both relieved of their duties. Frankly, it should have happened a year ago at 1-7. and seven. All right, we move on from that. We get past it. So where are the Falcons now? A couple of things. Raheem Morris is the interim. Jeff Ulbrich has been promoted to the full-time D.C. They're at Minnesota Sunday. This is not a magical cure. They're not going to be all of a sudden better. The same issues that are there will be there. But, Lois, what I've been saying over and over, and I've been so disappointed in Arthur through this, as a big Arthur a fan, the lack of accountability. This franchise has lacked accountability. This sounds so weird to say, and, and some people are going to get mad well, at me. Your, your standards changed. The worst thing that ever happened was making the Super Bowl. I know people are going to people are going to be discussed. <laughs> it is because of the way it played out. A, it raised expectations. B, it was the most devastating gut punch ever, and they never truly recovered. As in, every time they had a big lead in second halves, it started to sink in again. Even players who weren't here for the Super Bowl thought, "All right, this team has lost those games." And you start thinking it and thinking it, and it becomes the reality. Dan was in over his head. He never put great staffs together. The Dirk Cutter hire was one of the worst hires in the league. Um, he never replaced coaches properly. He wasn't very good in game. After the rah-rah part of Dan, who was a lovable figure to his players, he didn't offer anything else either on game day, in my opinion, or within the week that gave the Falcons any kind of tactical advantage. And we've seen that, for, for frankly, since he got here outside of the Kyle year in 16. I get the frustration because I, I think what it speaks to is this. From 2008 to 2012, there was a different sta- established standard of what they were going to be and what they were going to achieve. Yeah, you weren't going to beat yourself. They, that's what they achieved. And, they, again, you're, you're talking about NFC title game appearances and regular playoff teams and things like that. You didn't really get that back until 2016, 2017. But if you go by just those standards of what this administration had created and what they were allowing, you were never supposed to have this year and last year. No. You were never supposed to go down this kind of road. You should not be 0-5 ever. No. Not to, this is not a great roster. 1-7 to start. It's good enough to be 3-2 and two or 2-3. Two and three. And Being in the middle of the pack in the NFL is not hard. It's really not hard. You saw Carolina yesterday, who's a marginally talented team, who's coached up. Prepared well, adjusts well, has a middle-of-the-pack quarterback without their best player. Meanwhile, they're 3-0 and without their best player. That's the difference in, in what you're watching. Here's the, the glass half full for the Falcon fan, though. It's so much better being at the bottom than it is in the middle. Being 7-9 and nine does you no good. 
middle of the pack draft pick. Uh, it allows coaches to maybe end up staying longer than they should, GMs too. I think this team is going to win three or four games. And with a three and four win season, you're talking about battling for a top three draft choice. You, tra- you change the franchise. Yeah, you, cha- you change the franchise because if you happen to stumble into number one, well, the no-brainer is Trevor Lawrence, and yes, you take the quarterback, and Matt has one more year and he moves on. If it's number two or three and Justin Fields is there, you take Justin Fields. It's a no-brainer. It's a win because you need the position. It's a win because, I mean, there was a, there's a Justin Fields factor. Played at Georgia for a minute. It's the kid that got away. And a new coach, or excuse me, a new quarterback and a new GM are going to want their guy. You build around that. That's how that one goes. And, Lois, I'm not exact. I think they're going to be a three- or four-win team at this point. The difference in the Houston job that is available right now is it's Deshaun Watson. And, and that's the, the carrot you get to dangle. Sure. The problem is yep. – it's going to hurt any potential guy who wants that job to say, wait a minute, I don't have first-round picks. I don't have a first-rounder this year or a second-rounder this and year. Bill like, O'Brien, how did that happen? He depleted that roster yes. with those weird moves. With what he moved and then still cap-strapped it. So that, that's where you're, you're talking about there. While you do have significant major cap issues for the first two years if you're a new coach here, that, that's going to happen. That That's final. You can't escape it. That's just what it is. You also have a draft pick to weather that. Yeah, Whereas right. they don't. And, well, and that's and the difference in the jobs right now. We've talked about this many times. You've got to bat so almost perfect on your draft picks and get guys who play above their pay grade or their years in the draft because you're just not going to be able to, to figure out the cap situation You, for you are going to be playing, at least for next year, if you were to move away from either like a, a Matt Ryan or a Julio Jones or anything else, and I'm not suggesting because economically it doesn't work. No. You should wait another year. Correct. But even if you do do that a, a year later – you're going to play on about an $185 million cap and only be able to use about 160 of it in space. Damn so pandemic. You're, you're, you're cutting your own leg off. <laughs> yeah, you yeah and, the, and the Falcons planned just like every other NFL team. The cap is going to uh, keep rising, so let's build to that number. The next year, they're on the hook at $205 million, which is not bad on a 200 or $205 million cap. On normal circumstances. But it's going to be 175 right. Yep, yep, yep. All right, well, we'll save the Georgia stuff. I want to get to them and the Tech Weekend coming up, but let's get our winging it idea. It's time to wing it. Brought to you by Wing and Burger Factory. With over 50 Atlanta locations, find yours at WNBFactory.com. Your winging it idea answers have come to the Ameripress. Fresh off the press Twitter feed, we want to know your favorite uh, monster. It is Monster Week. <laughs> Here on oh, the fans. It's a dragon right there. All fueled by Monster Energy Ultra Watermelon. Um, I'm getting a lot of choices, including a lot of Pennywise, which I'll put him in the monster category. That's fine. Uh, Blade said Cookie Monster. That's a lovable, fun monster. Uh, Slimer from Ghostbusters. Oh, okay. King Kong, Godzilla. Um, King Kong is more of a, I mean, that's an animal. It is, but it, I mean, it's its uh, its what it is, but it's. I also got some Jurassic Park with the newly invented dinosaurs. Remember the, what were the new ones that just. It was the Velociraptor. No, that was the old one. They, else they came right. up with the new fake right. uh, dinosaurs, dinosaur. which. There was an update on Jurassic Park, the, the last chapter that's coming. They pushed it back now to 2022 for obvious reasons with, By the with way, COVID. The Velociraptor is only the size of a chicken, but for some reason we've blown it up into being something much bigger. And one last guy said that Dan Quinn was his favorite monster. Oh, okay. So <laughs> kick a guy on his way out. Send your winged idea answers. It's just mean. It is. To the Ameripress, fresh off the press Twitter feed. All right, coming up next, things will look very different this time around for the Braves. The question is, will it be enough to win this series? We'll give you an answer next.
Braves and Dodgers come your way tonight on the fan, on the fan app, on 680thefan.com. It's Max Freed. Walker Bueller, the action is yours starting at 650. Bueller. <laughs> right here. We'll get it all Bueller. started even before that with the <laughs> countdown to first pitch with 680 game day. Los is in for the King. Chuck and Chernoff live at Truist Park inside the Braves dugout. You can see us on our 680 the Fan YouTube channel if you don't believe me. Since Los is in for Charles, he's on CFT duty. He's got a college football today in five minutes. Tease me. Scouting the college game is going to be incredibly difficult for a number of these and teams, including the Falcons. All right, we'll talk about that coming up. But first, I wanted to point out some um, differences, Los, since the last time the Braves and the Dodgers met in the postseason, which was the NLDS in 2018. Now, I'm not telling anybody you know, stuff they don't know. The Braves were happy to be there. Like, that was such an overachievement to win that division with 90 wins and an unbelievable mismatch against the L.A. Dodgers. This time around, the Dodgers are still the better team, but the gap isn't nearly as wide, and I'll give you some reasons. Think back to game one of that series, Braves-Dodgers, NLDS 2018. Here was the Braves lineup. And they lined up against Hinjin Ryu, who is a, just a Braves killer. Can't touch him. Acuna, Camargo, Freddy. Marcakis hitting cleanup. Flowers hitting fifth. Ozzie, Ender, Culberson, and Fulte. Okay. Well, here is tonight's game one. Starting lineup, Acuna, Freddie Oz, uh, Ozuna, which I've made the claim that's the best one, two, three in baseball. You can make some arguments for other teams. I think it's as good as you'll find in baseball. I think, and again, I compare the Dodger lineup when you're talking about having a former MVP at leadoff and another one batting sixth. But as far as a top three, I don't know if there's anyone better in baseball. So then you would go Darno, Ozzy, Dansby, who, remember, was hurt in that series. Yeah, that was a Culberson series. Adam Duvall, Marquez is hitting eighth. And then because the benefit of the DH, Austin Riley hits ninth. So here's what you don't have. No Ender, no Camargo, no Flowers. And again, Marcakis is not your cleanup hitter. You add in Ozuna, MVP candidate. Darno, Silver Slugger winner. Dansby, big time, especially late inning threat. Austin Riley, who I, I need something from in this series, but also that threat. And then Marcakis, who gets the professional hitter tag, which, fine. He's good enough against right-handed pitching, hitting eighth. Los, we, we agree on this. The Dodgers are better in, in most areas. Better pitching staff, deeper. Better offense, but not a ton. The only reason I give them the check offensively is I think they're a little more diverse than the Braves. Both teams can hit the home run. The Dodgers do a lot of other things. They take a lot of pitches. They can you know, go line to line, gap to gap, singles. They, they just do a lot of things that if the home run ball isn't there, they can still score can, runs. Can I do it for you like this? There's not a lot of Dodger games where they go, wow, they had 10 Ks. Like, that's just not how that's they not, make no. outs. That's that, not how they make outs. They're all, surprised when it happens to us. There are a lot of uh, Dodger games where you see where they walk seven times. Right. And they work pitching counts, you know, pitch counts up. 2018, the Dodgers lined up with Ryu, Kershaw, Bueller, and then Rich Hill. Braves lined up with Fulte, Annabelle Sanchez, Newcomb, and Fulte again. That was the four in that series. You had no shot. Yeah, you're in a different world now. Today, you're going to go Max, who I would give every chance to win tonight. Ian, who all of a sudden has all of our confidence. Kyle, who makes you feel a lot better. And then the gap is at four and five, right? In games four and five, where the Braves' depth was crushed with the Soroka loss and Hamels never being a part of this, that game four could be a full bullpen game. It could be an opener like Enoa, or they could go Matzik, or they could do the same in game five. That's where the, the thing could get a little scary in the middle of this series. And keep in mind, the Dodgers did the exact same thing in game three where Dustin May was the starter, after, and after right. one inning they go, we're going to go a different direction. That They've been treating that third game the same way yeah. that the Braves didn't have to with Kyle Wright, but they were more than willing to. I think the other thing is if this series is, 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 if this series is to go six or seven games, I'm asking Snit to be better than Dave Roberts, which Dave has had some – trips and falls in the postseasons over the last several years. Snit, I think, has done a beautiful job with his pen through the first five games of the postseason. It's got to be sort of on point again. And there aren't many wrong answers. Like, there's not many times the bullpen door flies open. You're it's like, Luke Ooh. Jackson. Right, exactly. So if it's O'Day. Or Luke if throws when you're down 7 nothing <laughs> In May. Right, right. <laughs> but, I mean, with a Matzik, with a, uh, you know, uh, Will Smith, with Minter, I think those lefties against the Dodgers are going to be very crucial. Because as much as they can match up and pinch hit, there are certain lefties that aren't coming out of that Dodger lineup. Bellinger's, that's, Bellinger's that's one of them. For the last several years has always been the way you're supposed to be able to beat that team is with lefties in key places to deal with their left-handed power. The uh, the honest part of this is we're going to see some bullpen arms for the Braves throwing five or six times. As much as they don't want to, much as we want to stay away from a guy tonight, there's a chance Will Smith throws five or six games. It's not out of the question. Same thing with Melanson. Same thing with Matzik. Like, that stuff is not... 
that crazy without days off, and there's only so much juggling, even with 15 pitchers on this active roster. And I don't have a problem with it because the only way he's throwing five or six times, or at least five times, they're in tight ball games, and they've got a moment where they need one of their best, an all-star out of the pen to to finish this thing off. And if so, if he gets that opportunity to throw that many times, you've got good things happening in late innings for the Braves. Up three or down three in the postseason is all high leverage anyway. So, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. One final note, and this is something that the Brave fan has dealt with for a very long time. If you're about my age and you can go back to 1991 and then you can come up with your mind of every postseason series, the Braves have lost a series when they've been, quote, the better team, the betting favorite, better record. At least seven times. Oh, you've been the 100-win team to right. lose to somebody who, like, oh, they, they, they got in on 89-90 wins. And somebody got hot either at the plate for the other team, Carlos Beltran, or somebody got hot on the mound. Kevin, Kevin Brown, Brown can't or, be touched. Or, or, yeah. yeah, or Kerry Wood or Mark Pryor, or you get it. So that's kind of what we can look forward to tonight. But, again, Freed against Bueller. I like the matchup. I think game one is vital, critical for the Braves. The Dodgers can come off the deck down 0-1. I don't have a huge concern with Clayton Kershaw. Braves facing 0-1 with Kershaw tomorrow night? Yee, that would get very scary very quickly. All right, coming up in five minutes, uh, I have one piece of advice for Arthur Blank. Birth control is your responsibility, too. <laughs> yeah, weird thing to tell him. He's like in his late 70s. He can still make him, I think. Anyway, that's not the piece of advice I would I would offer to Arthur Blank. I, I, I can't. <laughs> you know, you're, you're out of that game. I have one piece of advice for Arthur and the Falcons as they begin their next coaching search. Off his back foot, caught, touchdown! Chuck Oliver's College Football Today. and know uh and if you aren't familiar basically the bison had one game scheduled this year with arkansas state that was it and so the game was over and then you get a tweet from trey lance saying i'm declaring caa is my new family uh you're talking about a, a college quarterback that you're gonna have to go back and look at basically one season of tape and one game of tape now if the falcons end up being as bad as they could possibly be they need as much game tape to evaluate these upcoming quarterbacks. Now, with Trevor Lawrence, that's different. Trevor Lawrence is going to give you this 10-game season, and I got two other years of game tape. I know what he is. Including there's, on the biggest stages. Right. There's no mystery there. You're the number one overall pick. But there are other guys that I'm going to consider. Justin Fields is not an automatic for me because we're talking about one season of game tape. It's going to be incredibly important to get this season in as well for Ohio State because more game tape means more certainty means I feel a lot better about this draft choice. So this is the, the, the challenge of the college game. And when you saw guys like Nick Saban say, a lot of this playing is about opportunity for young men to improve their status, to improve their stock. He wasn't just talking about in the classroom. He's also talking about on a football field where being drafted third overall versus 13th overall is millions and millions and millions of dollars. That's why it's going to be weird for guys like Trey Lance, Justin Fields, that's going to be a little bit different for them. Trevor Lawrence, you know what that is. That's uh, College Football Today. Chuck Oliver's College Football. I know what it is. By Duffy Realty. Got gotcha, baby. Football voice of the South, 680, the fan. So I, was, I, I was, did it just to bother him, by I the know, way. He hates, he, hates a, that. he doesn't like the verbal close because he's he like yeah. hoits in control. Anyway, um, I was talking to a, a, a neighbor of mine about just this, uh, this subject, and he was asking me about will there be a combine or, or all-star games, and I said, I think there will be. I think you can do enough of a bubble scenario for, you know, Indianapolis if you want to do it there like it always is. You know, hotels with just that. You're in the, you're in the building. I don't know if you're going to have media at all in there the way we've had in the past. In fact, I wouldn't imagine it. Same thing with the All-Star Games. I think you'll have those things in a bubble sort of environment with just no media there. I think we're all better off saying, hey, we're, we're talking about something three or four months down the road. In three or four months, it's down the road from, sure. from where we were, you know, from from we're not going to have a baseball season too. Hey, we, we're this close to a World Series. I, I think they'll be able to get something situated and, and, and medically we'll be able to move forward with that stuff. All right. So my singular piece of advice for Arthur Blank, whoever he hires, what 
search firm or Rich Helps or uh, Rustin or whoever they put together to, to figure out the GM and the head coach, if it's a, a situation where we're at loggerheads and we want to go different directions, find me the best singular offensive mind out there. I don't care the age. I prefer younger, but I want the best offensive mind. The only way I can guarantee that I keep my dynamic playmaker is if he's the guy in charge. Otherwise, I'm going to lose him. The Falcons never gave a look at Matt LaFleur, and two years later, he's one of the more successful young coaches in the league. Sean McVay became a very successful head coach in the league very quickly. Um, you can go through the older guys, the Sean Paytons and the Andy Reeds, and, and you guys know who they are. I don't have to, to give you the full list. The NFL, to me, is now built on if I have a dynamic play caller who can give me a schematic advantage, Kyle, McVay, uh, LaFleur, whomever they are, I have a chance to even overcome having marginal talent because, Los, I think these offensive guys will tell you, without saying it publicly, I want to load up on defense. I think my scheme can make players better offensively who aren't traditional high-round picks or big-name free agents. I can get the most out of them because I can scheme it. Well, Sean McVay kind of gave you that modern blueprint of, I'm going to go hire the 70-year-old defensive coordinator who's, you run who's going to get my defense taken yep. care of, and I'll handle this offense over here with a number one overall quarterback and some talented receivers. I'll, I'll add to it. Go look at the talent on the Saints. There's not a ton of first-round skill position talent there. It's no. third-rounder Alvin Kamara. Second-rounder right? receiver, yeah. It's second-round receiver. It's fill in the blanks with all these pieces around them. Then it's get a gadget guy that they like to bring in at times. Um, you know, go look at Green Bay. They don't spend high on a bunch of pieces. They like the quarterback, and then they fill in the blanks. Their and stuff goes in, as far as their high picks, go into their secondary yep. and their defensive line. Go look at the San Francisco 49ers. Loaded up on defense in the draft. Made a big deal in the draft to get more defense. You know what else Kyle's like? I, no, they're getting killed by injuries, so don't judge Kyle with what's happening this yeah. year. Like Outside of Ayuk, like, they don't use a high pick no. on, on, on offensive options. It's middle-round draft picks on on. Uh, running backs. It's a fifth round tight end. So that's my point here. So, and, and whatever the name is, again, I'm on my Joe Brady kick, but it doesn't have to be Joe Brady. It could be you, you do beat down the door of Lincoln Riley. You do beat down the door of Josh McDaniels. You do talk to Pete Carmichael, the offensive coordinator of the Saints. You do talk to Eric Bieniemy. You do all that stuff, and you talk to Joe Brady. And it's funny to bring this name up, but it's going to get attention because he's the biggest fish out there. Until he says he's not coaching again, you do talk to Urban Meyer. You cover all of that stuff until these guys tell you no, and I don't talk to any defensive guys. I know that seems short-sighted. If I find the right defensive mind and he hires a really good OC, what happens when he does a good job in two years? See you gone you know there is a guy and this is the only one that i fear um he's got the number one offense again in the nfl he had the number one offense last year and he's like 37 it's killing more that's the kind of people you're talking exactly about right where yes. yeah he's got some dynamic players but it's scheming a man he just schemes them open there's always somebody open in that in that offense my example of of what schematically what can happen go back and watch the all 22 if you can see the overhead shot of the interception by ryan in the end zone late in that game it was a horrific throw and a bad decision but go look at the route concepts. I mean, that's Mickey Mouse high school college stuff. There's nobody. There's very little pre-step motion. There's very little misdirection. There's very little movement. Go watch half of the time what Carolina did yesterday. Getting, and this used to be some Kyle stuff. Tight end underneath, receiver running a little bit deeper. Now he's got guys on two levels with Teddy Bridgewater on a play fake. Now. There's an idea that Teddy might run. Teddy doesn't run very much. No. But just the notion to get him out there, <laughs> it makes a linebacker stick and freeze or a safety. That's Joe Brady. That's schematics. That's coaching. That's, you know, scheming guys open. It's what we saw with Kyle here. Well, when you have Dirk Cutter, you don't get any of that stuff. Everything's tight windows. And Matt was awful, by the way, yesterday, throwing into traffic. And I think he was seeing some ghosts with the with the hits he took maybe in the last couple of weeks now adding up in his mind. You say tight windows, and that's, that's the difference. These guys that are able to understand how to use space on the field, how different route concepts will create different space for guys on the field. They'll naturally open them up. That, to me, ends up being the big thing. It's not just about having, hey, I got a bigger receiver, and he runs down right. the field, and, and he makes that catch. Yeah, that, that's great to have. But I love when I can make the guy that I drafted in the third round a real factor every single Sunday because – he happens to run these routes, and they're naturally opening up for him. Well, you said it earlier. The Falcons have a very messy salary cap situation that they're going to have to deal with whomever comes in here as the GM and the coach. What I'm going to tell you is it's not impossible. If you draft well and draft high enough, if the Falcons are drafting second or third, I'm just giving you a for instance, you're going to go get your quarterback in the first round. Then you might just decide, I'm going to load up on defense over the next four or five rounds with high picks in every single round. We've seen teams. Carolina is a great example of this this year. Good coaching can take middle-of-the-road talent and at least make you competitive. 
I don't subscribe to it. You're going to be awful just because you're going to be awful. The NFL has never shown us that. I watched a rookie in Matt Ryan with a first-year head coach in Mike Smith go 11-5. and five. It's far from impossible. The one thing you can't do, and, and this, is, this is my here, un- understand this. Everything you just said, I look at it as the blueprint. You get your quarterback, you load up on defense, and you are cheap. For the next five years, you 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 are you're just you're just a cheap team. This is this is what the New Orleans Saints did after going seven and nine three straight years. They hit on an entire draft yeah, class, yep. and and that's how they did it. Yep. Now they're going to be expensive again. Well, here's the deal though: the Falcons for two seasons are just not going to be able to play the game of like we see it in, in Kansas City. I've got a cheap quarterback, so I'm going to bring in Frank Frank Clark and sure. pay him a, uh, just a crazy amount of money to play defensive end. That's the one thing they won't be able to do because they won't have that kind of space available for two years. I'll just end with this. This is far from a perfect roster, but it's not near as bad as the record. That's what whoever the new coach comes in here, this is about a, a 500 type record right now. It should be two and three, three and two if they're well coached. They're going to be billed as an awful team that needs to, to just kick everything out the door. I don't think it's that bad. I think <laughs> here's where the bar is. Mediocre coaching has this team right now at least hanging around. Imagine if you had what what Matt Rule was doing. They're saying, hey, there's no there's no off times here. No. There, there's no, hey, this guy's been a star in the league, so he doesn't work out anymore. It's like he's grinding all these guys, and you see the results on Sunday. Yeah. Remember, the biggest thing that we had. getting coached up. All of these players say, oh, we love Dan. We do, oh, that's he's great. a player's that's coach. I'm like, that's great. That's awesome. But that, that's not helping you uh, take care of your business on third down because I've been watching him for two years. You're not doing it. I don't care if you hate him. I'd like you to like him. I don't care if you hate good, him yeah. as long as the results are there. All right, coming up next, so what is the uh, Braves pitching plan if the, NL- if the NLCS goes deep? Oh, I'm going deep. Deep. Plus, <laughs> how much of a disadvantage is the site of this NLCS? We'll get the answers from one of our insiders next. I'm-
Super weak. Arr. Continues on the fan. Chuck and Chernoff. Los is into the king. We're live at Truist Park in the Braves dugout. You can watch us on YouTube on the 6 State of the Fan YouTube channel. 6 State of the Fan's Monster Week is fueled by Monster Energy Ultra Watermelon. When fueling up for games like Georgia, Alabama, Georgia Tech, Clemson. Got a full week of this, America. Playoff baseball. Try the brand new Ultra Watermelon. <laughs> Zero sugar. Tastes like summertime in a can. Now available in all Atlanta Quick Trip locations. This is Atlanta's flagship station for the... It gets a brand new postseason open. Now we... What the hell is this? Braves reporter Kevin McAlpin. Very spiffy open as we get ready for NLCS game one tonight on the fan, on the fan app. The aforementioned, the frozen rope, Kevin McAlpin joins us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker line. All right, K-Mac, a couple of things I want to start with here. I Let agree. I hadn't said anything yet. Let's, let's go. go. All right, very good. Uh, let's talk about the middle of this series, game one, Certainly, you know, makes sense to talk about, but we have an idea of how that's going to go. Max, and then a you know plethora of bullpen options. Ian, tomorrow night, give me your sense on games three, four, and five. Kyle starts game three, but do you have any kind of inkling on which way Snit is leaning for the middle of the series with his starting pitching? Honestly, Matt, not right now. And the reason I say that, I think a lot will determine how things go these first couple of games of this series. If you don't have to use your long guys, and that would be the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, ideal scenario, if you can get through these first couple of games and have, uh, you know, your long options available, whether it's Matzik or Tomlin, you could potentially go with maybe even a Waskari Noah as an opener, get the plane off the ground, see how far he can take you, and then turn it over to one of those bulk relievers. I don't think it'll be a true quote unquote bullpen game, uh, but I think all options are on the table right now, and probably at some point by fifth, sixth, seventh inning of tomorrow's game, you'll have a pretty good idea of where they might go for game four. Yeah, K-Mac, what jumps out from games two and three in the Red Series, they got the benefit of, of innings from their guys. That didn't happen in game one with Max Freed, but then there was the benefit of, hey, if you're only throwing four innings, there's a, a possibility of you coming back a little bit sooner. How do you think they're going to play this game tonight? Because to me, if you can get it, you can get it. But if I'm leading and I'm getting to the fourth or fifth inning, I might th start thinking about in a seven-game series over seven days, I might pull my young guy and go to the pen. Yeah, it's it's hard, Los, because you're playing that, well, you know, do you worry about games four and five in game one? I, I don't know. Kill the fan if you can. I think you have to keep the focus on tonight. I, I don't think you can say, all right, Max Freed, he gave me five and I can bring him back for game four or five. I don't think you want to start thinking like that. You have to worry about winning in this game. Now, I'll say this. If you turn the bullpen a lead late, you feel pretty good. I mean, they've been really reliable all season long to the tune of a 28-0 record when leading after six innings. No jinx. <laughs> hey, I, you know what, Matt? I, I've been saying it for the last three or four weeks, and it hasn't. If it hasn't happened yet, it's not going to happen. Because ah! hey, there was a time where it was twenty-one and 0, 24 and 0. Yeah, Just exactly. Better I, you than me. I've been saying this since it was fifteen and zero. Right. Let's put it that way. But but again, I, to answer your question, Lowe's, I just don't know that you start thinking that far ahead in this series. You really have to keep your focus on the here and now. And I think that's one thing that Snit and this coaching staff do a really good job with these guys of doing. Okay, Mac. Let's talk about the ballpark for a second. We've heard all about Globe Life. It's bigger, it plays bigger, maybe not as many home runs, maybe it's more doubles, gaps become a bigger thing. That's offensively. Let's talk about defensively for the Braves. You know there are times when, maybe against a lefty, the Braves want to give Tyler Flowers a start behind the plate and DH Travis Darno. The problem is, do you really want to get stuck with Ozuna in a big ballpark in left field at any time this series? No, probably not. I mean, I think that, you know, what you've seen is what you're going to get. And I, I truly believe, Matt, that unless something was to happen where Darno was to, you know, take a, a foul ball off the off the face mask or something really bad went wrong, I think he's going to catch every game. I really do. I mean, I know it's every I know you're playing every single night. You have no days off. There's no travel days. Again, you've only played a 60-game season. Now, I've heard guys say the mental grind has been as taxing or maybe even in some aspects more taxing than a 162-game season. But I, I just think that what you're getting behind the plate, game calling, execution, the arm, the bat at the, at the dish, I got a hard time believing they're going to get Travis Darno out of this well, lineup. Maybe, I really do. And to follow up on that, k -Mac, maybe the good news is the Braves have only had to play five games over about a two-week stretch, so maybe now right. some of that equals out. Well, the, and, even the idea, K-Mac, sorry to cut you off there, a defensive replacement is something you would consider in this ballpark. I mean, I've watched probably about 20, 25 Ranger games this year, and you realize that place is... Is a, it's a cathedral. It is huge. And so patrolling center field isn't just the most important thing. You're also going to consider maybe in late innings, hey, let me give Nick Marcakis a, a, a little breather, go to a young guy, make sure I'm covering
covered up defensively. First off, Los, never never apologize for interrupting <laughs> me. Please don't ever do that because you're more than welcome to. I'll say this. Look, if you have a game go sideways, look, say the Braves are up 10 to 2 early on in, in this one. Or, yes, you know, say I like it's that. A, say it's the sixth or seventh inning. You know what? Maybe you do get Darno off his legs for a couple of innings and get Flowers in there. Maybe that happens in game two or three. I don't know. Hey, I'd hate for it to be the other way around because you don't want to concede anything. But I do think that if, if the games get lopsided at any point, you might see Snit rest some of these guys, especially if it's a guy like Darno, who's been so important to you, but really in all aspects of the game this season. Kevin McAlpin, our, our uh, truest reporter with Chuck and Chernoff, he's with us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker line. Um, the other thing I'm going to be intrigued by in this is how these managers handle the pens. I just talked about both teams have only played five games over a stretch, but there is just something built in in their minds of I don't want to overwork them, I don't want to overuse them. The other little side is like, right, the devil and the angel. The devil's like, it's the postseason. I might need you five or six times out of seven games. Is that realistic that Will Smith or Melanson or Martin might get five or six appearances? It's very realistic. Now, I'll say this. Let's let's say that is the case, and that would probably be a good problem to have if you're the Braves, if you're talking about needing those guys in those high-leverage situations. You do have depth, especially for your eighth and ninth inning. So let's say you have to use Melanson three days in a row. You can go to Martin. You can go to Green. You could go to Will Smith for the ninth inning if you had to. So it's a good problem to have when you have those kind of options at your disposal, 7th, 8th, and ninth inning. But again, I think all of those guys to a man would go to Snit, and if they're used two days in a row or three out of four, they're not going to say they need a breather because they know how important these games are. Those guys want to be on the mound. They've worked so hard to get to this point, especially guys who have been on this team the last three or four years who saw the end of the rebuild and have seen the fruits of their labor. These guys want to get out there, and they want to do whatever they can to help this team win. So I don't think there's going to be a day where Snit's going to have to say in his pregame Zoom that this guy is down or we're without a couple of guys. They're going to want to pitch, and rightfully so. Our truest on up reporter, Kevin McAlpin, joins us right here on The Fan and KMAC. It's, it's funny you mentioned this Shane Green and Chris Martin. The, the Braves have been so good over these first five games of the postseason. They're kind of on a milk carton. Like, I, I just don't requ- you know, remember them being in some crazy situation or making something happen. And I would say that's a huge advantage except the Dodgers have the same thing. They're the only other team that's it's 5-0 and in, in this sort of deal. And so I, I guess going into this, I look at them and say maybe the one vulnerability where I say the Braves are significantly better is in the comparison of those pens. Not not where I'm sitting back and saying the Dodgers are not good. I just think the Braves are pitching at a different level. I, I agree with you, Los. I had a conversation with somebody who covers the Dodgers last night, and I said, look, I know this Dodger team is stacked top to bottom. Give me one area where if I'm a Dodger fan, I'm a little bit concerned. And he said two areas. One, Kenley Jansen has not been Kenley Jansen, especially here in the yep. postseason. His velocity is down. He's all over the place. He's not been the, the lockdown closer we've seen in years past. The other thing he told me was, look, you've got Bueller and Kershaw and May. They can all throw. The velocity is there, but they're not high strikeout pitchers. So a lot of times they're relying on their defense to make plays behind them. So if you're the Braves, you, you know, you're, you're looking at 97 to 100 for some of these guys, but, but they're not high strikeout total pitchers. So that's the one area where he said They've gotten burned. Some of these guys have left some fat ones, and, and they've gotten uh, they've made you know made to be paid for their mistakes. So uh, that's two areas of vulnerability. But again, you want to compare the bullpens? I'll take the Braves ten times out of ten. K Mac, uh, have a great call tonight. Ford leadoff shows coming up around the corner. Kevin will have all your post game as well. We appreciate. Let's go. Time. I agree. <laughs> There's Kevin McAlpin, <laughs> our truest reporter, as we get ready for Game One of the Braves and the Dodgers. Speaking of Game One. That was a local perspective of what we can uh, look forward to tonight. We want to find out what one of the most informed minds in baseball nationally thinks of the Braves' chances of upsetting the Dodgers. You'll hear that next. Now more than ever, the business is...
It's all happening, the mysterious six o'clock hour with Chuck and Chernoff, Losin for the Kang, as we're live at Truist Park. We're in the Braves dugout. You can watch us on the 680 The Fan YouTube channel. 680 game day is around the corner and then it ramps up. We get ready for the Ford leadoff show and then an 808 first pitch with the Braves and the Dodgers. Freedy, Max Freed against Walker Bueller. The action is all yours on the fan, the fan app, 680thefan.com. You get the idea. For more on that action, let's bring in one of the you most prominent. More on? more on that oh, action. Okay. I'm already sitting next to you. Yeah. Let's bring in one of the more prominent uh, MLB insiders. You watch him on Fox, MLB coverage on Fox. He's Ken Rosenthal, who will be a part of the broadcast tonight. He's kind enough to join us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker Live. How are you these days? <laughs> We're doing well, guys. How's it going down there? We're doing very well. Uh, Ken, let's start with a, a quick glance at the Dodgers. We know they're, I mean, there's a lot to like about that team. Where are they vulnerable? You know what? I've been searching for the answer to that question for several <laughs> days. So I covered the previous series uh, with the Padres, and obviously they swept that series. And people might say, well, they're vulnerable with the closer because Kenley Jansen has not been as good as in recent years. It's been kind of a steady decline, velocity and everything else. But they have all these other options that they can use in the ninth inning, and they've effectively already phased Jansen out of that role. So I don't really see a clear area of vulnerability. I guess you might say Bueller tonight because of the blister issue, but, man, I don't know, guys. <laughs> well, let, let, let me yeah, ask you this thing. The are pretty good, too. Yeah, now, they are. Don't well, get me the- wrong. How about the, okay, do you buy into the pressure angle? In other words, let's say the Braves stole game one. How much is the pressure? We know the Dodgers are about World Series championship or bust. Is that a thing? Does that matter? It matters. There's no question that there is more pressure on the Dodgers because they have not won a World Series since 1988. They've been to the postseason now eight straight years, and it's time. But I don't know that this particular team will succumb to that. The addition of Betts has kind of transformed them or taken them to another level. And I'm not saying they can't lose guys because the Braves are really good, and the Braves' offense is perhaps the difference maker in this series. So these Dodgers' offense is just as good. So we'll see what happens, but I don't see them mentally succumbing. I don't see a glaring weakness. If they get beat, it will just be because they got beat. Ken Rosenthal, MLB on Fox, joins us right here on The Fan. And, Ken, I think that the the only thing more unfair than facing the Dodgers is facing the Dodgers with the DH. Like, they get even longer as a lineup. <laughs> uh, it's kind of the same thing with the Atlanta Braves that we've been able to see them play with one. And, and I'm right there with you. I think this is a series that if the Braves are going to have a shot, it's going to have to be with the offense getting hot for a handful of days and then seeing where it plays from there. I agree. And here's my concern with the Braves. And, I love them because, frankly, I thought their pitching was too thin to get through maybe even the first round, and yet they've done it. Now, what's got to happen in the first two games is that Freed and Anderson have to give them length, and that means five, six innings at least, because if that does not happen, there's going to be a trickle-down effect with the bullpen, and then as you get deeper into this series, playing every day, remember, seven games in seven days potentially, then the bullpen starts to wear down. And that is the concern as you get into game four and game five, which are potential bullpen games for the Braves. That's where I see their vulnerability. And the Dodgers are a little bit better prepared to handle that. They have guys who can go longer, Dustin May and Tony Gonsolin and Julio Urias if necessary. No, I think that's that's a, a fair point, especially in the middle of the, the series. Let's go back to the offense for a second. Uh, these two offenses are really deep and really talented. I think the Dodgers are a little more diverse. They don't just live off the home run ball. Ken, we know how good the Braves' offense was, and then all of a sudden they moved Freddie to two and Ozuna to three, and getting those guys an extra turn every game. It didn't have a huge number in the Marlins series. Against this Dodger pitching, how do they match up? Well, no one matches up great against the Dodger pitching, but my goodness, Freddie hits all kinds of pitching. Azuna hits all kinds of pitching. Darno's been just fantastic. So it's going to be the cat and mouse game and trying to run up pitch counts and all the things that we love about the postseason style of play. And you know what? You asked me about the Dodgers and pressure. I look at a guy like Azuna, he loves this moment. Acuna loves this moment. So it could work the other way, too, when you have guys that rise to it. I think Bookie's a guy that rises to it as well. So I'm expecting big things here from a lot of different players, and that's what's so exciting about the series. 
when you see great players doing great things, for instance, Bellinger robbing Tatis in game two of the previous series here. Ken Rosenthal, MLB on Fox, joins us right here on The Fan. And, Ken, uh, because you saw the previous series, and, and I actually grew up as a Ranger fan, so I probably watched 20 of their games this year at, at Globe Life. Tell our audience about how that big that ballpark is and how it plays for these guys. It is big, and the ball does not seem to carry the way it does in other parks, and it plays big. So what you guys were saying earlier, you're going to have to do more than hit home runs. And, frankly, the Dodgers hit only one home run against the Padres, scored 23 runs in three games. You're going to see balls that you might think would go out and not go out. And they said earlier that, well, maybe with the roof open, the ball will carry better. That really didn't happen in the previous series. So, yes, it's a big playing yard, kind of like Petco, I would say, at certain times in recent years. Kent Rosenthal will have all, all the uh, dugout action and all the great uh, analysis along with the crew tonight on Fox. Ken, we appreciate you spending some time with us. Have a great call. Thanks, guys. Take care. Appreciate it very much. There's Ken Rosenthal from Fox joining us on the Loud Security Systems Newsmaker Line. Um, there's so much to get into in this series. I, I do subscribe to the theory that they do play with all the pressure, but the Braves do have pressure, too. You get to this point, you don't know when you're getting back. I would say this, not to the extreme of what – um, we saw a few years ago with Carlos Beltran carrying an Astro team to a World Series. Can the Braves find one of those guys who has one of those eye-popping seven-game series? You right? had one last week with, with, tra- with, with Travis, Travis Darno. Exactly That's exactly right. the kind yes. of play you need. Because that can level the playing field Absolutely. against a team like the Wait, Dodgers. You would love to see a guy like Dansby Swanson go hot out of his mind for right. about five games and say they can't get him out. That's exactly right. That's what you need. All right, coming up next, I read something about the Dodgers that really surprised me. Matt can't even read. And it might provide Braves fans with some more confidence heading into the series. I'll share it with the whole class next. The Braves are back in the National League Championship Series, and the fan is streaming every huge game totally free on the fan app. Looking up, that one's gone. Yes, Uh, just so you know, we are out at 46. World Series. Um, So we are going to have to move a little bit, but yes. Smart speaker. No, 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 no. Back in tw- we're doing a 30-minute game day with one, two, with three breaks.
they haven't seen in almost a year. We'll tell you what that is, plus we'll get Domino's thoughts on that action, and we've got his diamond notes, a pop quiz, and more to get you ready for game one of the Braves and the Dodgers next on The Fan.
is, and I don't know this, I guess you a lot of Braves fans, that, that has always been a big Braves uh, country place, whether it's Houston or Dallas, just a lot of fans who grew up on TBS. That, that would and, and maybe some people took the trip to be there, too. You're going to see the power of what TBS was because, again, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, and saw – what, 100 games a year? Because that was part of what I right. did during the summer was watch all the baseball that was available, and Braves baseball was always available. I'm happy that there were people there. You know, California did not get any approval to have anybody in right. the stands for this yep. other series. I, it was the, funny you said that. The said no. I was watching last night. I'm like, again, cardboard cutout, so yeah, no yep. fans there. All right, uh, Domino has got diamond notes around the corner as we get set for game one. First, though, this is a first for us, an NLCS pop quiz. <gasps> pop quiz, hot shot. Time for the pop quiz, presented by some Superior Plumbing. Call 770-422-PLUM. You wipe with it. All right, gentlemen. <laughs> Whoa. And I'll t- you do whatever you want with it. What, what? do I care at this point? Wow. I, I don't care what you do with it. All right, Here it is. Know. Sure. Wipe whatever with that. you choose to do with okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Just let me read it first you and then do whatever it. you want with it. All right. Uh, all time, one postseason, one postseason, not a series, an entire postseason. I want the top 10 RBI guy for one postseason. I will tell you that the numbers range from 17 up to 21 RBI in any one singular postseason. All right, very good. You want the uh, you got the top 10. How many are you looking for? You want half of those? You want eight of yeah, them? Yeah, let's see what you do. I mean, again, it's got to be guys who had 17 to 21 RBI in one postseason. All right. As a pitcher, as a brave. <laughs> nope. Not one. We'll see what we can come up with. Could have been a rookie in 89. Now you're just confusing everybody. All right, uh, Domino's got diamond notes around the corner. You at home play along with us with the pop quiz. We are counting down to game one. Braves and Dodgers NLCS on the fan. Six.
Listen. I love your dad. I have, I have a passed away father. You do. <laughs> so what do are I. you going to do? I know. Yeah, I know. I think the line from during the break was, I hope the Braves hit the Dodgers pitching like your dad hit you. <laughs> Wow. Listen, my yeah. dad. The only listen, my dad hit me, but he was sober. There was a difference. <laughs> wow, and my dad didn't. But you know what I used to do? I used to beg him to hit me because it would just get me out of the lecture. <laughs> oh, I used to say, if I throw myself down this flight of steps, right? will you not lecture me? Yeah. Oh. Sorry, Domino. My dad lived in a world of disappointment, <laughs> much like I. Shocking! I'm really rather, surprised. Yeah. I'd rather you be disappointed than angry. I told my uh, daughter the other day. I was like, "You're lucky." That I back in the day you would have gotten a slap in the face and she looked at me and like the lack of like belief at all in what I was telling her. Nobody does that. She might as well a middle finger just say, Sure, Dad, shut up. It was one of those like no fear at all. My dad was the original dad from Brooklyn who didn't do it. I'm the second generation (laughs) born and raised in Brooklyn, Staten Island, New Jersey. I couldn't do it. The one time I thought about it, I I sat outside my daughter's room crying like a baby. Just thinking about it. All right, you guys ready? Apparently, by the way, my dad didn't have those issues. (laughs) Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Listen. Beat the hell out of me. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's one big couch roll on. It explains so much. We'll call this segment Copay. Yeah. All right, here we go. Yeah. Uh, Let's start at 17. Okay. Listen to these names. All right. John Valentin, 1999. Ryan Howard, you got, got 2009. That. Domination. Eric Hosmer, oh, 2015. Yvonne Rodriguez, 2003. Oh. Rich Aurelia, oh my 2002. God. 2002. Now we get to 18. That's Alex Rodriguez standing uh, alone cheater. in 2009. Uh, yeah, there's, there's some mental asterisks, if not a cheater. physical one. Listen to this one. 19. Scott Spezia. Stop it. 2002. David Ortiz, 2004. Sandy Alomar had 19 uh, what year? in 1997. You set us up with this. And here's the all-timer. And I've brought him up before, and I've asked you guys to remember. Okay. Two guys I bring up a lot. David Eckstein is one of them. Eck. David Freeze is the other. Uh, 21 yeah. sticks in 2011. Bad memory oh, for those. I remember a good amount of those. Yeah. That is insane. That is. Couldn't get him out. How many games? One. So we were talking about... 71 Seven, plate ten. appearances. So what is that? Uh, it's like 10, 10, 12, 14 games. It was six there. games in a World Series. Yeah. And the Beltran one is the one that everybody thinks because it is eight home runs, but right. it's only, wink, wink, 14 RBI that he parlayed into filthy big money. I did pretty good there, Domino. Uh, if your definition of pretty good is lousy. <laughs> um, I got more If close. your definition of pretty good is. No, you did uh, Yes, you did. He didn't get no, any. No, he, he, didn't got, get he any. got a couple of mine. Oh, please. You got Howard. How dare you? Get, if I said them, they were mine. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was a great question. You set us up. All right, Domino's coming up with the Ford leadoff show. You'll hear from S- <laughs> you'll hear from Snit. <laughs> Vibranium. <laughs> Braves players, everybody. Uh, thanks to the crew out here. Good job, Brandon Harper. Thank you to uh, Brandon Joseph. Gillespie didn't do much. Thanks to Ahoyt. <laughs> we'll go looking for him. Ford leadoff show's next. We're back tomorrow at 3. Go Braves game one next. <laughs>